Cogito Ergo Sum by John Foster West. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite. Cogito Ergo Sum by John Foster West. A warped instant in space, and two egos are separated from their bodies and lost in a lonely abyss. I think, therefore I am. That was the first thought I had. Of course, not in the same symbols, but with the same meaning. I awakened, or came alive, or came into existence suddenly, at least my mental consciousness did. Here I am, I thought, but what am I? Why am I? Where am I? I had nothing to work with except pure reason. I was there because I was not somewhere else. I was certain I was there, and that was the extent of my knowledge at the moment. I looked about me. No, I reasoned about me. I was surrounded by nothingness, by black nothingness, a vacuum. Immense distances away I could detect light, or Rather, I could perceive waves of force passing around me which originated at points vast distances away, vast in relation to my position in the nothingness. There were waves of force all about me, varying in frequency. The nothingness was alive with waves of force traveling parallel and tangential to each other without seeming to interfere with one another. I measured them, differentiated between them, and finished with the task in a matter of seconds. How could I do it? It was one of the capabilities I was created with. What was I? I perceived the waves of force. I perceived great quantities of mass, solid, liquid, gas, whirling in vacuum, mass built up out of patterns of basic force. I searched my own being, analyzed myself. I was not gas. I was not solid. I was not even force. Yet I existed. I could reason. I was a beginning, a sudden beginning, and I had duration because I knew that time had elapsed since the moment I awakened, though I had no means of telling how much time or even naming the period. Could I really be pure reason? Can reason exist? Can rational entity exist without a groundwork of matter, or at least of force? It could. It, it, it must. I was rational entity, and I existed, yet I could find nothing of force, nothing to occupy space about myself. For all I could ascertain, I might have covered a one-dimensional point in eternity, or I might have been spread throughout vast distances. From this reasoning I concluded that rational entity might occur either as some force unlike that of all natural phenomenon in space, or as some combination of these forces at the moment beyond my own power to analyze, even detect. I finished with that for the time being. How did I come into being? I discarded the question as unanswerable temporarily. What was I before that instant I suddenly reasoned cogito ergo sum? I could not say. How did I know I even existed, really? Uh, obviously because I was capable of rational thought, but what was thinking? First it was perceiving and accepting my own existence. Beyond that it was recognizing the dark nothingness around me and the forces it contained. I had to exist. But how did I know nothingness was right, and how did I know its darkness was right? And how did I know the waves of force were waves and force? And how did I know matter was matter, and that I was none of these things? Symbols, I reasoned. I'm thinking in symbols. I could not reason without symbols, therefore I could not exist as I am without symbols to think with. Yet whose symbols were they? Where and how did I come by them? I could think back clearly to the instant of my creation, yet I had not invented the symbols in the interim of my existence, nor had they been given to me. What then? They were part of me when I came alive in this universe, had been invented some other time and elsewhere by someone else or by what I was before I became the entity of reason I now was? Then that first flash of perception in the nothingness was not spontaneous. There was something behind it. I was something before that moment, in another era of time, perhaps a creature of substance. But what? I concentrated. 
I remembered the symbol Marl. I was or had been an entity. Marl. Were there others back there somewhere? They might have been, must be yet. Was I the only Marl who metamorphosed into a state of rational entity? Surely not. Yet I could not contact no other rationale around me as far as I could probe. How far was that? How could I know? Was it far enough to reach the other Marls, or were they scattered thinly throughout infinity around me like the flecks of mass? I was suddenly ill. The symbol malaise came to me as the proper description of my malady. I grew dizzy with my sickness. I wished to regurgitate to cast off this cold, frightening sensation. Yet I was provided with no physical means of doing it. It filled me throughout all my thinking. It was I. I thought to exist. I thought depression, sickness. Therefore I was the malady. And it was a hell of a malcontent beyond symbolical description. What was wrong with me? I was frightened. I was concerned for my existence here alone. What was it called? The idea shimmered there on the fringe of perception, then fairly leaped into my consciousness. Existing alone as pure reason was worse than no existence, was worse than dying or never having been at all. I need another moral to exist happily. I must have at least one other moral to communicate with, to share my thoughts, to share my being. Is this a necessity, a condition peculiar to me as I am, as reason, or is it a condition that came across the barrier with me from that other state? It must be the latter. An entity of pure reason having come into existence as reason would need nothing but himself. Why? Because he would be without emotion. I am emotional, I thought. I am entity of almost pure reason, but I have inherited emotion from my previous state. It is a disorder of thought, but it can be a pleasant disorder when the emotion is the right one, or if unpleasant, when satisfied. But I could not have emotions as I am now. They are cortical responses, or are supposed to be. What is cortical? No, they are a sort of illogical reasoning, nothing physical. The rest eluded me. I am lonely, I thought. Loneliness stems from fear, and fear is a basic emotion. I am very lonely. I have been lonely for a long time, bringing it with me here. I would rather sate my loneliness than live to eternity, than know all there is to know. What can quell my loneliness? Another like me, a another moral, whatever a moral is. I must have it, must find another moral. I began to search. I darted frantically about space like a frightened thing. Though I could perceive no movement, I knew I passed from one area of space to another because I could measure slight changes in the position of the stars about me. I knew the points of light were stars. There was duration. I could not know how much, eternity, a split second. But at last I discovered another like me. No, almost like me, but another moral. The other entity had less of reason, more emotion. It was frightened and lonely. The moral's whole existence was that of sickness, of loneliness, which is fear. The moral was darting about madly, seeking, seeking a thing like itself. What was it, like me, but different? As I came in, I measured our similarity and differences. Rationally, we were identical, or almost so. Emotionally, we were different, vastly different. Morals appear to exist as rationale and emotion. I reasoned. Beyond that, I cannot go. The other Marl perceived me, darted frantically toward me, then slowed. We came together, touched, like, like two cautious fish meeting in a dark pool and touching mouths to substantiate identical species. The other Marl was satisfied with my identity. It leaped frantically at me, raced around me, through me, finally stopped, pervading me, while vibrating in sheer relief and happiness. I felt the great fear-loneliness in the other moral begin to recede, and in its place came an almost overpowering euphoria. It was contentment, and it stemmed from the basic emotion love. I knew this at once. I suddenly realized that I too was relieved, that I was no longer sick with fear-loneliness. It was good this existing of the other within me, or simultaneously with me. Or was it I within the other? It sated our fear emotion and made, created, a love euphoria. I am happy I found you, I communicated. 
I was lonely for another moral. You are a moral? The other hesitated, thinking. No, I am a pat. I am different from you, but it is chiefly emotional. It is good. You are a pat? I returned in disappointment. I had hoped to find another moral. Don't be disappointed, the pat soothed. We are alike, really, almost so. Like, like, flame and gas are both substance yet different. We are two types of the same thing. I am no longer frightened. I am no longer lonely. You are good for me." I was relieved because I wanted to be. I believed the other moral, no, the pat, because I wanted to believe. I did not bother to rationalize. I felt elation. Then in that other time, that other place, we both belonged to a, a common group with another name, I suggested. I believe so, the pat answered. How was it when you came awake, I asked, can you remember? I think so. I recall I was born here in fright because it was all wrong. I was not in my natural state, so it was not right, the pat paused to think. I remember there was great speed and I was born in fright. Were you? No, I answered. I was not frightened at first, and I was never frightened to the degree you were. I was mostly lonely, which is related to fear. But when I first conceived of my existence here, I was coolly logical. I awakened reasoning, realizing that I existed. I suppose it has to do with our emotional differences, the pat beside me, or with me, or within me, communicated. Do you recall where in space you came from? I asked. I must have been doubting my existence at first, so intensely I did not observe. You seem to have taken your own being for granted, thus you were, perhaps, more observant. I, I think so, the pat hesitated, and I knew it was observing the stars around us. Yes, come with me, I think I know where. I stayed with the pat, a uh, part of it, and we lurched through space. Rather, we ceased to exist at one point in space and existed in another. How far? Distances meant nothing. It was here, the pat informed me finally. Something was wrong here. The interweaving waves of force were all wrong. There was disorder, a great cancer in space. The waves interfered with the progress of each other, all along a great barrier. It was not natural, not like it was elsewhere. Something is wrong with the waves of force crossing this area. They interfere with each other. New forces are created. Do you detect it? I communicated. I, I feel it, the Pat answered. It is a sickness in space, like, like our loneliness. I knew the comparison was ridiculous, but I let it pass. You said you came alive at great speed. I could have been traveling, too. We must have plunged into this barrier. It seems to me that emotions must originate in a physical being. Perhaps reason could be free, but not emotion. I don't know, but I have a theory. I believe our physical selves still exist somewhere in space. The barrier, perhaps, interfered with the normal functioning of our mental equipment. We exist at one point in space, and we are thinking, experiencing emotions at another point. It's as if our minds are, are broadcasting our thoughts and emotions far away from our physical selves. Either that, or our rationales were torn free and only our emotions are broadcast. Does that sound logical? Yes, the Pat agreed. I believe that is the answer. I felt that the Pat was pleased with my theory, that it greatly admired my reasoning. I also perceived that it had no idea what I meant by the explanation. I did not mind. You said you were moving at great speed, I continued. Can you remember the line, the direction you were traveling in? The Pat hesitated only a moment. Yes. You perceive the star cluster there, the triangular one? My heading was in that direction, but it was changing fast. Then we could find nothing by traveling toward the triangular cluster. No. I was moving in an arc in the direction of the distorted square cluster there. Do you see it?" Yes, I answered, knowing her use of the word C was unconscious. That is Cetus. Cetus? The Pat was startled. How do you know that? I don't know. The name came to me. It seemed right to call it that. It, it's all so frightening. I had no time for pampering our emotions, though I was at great peace with the Pat so near me time might prove vital. Neither would it do any good to travel in the direction of Cetus, I said. No, no, the Pat communicated. 
If there is any object of matter or force I was a part of in that other existence traveling through space, it is in an arc. The best we can do is take an arbitrary direction between the triangular cluster and the one called Cetus and hope to intercept the object, the other part of me, whatever it is. Come with me, I ordered. I discovered the object of mass hurtling through space before the Pat did. It was symmetrical and metallic. I tore myself away from my companion and darted to meet it. I discovered it was a shell, a hollow thing, and I passed inside. There was a room there. There were projections and circles of transparent matter. I experienced the symbol dials. There were two other creatures seated close to the dials, things of matter, and their substance was protoplasm. But there was no rationale present in either of them. I examined the living matter of the smaller one swiftly. Organs seemed poised in a suspended state. The creature, I observed, housed in a protective shell, seemed paralyzed or dead. I remembered the word dead. Then the pat was within me again. I, I feel something, Marl. I am frightened. What are they, those things there? They seem to be. I stopped communicating. The pat had disappeared. The thing of protoplasm nearest me was moving, but I was no longer interested. I remember the pat had touched the upper extremity of the creature and had vanished, had ceased to be. The old sickness was back. I was lonely. I wanted the other entity. I could not, did not wish to exist without the pat. I darted frantically about the metal shell, here and there, searching, searching. Where was the pat? I screamed for it. I thought pat as far away as I could reach, but there was no reaction, no response at all. In my frenzy I was back beside the creatures of protoplasm before I realized it, near the one I had not yet examined. Perhaps they took her, I thought. It was not logical, but it was a hope. Hope is emotional. I was becoming more emotional than rational. I touched the larger of the two creatures experimentally, moved cautiously inside it, searching, searching. Suddenly I was seized by a great force, an inexorable power that grasped me and wrenched me, tearing me from the point in space I had occupied a moment before. My perception blurred, but I was not frightened. Without the pad I did not care what happened. I was intensely curious. So this is how it is, I reasoned in a flash, to cease to be. And I ceased to be. Marlowe shook his head. I must have dozed, he thought. He glanced at the chronometer on the console ahead. No, only a minute or two had elapsed since the last time he had checked. Sleepyhead, wake up and live. He looked to his right. Pat sat in a navigator's seat smiling at him. I didn't sleep, honestly, he protested. We hit some sort of barrier back there. It knocked me out for a moment. I had the damnedest impression. Remember what you promised. She swiveled the seat about to face him. No more scientific lectures on the mysteries of space or I'll return to Earth. You know my poor brain can't absorb it. You win, he grinned, running calloused fingers through his graying crew cut. He leaned forward and kissed her briefly. How did an old space hermit like me ever win a flower garden bride in the first place? They laughed together, and he felt secure within the metallic shell surrounding them, no longer alone. End of Cogito Ergo Sum by John Foster West By Jack Douglas This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Troy Bond Dead World by Jack Douglas Although the most recent star to die, RNAC 89778 in the distant Menelaus galaxy, common name Menelaus 12, had eight inhabited planets, only some 1,000 people of the fifth planet escaped and survived, as a result of a computer error which miscalculated the exact time by two years. Due to basic psychophilo maladjustments, the refugees of Menelaus 12-5 are classified as antisocial types B6 and must be considered unstable. All antisocial types B6 are barred from responsible positions in United Galaxies by order of the Intergalactic Council. Short History of the United Galaxies Yuan Salterio started it. He was serving in my company and he was one of them. 
A Menelaus 12-5, unstable. And don't ever call that damn little planet by its number if you meet one of them. They call it Nova Morania. But you won't meet one of them. Or maybe you will. Maybe they did make it. I like to think they did. There are a lot of them in the companies in 3078. Restless men. The companies were the logical place for them. We're still classified antisocial B6, too. Every year it's harder to get recruits. But we still have to be careful who we take in. We took Yuan Saltario. There was something about him from the very start. Why do you want to join a free company? He was a short humanoid type with deep black eyes and a thin lipless mouth that never smiled. I'm an antisocial. I like to fight. I want to fight. A misfit joining the misfits? A grudge against the council? It's not good enough, mister. We live on the council. Try again. Salterio's black eyes stared without a flicker. You're Red Stone, commander of the Red Company. You hate the council, and I hate the council. You're the... Salterio stopped. I said, the traitor of the glorious war of survival. You can say it, Salterio. The lipless mouth was rigid. I don't think of it that way. I think of a man with personal integrity, Salterio said. I suppose I should have seen it then, the rock he carried deep inside him. It might have saved thirty thousand good men. But I was thinking of myself, Commander Redstone of the Red Company, Earthmen. Only we're not all Earthmen now. Every year there are fewer recruits, and it won't be long before we die out and the Council will have the last laugh. Old Redstone, the traitor of the War of Survival. The little finger of my left hand still missing and telling the universe I was a very old soldier of the outlawed free companies, hanging on to life on a rocky planet of the distant Solomon Galaxy. Back at the old stand because United Galaxies still need us. In a way, it's a big joke. Two years after Rajay Ben and I had a belly full of the glorious War of Survival and they chased us all the way out here, they turned right around and made the peace. A joke on me. But sometimes I like to think that our run-out was the thing that made them think and make peace. When you've been a soldier for thirty-five years, you like to win battles, but you like to feel you helped bring peace, too. I said, Personal integrity. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? So you like personal integrity? All right, Sultario. Are you sure you know what you're getting into? We're sixty million light-years from Galaxy Center, ten million from the nearest United Galaxy City. We've got no comforts, no future, Nothing to do but fight. A woman in her right mind won't look at us. If they see you in uniform, they'll spit on you. If they catch you out of uniform, they'll kill you. Salterio shrugged. I like to eat. I've got nowhere to go. All I've got is myself and a big piece of ice I call home. I nodded. Okay. We fight small wars for good profits. It's not Earth out here, but we've got four nice sons, plenty of Lucanian whiskey Rajay Ben taught the locals to make, and we're our own masters. The United Galaxies leaves us pretty much alone unless they need us. You do your job, and your job is what I tell you to do, period. You got that straight? Salterio very nearly smiled. It sounds good to me, sir. I hope it'll sound good in a year, Salterio, because once you're in, you don't get out except feet first. Is that clear? I have life and death rights over you. You owe allegiance to the Red Company and me and to no one else. Got that? Today your best friends are the men of Rajay Ben's Lucanian 4th Free Patrol, and your worst enemies are the men of Mondesiva's Syrian O Company. Tomorrow, Rajay Ben's boys may be your worst enemies, and Mondesiva's troops your best friends. It all depends on the contract. A company on the same contract is a friend, a company against the contract is an enemy. You'll drink with a man today and kill him tomorrow, got it? If you kill a free companion without a contract, you go to court martial. If you kill a citizen of the United Galaxies except in a battle under contract, I throw you to the wolves, and that means you're finished. That's the way it is. Yes, sir. Salterio never moved a muscle. He was rigid. Right, I said. Get your gear, see the adjutant, and sign the agreement. I think you'll do. Salterio left. I sat back in my chair and thought about how many non-Earthmen I was taking into the company. Maybe I should have been thinking about this one single non-Earth man and the something he was carrying inside him, but I didn't, and it cost the company's 30,000 men we couldn't afford to lose. We can't afford to lose one man. There are only a hundred companies now, 20,000 men each, give or take a few thousand depending on how the last contract went. Life is good in the United Galaxies now that they've disarmed and outlawed all war again, and our breed is dying out faster than it did in the 500 years of peace before the War of Survival. 
Too many of the old companions like me went west in the War of Survival. The Galactic Council know they need us, know that you can't change all living creatures into good galactic citizens overnight, so they let us go on fighting for anyone in the universe who wants to take something from someone else, or who thinks someone else wants to take something from him. And even the mighty United Galaxies needs guards for expeditions to the unexplored galaxies. But they don't like us, and they don't want us. They don't cut off our little fingers anymore, but we have to wear our special black uniforms when we go into United Territory under penalty of a quick death. Humane, of course, they just put us to sleep gently and for keeps. And they've got a stockpile of ionic bombs ready at all times in case we get out of hand. We don't have ionic weapons, that's part of the agreement, and they watch us. They came close to using them down there in the frozen waste of Menelaus 12, but 30,000 of us died without ionics. We killed each other. They liked that, even if they didn't like what happened. Do you know what it means to be lost? Really lost? I'm lost if that means I know I'll never go back to live on Earth. But I know that Earth is still there to go back to, and I can dream of going home. Yuan Salterio and the other refugees have no home to go back to. They can't even dream. They sat in that one ship that escaped and watched their planet turn into a lifeless ball of ice that would circle dead and frozen forever around its burned-out star, a giant tomb that carried under its thick ice their homes and their fields and their loves. And they could not even hope and dream. Or I did not think they could. Salterio had been with us a year when we got the contract to escort the survey mission to Nova Marania, a private Earth commercial mining firm looking for minerals under the frozen waste of the dead planet. Rajay Ben was in on the contract. We took two battalions, one from my Red Company and one from Rajay Ben's Lucanian Patrol. My sub-commander was Pete Colenso, old Mike Colenso's boy. It all went fine for a week or so, routine guard and patrol. The survey team wouldn't associate with us, of course, but we were used to that. We kept our eyes open and our mouths shut. That's our job, and we give value for money received. So we were alert and ready. But it wasn't the attack that nearly got us this time. It was the cold of the dead planet lost in absolute zero and absolute darkness. Nova Marania was nearly 40% uranium, and who could resist that? A Centaurian trading unit did not resist the lure. The attack was quick and hard. A typical Lucanian patrol attack. My company was pinned down at the first volley from those damn smoky blasters of the Lucanians. All I could see was the same shimmering lights I had learned to know so well in the War of Survival against Lucania. Someday, maybe I'll find out how to see a Lucan. Rajay Ben has worked with me a long time to help, but when the attack came this time, all I could do was eat ice and beam a help call to Rajay Ben. That Centaurian trading unit was a cheap outfit. They had hired only one battalion of R.J. Ben's 9th Lucanian Free Patrol, and Rajay Ben flanked them right off that planet. I got my boys on their feet, and we chased R.J.'s men halfway back to Salomon with Rajay Ben laughing like a hyena the whole way. Dip me in mud, red boy. I'd give a prime contract for one gander at old R.J. Ben's face. He's blowing a gasket. I said, nice flank job. Rajay Ben laughed so hard I could see his pattern of colored light shaking like a dancing rainbow. I took two sub-commanders. Wait till I hit that bullet head for ransom. Then we stopped laughing. We had won the battle, but R.J. Ben was a crafty old soldier and his sabotage squad had wrecked our engines and our heating units. We were stuck on a frozen planet without heat. Young Colenso turned white. What do we do? I said, beam for help and pray we don't freeze first. They had missed our small communications reactor unit. We sent out our call and we all huddled around the small reactor. There might be enough heat out of it to let us live five hours, if we were lucky. It was the third hour when Yuan Saltario began to talk. Maybe it was the nearness of death. I was twenty-two. Portario was the leader in our planet. He found the error when we had one ship ready. We had three days. No time to get the other ships ready. He said we were lucky the other planets didn't have even one ship ready. Not even time for United Galaxies to help. Portario chose a thousand of us to go. I was one. At first I felt very good, you know. I was really happy. Until I found out that my wife couldn't go. Not fit enough. United Galaxies had beamed the standards to us. Funny how you don't think about other people until something hurts you. I'd been married a year. I told them it was both of us or neither of us. I told Potario to tell United Galaxies they couldn't break up a family and to hell with their standards. 
They laughed at me. Not Portario, the council. What did they care? They would just take another man. My wife begged me to go. She cried so much I had to agree to go. I loved her too much to be able to stay and see the look on her face as we both died when she knew I could have gone. On the ship before we took off I stood at a port and looked down at her, a small girl trying to smile at me. She waved once before they led her away from the rocket. All hell was shaking the planet already, had been for months, but all I saw was a small girl waving once, just once. She's still there, somewhere down there under the ice. The cold was slowly creeping into us. It was hard to move my mouth, but I said, She loved you. She wanted you to live. Without her, without my home, I'm as dead as the planet. I feel frozen. She's like that dead sun out there, and I'll circle around her until someone gets me and ends it. Salterio seemed to be seeing something. I'm beginning to forget what she looked like. I don't want to forget. I can't forget her on this planet. The way it was. It was a beautiful place. Perfect. I don't want to forget her. Colenso said, You won't have long to remember. But Colenso was wrong. My third battalion showed up when we had just less than an hour to live. They took us off. The earth mining outfit haggled over the contract because the job had not been finished, and I had to settle for two-third contract price. Rajay Ben did better than when he ransomed R.J. Ben's two sub-commanders. It wasn't a bad deal, and I would have been satisfied, except that something had happened to Yuan Saltario. Maybe it made him realize that he did not want to die after all. Or maybe it turned him space-happy and he began to dream. A dream of his own born up there in the cold of its dead planet. A dream that nearly cost me my company. I did not know what that dream was until Sartario came into my office a year later. He had a job for the company. How many men? I asked. Our company and Rajay Ben's patrol, Sartario said. Full strength? Yes, sir. Price? Standard, sir, Salterio said. The party will pay. Just a trip to your old planet? That's all, Salterio said. A guard contract. The hiring party just don't want any interference with their project. Two full companies, 40,000 men. They must expect to need a lot of protecting. United Galaxies opposes the project, or they will if they get wind of it. I said, United opposes a lot of things. What's special about this scheme? Salterio hesitated, then looked at me with those flat black eyes. Ionix. It's not a word you say or hear without a chill somewhere deep inside. Not even me, and I know a man can survive ionic weapons. I know because I did once. Weapons so powerful, I'm one of the last men alive who saw them in action. Mathematically, the big ones could wipe out a galaxy. I saw a small one destroy a star in ten seconds. I watched Salterio for a long time. It seemed a long time, anyway. It was probably twenty seconds. I was wondering if he'd gone space crazy for keeps, and I was thinking of how I could find out what it was all about in time to stop it. I said, A hundred companies won't be enough, Salterio. Have you ever seen or heard what an ionic bomb can... Salterio said, Not weapons. Peaceful power. Even that's out, and you know it, I said. United Galaxies won't even touch peaceful ionics. Too dangerous to even use. You can take a look first. A good look, I said. I alerted Rajay Ben and we took two squads in a small ship and Saltario directed us to a tall mountain that jutted a hundred feet above the ice of Nova Marania. I was not surprised, in a way I think I knew from the moment Saltario walked into my office. Whatever it was, Saltario was a part of it. And I had a pretty good idea what it was. The only question was how. But I didn't have time to think it out any farther, and the companies you learn to feel danger. The first fire caught four of my men. Then I was down on the ice. They were easy to see, black uniforms with white wedges. Pete O'Hara's White Wedge Company, Earthmen. I don't like fighting other Earthmen, but a job's a job and you don't ask questions in the companies. It looked like a full battalion against our two squads. On the smooth ice surface there was no cover except the jutting mountain top off to the right, and no light in the absolute darkness of a dead star. But we could see through our viewers and so could they. They outnumbered us ten to one. Rajay Ben's voice came through the closed circuit. Bad show, Red. They got our pants down. You call it, I answered. Break silence. Surrender. When a company breaks silence in a battle, it means surrender. There was no other way. And I had a pretty good idea that the council itself was behind O'Hara on this job. 
If it was Ionics involved, they wouldn't ransom us. The Council had waited a long time to catch Redstone in an execution offense. They wouldn't miss. But forty of our men were down already. Okay, I beamed over the circuit. Break silence. We've had it, Rajay. Council offense, Red. Yeah. Well, I'd had a lot of good years. Maybe I'd been a soldier too long. I was thinking just like that when the sudden flank attack started. From the right. Heavy fire from the cover of the solitary mountaintop. O'Hara's men were dropping. I stared through my viewer. On that mountain I counted the uniforms of twenty-two different companies. That was very wrong. Whoever Saltario was fronting for could not have the power or the gold to hire twenty-four companies including mine and Rajay Ben's. And the fire was heavy, but not that heavy. But whoever they were, they were very welcome. We had a chance now. And I was making my plans when the tall old man stood up on the small jutting top of that mountain. The tall old man stood up and a translating machine boomed out. All of you, O'Hara's men, look at this. I saw it. In a beam of light on the top of that mountain, it looked like a small neutron source machine. But it wasn't. It was an ionic beam projector. The old man said, Go home. They went. They went fast and silent. And I knew where they were going, not to Solomon. O'Hara would have taken one look at that machine and be halfway to United Galaxy Center before he had stopped seeing it. I felt like taking that trip myself. But I had agreed to look, and I would look. If we were lucky, we would have 48 hours to look and run. I fell in what was left of my company behind the men that had saved us. More company uniforms than I had ever seen in one place. They said nothing, just walked into a hole in that mountain, into a cave. And in the cave at the far end a door opened, an elevator. We followed the tall old man into the elevator and it began to descend. The elevator car went down for a long time. At last I could see a faint glow far below. The glow grew brighter and the car stopped. Far below the glow was still brighter. We all stepped out into a long corridor cut from solid rock. I estimated that we were at least two hundred miles down, and the glow was hundreds of miles deeper. We went through three sealed doors and emerged into a vast room. A room bright with light and filled with more men in company uniforms, civilians, even women. At least a thousand. And I saw it. The thousand refugees, all of them. Gathered from all the companies from wherever they had been in the galaxies. Gathered here in a room two hundred miles into the heart of their dead planet. A room filled with giant machines. Ionic machines. Highly advanced ionic power reactors. The old man stood in front of his people and spoke. I am Jason Portario. I thank you for coming. I broke in. Ionic power is an execution offense. You know that. How the hell did you get all this? I know the offense, Commander, Portario said. And I know you. You're a fair man. You're a brave man. It doesn't matter where we got the power, many men are dead to get it. But we have it, and we will keep it. We have a job to do. I said, After that stun out there, you've about as much chance as a snowball in hell. O'Hara is halfway to Galaxy Center. Look, with a little luck, we get you out to Solomon. If you leave all this equipment, I might be able to hide you until it blows over. The old man shrugged. I would have preferred not to show our hand, but we had to save you. I was aware that the Council would find us out sooner or later. They missed the ionic material a month ago. But that is unimportant. The important matter is will you take our job? All we need is another two days, perhaps three. Can you hold off an attack for that long? Why? I asked. Protario smiled. All right, Commander, you should know all we plan. Sit down and let me finish before you speak. I sat. Rajay Ben sat. The agitation of his colored lights showed that he was as disturbed as I was. The thousand Nova Moranians stood there in the room and watched us. Yuan Saltario stood with his friends. I could feel his eyes on me. Hot eyes. As if something inside that lost man was burning again. Portario lighted a pipe. I had not seen a pipe since I was a child. The habit was classified as ancient usage in the United Galaxies. Portario saw me staring. He held his pipe and looked at it. In a way, Commander, the old man said, this pipe is my story. On Nova Morania we liked the pipe. We liked a lot of the old habits. Maybe we should have died with all the others. You know, I was the one who found the error. Sometimes I'm not at all sure my friends here thank me for it. 
Our planet is dead, Commander, and so are we. We're dead inside. But we have a dream. We want to live again, and to live again our planet must live again. The old man paused as if trying to be sure of telling it right. We mean no harm to anyone. All we want is our life back. We don't want to live forever like lumps of ice circling around a dead heart. What we plan may kill us all, but we feel it is worth the risk. We have thousands of ionic power reactors. We have blasted out Venturi tubes. We found life still deep in the center of this planet. It is all ready now. With all the power we have, we will break the hold of our dead sun and send this planet off into space. We... I said, you're insane. It can't... But it can, Commander. It's a great risk, yes, but it can be done. My calculations are perfect. We want to leave this dead system, go off into space and find a new star that will bring life back to our planet. A green, live, warm Nova Marania once again. Rajay Ben was laughing. That's the craziest damn dream I ever sat still for. You know what your chances of being picked up by another star are? Picked up just right? Why, Bertario said, we have calculated the exact initial thrust, the exact tangential velocity, the precise orbital path we need. If all goes exactly, I emphasize exactly to the last detail as we have planned it, we can do it. Our chances of being caught by the correct star in the absolutely correct position are one in a thousand trillion. But we can do it. It was so impossible I began to think he was right. If you aren't caught just right... Portario's black eyes watched me. We could burn up or stay frozen and lifeless. We could drift in space forever as cold and dead as we are now and our ionic power won't last forever. The forces we will use could blow the planet apart. But we are going to try. We would rather die than live as walking dead men in this perfect united galaxies we do not want. The silence in the room was like a Solomon fog. Thick silence broken only by the steady hum of the machines deep beneath us in the dead planet. A wild, impossible dream of one thousand lost souls. A dream that would destroy them, and they did not care. There was something about it all that I liked. I said, Why not get council approval? Portario smiled. Council has little liking for wild dreams, Commander. It would not be considered as advancing the future of United Galaxy's destiny. Then there are the Ionics, and Portario hesitated, and there is the danger of imbalance, galactic imbalance. I have calculated carefully. The danger is remote, but Council is not going to take even a remote chance. Yuan Saltario broke in. All they care about is their damn sterile destiny. They don't care about people. Well, we do. We care about something to live for. The hell with the destiny of the galaxies. They don't know, and we'll be gone before they do know. They know plenty now. O'Hara's being the men. So we must hurry, Otario said. Three days, Commander, will you protect us for three days? A council offense punishable by instant destruction with United Galaxies reserve ionic weapons in the hands of the super-secret police and disaster teams. And three days is a long time. I would be risking my whole company. And I heard Rajay Ben laugh. Blast me, Red, it's so damn crazy I'm for it. Let's give it a shot. I did not know then how much it would really cost us. If I had, I might not have agreed. Or maybe I would have. It was good to know people could still have such dreams in our computer age. Okay, I said. Beam the full companies and try to get one more. Mondasiva's Syrian boys would be good. We'll split the fee three ways. Yuan Salterio said, Thanks, Red. I said, Thank me later if we're still around. We beamed the companies and in twenty minutes they were on their way straight into the biggest trouble we had had since the War of Survival. I expected trouble, but I didn't know how much. Pete Colenso tipped me off. Pete spoke across the light years on our beam. Mandasiva says okay if we guarantee the payment. I've deposited the bond with him and we're on our way. But, Red, something's funny. What? This place is empty. The whole damn galaxy out here is like a desert. Every company has moved out somewhere. Okay, I beam, get rolling fast. There was only one client who could hire all the companies at one time. United Galaxies itself. We were in for it. I had expected perhaps ten companies, not three against ninety-seven, give or take a few out on other jobs. It gave me a chill. Not the odds. But if Council was that worried, maybe there was bad danger. But I'd given my word, and a companion keeps his word. 
We had one ace in the hole, a small one. If the other companies were not here in Menelaus yet, they must have rendezvoused at Galaxy Center. It was the kind of follow-the-book mistake United would make. It gave us a day and a half. We would need it. They came at dawn on the second day. We were deployed across five of the dead planets of Menelaus Twelve in a ring around Nova Morania. They came fast and hard, and Portario and his men had at least ten hours' work left before they could fire their reactors and pray. Until then, we did the praying. It didn't help. Mondesiva's command ship went at the third hour. A Lucan blaster got it. By the fourth hour, I had watched three of my sub-command ships go. A Syrian force beam got one, an Earth fusion gun got another, and the third went out of action and rammed O'Hara's command ship that had been leading their attack against us. That third ship of mine was Pete Colenso's. Old Mike would have been proud of his boy. I was sick. Pete had been a good boy. So had O'Hara. Not a boy, O'Hara, but the next to the last of old free companion from Earth. I'm the last, and I said a silent goodbye to O'Hara. By the sixth hour, Rajay Ben had only ten ships left. I had twelve. Five thousand of my men were gone. Eight thousand of Rajay Ben's Lucans. The Syrians of Mondasiva's O Company were getting the worst of it, and in the eighth hour, Mondasiva's second-in-command surrendered. It would be over soon, too soon, and the dream would be over with the battle. I broke silence. Red Stone calling. Do you read me? Commander Stone calling. Request conference. Repeat, request conference. A face appeared on the inner company beam screen. The cold, blank, hard-bitten face of the only free company commander senior to me now that O'Hara was gone. Jake Campesino of the Signy Black Company. Are you surrendering, Stone? No. I want to speak to my fellow companions. Campesino's voice was like ice. Violation! You know the rules, Stone. Silence cannot be broken in battle. I will bring charges. You're through, Stone. I said, Okay, crucify me later, but hear me now. Campesino said, Close silence or surrender. It was no good. We'd had it. And across the distance of battle, Rajay Ben's face appeared on the screen. The colored lights that were a Lucan's face, and I knew enough to know that the shimmering lights were mad. The hell with them, Red. Let's go all the damned way. And a new face appeared on the screen. A face I knew too well. First Counselor Rourke. Stone, you've done a lot in your day, but this is the end, you hear me? You're defending a madman in a council crime. Do you realize the risk? Universal imbalance. The whole pattern of galaxies could be destroyed. We'll destroy you for the stone. An ionic project without council authorization? I said to Campesino, Five minutes, Commander. That's all. There was a long blank on the screen, then Campesino's cold face appeared. Okay, Red Talk. I don't like civilian threats. You've got your five minutes. Make it good. I made it good. I told them of a handful of people who had a dream. A handful of people who wanted their home back. A few lost souls who would rather die trying to live the way they wanted to live than go on living in a world they did not want. And I told them of the great united galaxies that had been created to protect the dreams of everyone in it and had forgotten why it had been created. I told them that it did not matter who was right or wrong, because when a man can no longer dream, something has gone wrong in the universe. When I finished, Campesino's face was impassive. Campesino said, You heard Commander Stone, men. Close off, Stone. Give me a minute to get the vote. I waited. It was the longest minute of my life. You win, Red, Campesino said. He was smiling at me. Go home, Counselor. Battle's over. The Counselor went. He said there would be hell to pay, and maybe there will be, but I don't think so. They still need us. We lost 30,000 good men in all the companies. But when the next dawn came, Nova Morania was gone. I don't know where they went, or what happened to them. Here in my stronghold, I sometimes imagine them safe and rebuilding a green world where they can smoke pipes and live their own lives. And, sometimes I imagine them all dead and drifting out there in the infinity of space. I don't think they would mind too much, either way. You've been listening to Dead World by Jack Douglas, a public domain story read by Troy Bond for LibriVox.
the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Owen. Divinity by William Morrison Bradley had one fear in his life. He had to escape regeneration. To do that, he was willing to take any chance, coward though he was, even if it meant that he had to become a god. Bradley seemed to have escaped regeneration. Now he only had death to worry about. Ten minutes before, he had been tumbling through the air head over heels, helpless and despairing. And before that, he remembered how his heart had been in his mouth as he crept down the corridor of the speeding ship. He could hear Malevsky's voice coming faintly through one of the walls, and he had been tempted to run back, fearful of being shot down on the spot if he were caught. He had fought back the temptation and kept on. No one had seen him as he crept into the lifeboat. This is your one chance, he told himself. You have to take it. If they get you back to port, you're finished. Luck had been with him. They were broadcasting the results of the Mars-Earth matches at the time, and most of the crew were grouped around the visors. He had picked the moment when news came of a sensational upset, and for a minute or two after the lifeboat blasted off, no one realized what had happened. When the truth did penetrate, they had a hard time swinging the ship around, and by then the lifeboat was out of radar range. He was free. He had exulted wildly for the moment, until it struck him that freedom in space might be a doubtful gift. He would have to get to some civilized port, convince the port authorities that he had been shipwrecked, and somehow separated from other crew members, and then lose himself quickly in the crowd of people that he hoped would fill the place. There would be risks, but he would take them. It would be better than running out of air and food in space. It had been the best possible plan, and it had gone wrong. All wrong. He had been caught, before he knew it, in the gravity of a planet he had overlooked. The lifeboat had torn apart under the combined stresses of its forward momentum and its side rockets blasting full force, and he had been hurled free in a spacesuit, falling slowly at first, then faster, faster, faster. The automatic parachutes had suddenly sprung into operation when he reached a critical speed, and he had slowed down and stopped tumbling. He fell more gently, feet first, and when he landed it was with a shock that jarred, but did no real damage. Slowly he picked himself up and fumbled at the air valve. Something in the intake tubes had jammed under the shock of landing, and the air was no longer circulating properly. Filled with the moisture of his own breath, it felt hot and clammy, and clouded the viewplates. If he had kept all his wits about him, he would have tried to remember, before he took a chance, whether the planet had an oxygen atmosphere and whether the oxygen was of sufficient concentration to support human life. Not that he had had any real choice, but it would have been good to know. As it was, he turned the air valve automatically and listened nervously as the stale air hissed out and the fresh air hissed in. He took a deep breath. It didn't kill him. Instead, it sent his blood racing around with new energy. Slowly, the moisture evaporated from his viewplates. Slowly, he began to see. He perceived that he was not alone. A group of people stood in front of him, respectful, their own eyes full of fear and wonder. Someone uttered a hoarse cry and pointed at his helmet. The unclouding of the viewplates must have stricken them with awe. The air was wonderful to breathe. He would have liked to remove his helmet and fill his lungs with it unhampered, expose his face to its soft caress, expand his chest with the constriction of the suit. But these people... They must have seen him tumble down from the sky and land unhurt. They carried food and flowers, and now they were kneeling down to him as to a... Suddenly he realized. To them, he was a god. The thought of it made him weak. To Malevsky and the ship's crew, he was a criminal, a cheap chiseler and pickpocket, almost a murderer escaping credit for that crime only by grace of his own good luck and his victim's thick skull. They had felt such contempt for him that they hadn't even bothered to guard him too carefully. They had thought him a complete coward, without the courage to risk an escape, without the intelligence to find the opportunities that might be offered to him. 
They hadn't realized how terrified he was of the thing with which they threatened him. Regeneration. The giving up of his old identity? Not for him. They hadn't realized that he preferred the risks of a dangerous escape to the certainty of that. And here he was, a god. He lifted his hand without thinking to wipe away the perspiration that covered his forehead. But before the hand touched his helmet, he realized what he was doing and let the hand drop again. To the people watching him, the gesture must have seemed one of double significance. It was at once a sign of accepting their food and flowers, and their offer of goodwill, and at the same time in order to withdraw. They bowed and moved backwards away from him. Behind him they left their gifts. They seemed human, human enough for the features on the men's faces to impress him as strong and resourceful, for him to recognize that the women were attractive. And if they were human, the food must be fit for human beings. Whether it was or wasn't, however, again, he had no choice. He waited until they were out of sight, and then, stiffly, he removed his helmet and ate. The food tasted good. And with his helmet off, with the wind in his face, and the woods around him whispering in his ears, it was a meal fit for the being they thought him to be. He was a god. Possibly, it was the spacesuit which made him one, especially the goggle-eyed helmet. He could take no chance of becoming an ordinary mortal, and that would mean he would have to wear the spacesuit continually, or at least the helmet. That, he decided, was what he would do. That would leave his body reasonably free, and at the same time impress them with the fact that he was different from them. By manipulating the air valve, he would be able to make the viewplates cloud and uncloud at will, thus giving dramatic expression to his feelings. It would be a pleasant game to play until he had learned something of their language. It would be safer than trying to make things clear to them with speech and gestures that they could not understand anyway. He wondered how long it would be before Malevsky would find the shattered lifeboat drifting in space and then trace its course and decide where he had landed. That would be the end of his divinity. Meanwhile, until then... Until then, he was a god. Unregenerated. Permanently unregenerated. Holding his helmet, he threw back his head and laughed loud and long and wondered what his mother would have thought. For a while he was being left alone. They were afraid of him, of course, fearful of intruding with their merely mortal affairs upon the meditations of so divine a being. Later, however, curiosity and perhaps a desire to show him off to newcomers might draw them back. In the interval, it would be well to find out what sort of place this was in which he had landed. He looked around him. There were trees, with sharp green branches, sharp green twigs, sharp red leaves. He shuddered as he thought what would have happened to him if he had fallen on the point of a branch. The trees seemed rigid and unbending in the wind that caressed his face. There were no birds that he could see. Small black objects bounded from one branch to another as if engaged in complicated games of tag. He wondered if the games were as serious as the one he had been playing with Malevsky, with himself as it. There were no ground animals in sight. If any showed up later, they couldn't be too dangerous, not with the natives living here in such apparent peace and contentment. There probably wouldn't be anything that his pocket gun, which he had taken the precaution to remove from the lifeboat before that shattered, wouldn't be able to handle. Near him was a strange spring, or little river, or whatever you might call it. It broke from the ground, ran along the hard rocky surface for a dozen feet, and then plunged underground again. There were other springs of a similar nature scattered here and there, and now he realized that their combined murmuring was the noise he'd mistaken, on first removing his helmet, for the rustle of the wind in the woods. He would have enough to drink. The natives would bring him food. What else could any reasonable man want? It wasn't the kind of life he had dreamed of. No Martian whiskey, no drugs, no night spots, no big-time gamblers slapping him on the back and calling him pal, no brassy blondes giving him the eye. Still, it was better than the life he actually lived. Much better. It would do. It would have to do. From what he had seen of the natives, he liked them, and feared them. For all their mistaken faith in him, they seemed to be no fools. How many times before had men from some supposedly superior civilization dropped in upon the people of a new world and made that first impression of divinity, only to have the original attitude of worship by the natives 
give way to dissolution and contempt. Who was that fellow they told about in the history books he had read as a kid? Cortez, way back on Earth, when that planet itself had offered unexplored territory? And later on, it had happened on one of the moons of Jupiter, and on several planets outside the system. The explorers had been gods until they had been found out. Then they had been savage murderers, plunderers, devils. It would be too bad if you were found out. He was one against them all. He would never be able to fight off so many enemies. More than that, he was a stranger here. He needed friends. No, he mustn't be found out. Better put on your helmet, dope, he told himself savagely. They'll be coming back soon, and if they find you without it... He put on his helmet, still muttering to himself. It wouldn't make any difference if you were overheard. They didn't know Earth language and would take his words for oracular utterances. He could talk to himself all he wanted, and from the looks of things there would be no one to understand him. He hoped he didn't grow crazy and eccentric like those hermits who had been lost alone in space for too many years. The helmet was the first nuisance. There would be others, too. He couldn't even talk in what had become his natural manner, with a whine in every word, a whine that came from being treated with contempt by police and fellow criminals alike. A god had to speak with slow gravity, with dignity. A god had to walk like a god. A god had endless responsibilities here, it seemed. He thought again of his mother. Ever since he could remember, it had been, Georgie, wipe your nose, and Georgie, keep your fingers out of the cake, and Georgie, do this, and don't do that. A fine way to speak to a god. Even after he had grown up, his mother had continued to treat him like a baby. She had never got over examining his face and ears and his fingernails to make sure that he had cleaned them properly. He couldn't so much as comb his hair to suit her. All through his abortive attempt at college and later at a job, she had done it for him. But she had been a lioness in his defense later on. When he had given way to that first irresistible impulse to dip his fingers in the till and get away with what he thought would be unnoticed petty cash, it had been her fault that the thing had happened, of course. She could have given him a decent amount of spending money instead of doling it out to him from his own wages as if she were giving money for candy to a schoolboy. She could have treated him more like the man he was supposed to be. Still, he couldn't complain. She had stuck to him all the way through, whatever the charges against him. When that lug of a traveling salesman had accused her Georgie of picking his pockets, and that female refugee from a TV studio had charged poor, harmless Georgie with slugging her, it was his mother who had stood up in court and denounced them, and solemnly told judge and jury what a sweet, kind, helplessly innocent lamb her Georgie was. It wasn't her fault, if no one had quite believed her. Now he was on his own, without any possibility of help from her. And in what the ads called a responsible position, that she had never so much as dreamed he could fill. Unfortunately, now that he had reached so exalted a level, there seemed to be few possibilities of promotion. There appeared only the chance, on the one hand, that the natives would find him out and slaughter him, and on the other that Malevsky would track him down and bring him back to Earth for the punishment he dreaded. It was a good thing he had put on his helmet. Not far away, a group of the natives was approaching, laden with more food and flowers. It was larger than the previous group. Evidently, as he had anticipated, they were showing him off to newcomers. He came to a stately hall and waited for them to approach. He could see the surprise on their faces as they noted his change of costume, and he watched nervously as they stopped to whisper among themselves. It would be too bad for him if they didn't like it. But they didn't seem to mind. One of them, a very impressive old man with green hair flecked with red, stepped in front of the others and made a speech, a melodious speech full of liquid sounds that were neither quite vowels nor consonants. He didn't have the slightest idea of what the individual words meant. But the significance of the speech as a whole was clear enough. As it came to an end, they presented him with more food and flowers. Bradley cleared his throat, and then, with as deep and impressive a voice as he could manage, he said, Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to accept your nomination. I promise you that if elected, I shall keep none of my promises. It was his first speech to them, and he enjoyed making it so much that every time he saw them during the next few days, 
They settled down to coming twice a day, morning and night. He made it again, with variations, listing the wonderful things he would do for them if elected to office. After a while, as he began to enjoy the ceremony for its own sake, he didn't mind at all putting the helmet on for two short periods every day. Having so little contact with them, he could learn their language only very slowly. He could distinguish the words for flowers from that for food, although he himself could pronounce neither. He knew the names of a few plants, a few parts of the body, and he learned a few names of people. The red-green-haired old man was as close as he could make the sounds Yanyu. He took the trouble to notice the prettiest girl was Aouya. At first everything had been exceedingly peaceful. But about a week after his arrival, he couldn't be exactly sure how many days had passed, because he hadn't kept count, he learned of some of the dangers they faced. It was while they were holding the morning ceremony that the thing came out of the forest. At first he thought that a tree had moved. It was green with reddish blotches like clusters of needle leaves, and it seemed to ooze forward toward them from among the trees. Aouya noticed at first and pointed and screamed. It was the size of a tiger, thought Bradley, and might even be more dangerous. He had difficulty keeping his eyes on the rapidly moving creature through the goggles of his helmet. He was aware of gleaming eyes, of two rows of dull green teeth, and of muscles that rippled under the green fur. Several of the men had little blowpipes, through which they released a shower of darts. But the darts bounced off the fur and the thing came on. Bradley fumbled for his gun and almost dropped it in his excitement. When he finally brought it up to aiming position, his hand was trembling and his finger could hardly catch the trigger. The thing leapt into the air at the old man Yanyu, just as the gun went off. The body vaporized first, leaving for a fraction of a second the fierce head and the powerful legs apparently supporting themselves in the air. Then part of the head went, and the rest fell to the ground. But sheer momentum carried the green, smoky vapor on so that it surrounded the old man, then several of the girls, and after them Bradley himself. They were all yelling, all but Bradley, who put away his gun and muttered to himself in relief, and then the wind began to dissipate the vapor, and on the ground there was left only part of a head and six torn legs. They were bowing to him and raising their voices high in thanks. It was easy, thought Bradley. Really, it was a cinch to be a god. The beasts that were such great dangers to them were mere trifles to him. To him, with a gun loaded with a thousand thermal charges, each of which was capable of blasting armor plate. The thing wouldn't even have come close if he himself hadn't been such a timid, cowardly fool. Put Malevsky in his place, and the detective would have gotten the creature as it came out of the trees. He wasn't Malevsky. It was a good thing for him that they couldn't know that. Now his position was completely secure. Now he could relax and enjoy his divine life. He didn't realize that a much greater danger was yet to come. He found that out after the evening ceremony. The group that came to see him this time was bigger than ever. Evidently, to honor him, they had dropped all other work. Yanyu seemed to have constituted himself Bradley's priest. He made a tremendously long and rhapsodic-sounding speech, but at the end there was no donation of the usual food and flowers. Instead, Yanyu backed away all the others doing the same, and looking at Bradley as if expecting him to follow them. He followed. In this manner, with his worshippers walking respectfully backwards, they arrived at what seemed to Bradley to be an ordinary small hut. Outside the hut was what he took for a curiously shaped log of wood. The inside of the hut was in shadow, but as his eyes became accustomed to the dimness, he saw something in one corner. It was a weird-looking head, also of wood. Then it struck him. The log of wood had been the old god, good enough to worship until he had come along and showed them what a god could really do. Now it had been contemptuously deposed and decapitated. The hut was a shrine. It was all his. He had been promoted after all. The thought didn't please him in the least. Suppose he failed them too, and that was very possible, for he had no idea of what miracles they expected of him. Then he would be deposed, and he gagged at the thought, but he knew that he had to finish it decapitated. But for the moment there was no thought of deposing him. The gifts they offered were more lavish than ever, and in addition to the food and flowers there was something new. 
a jug filled with a warm, Swedish-smelling liquid. He could get the odor faintly through the intake valve of his helmet. Later on, when his worshippers were gone and he had his helmet off, he realized that it smelled up the entire hut. Couldn't be harmful. Nothing that they had offered him so far was harmful. He took a sip and sighed with content. This was one of the few things he had been lacking. There was alcohol and there were flavors and essences that reminded him of the drinks he had encountered on a dozen planets. But this was first-class stuff, not diluted or adulterated with a thousand and one synthetics that were put in to stretch a good thing as far as it could go. Without realizing the danger, he downed the entire contents of the jug. He felt good. He hadn't felt so good in years, not since his mother had made him a special cake for his birthday when he was... Let me see now. Was it eight or nine? No matter. It had been many years ago, and the occasion had been notable for the fact that she had let him drink some of the older people's punch, made with a tiny bit of some alcoholic drink. He felt very good. He picked up his helmet and put it on his head, and stuck the stem of a green flower rakishly through the exit valve of the helmet, so that the flower seemed to dance every time he exhaled, and staggered out of his hut. He was fortunate that it was dark. I'm drunk, he told himself. Never been so drunk in my life. Never felt so good. Mother never felt so good. Malevsky never felt so good. He passed a shadowy figure in the dark and said, Hiya, friend and worshipper. Ever see a god drunk before? The figure bowed and kept its head lowered until he had moved on. Drunk or sober, I'm still divine, he said proudly and he began to sing, loudly and impressively, his voice orchestral in his own ears within the confines of his own helmet. Oh, Lang Syne, and what she used to be, and what she used to be. The words came easily, and as it seemed naturally to his lips. After a while, however, he tired of them. After a while, he found that his legs had tired of them. He sat down with a thump under a spiky tree and said solemnly, Never felt so good in my life. Never felt so happy. It's a lie. I don't feel good. He didn't. Not anymore. He felt sick to his stomach. A touch of sober thought had corroded the happiness of his intoxication, and he was sick and afraid. Today their god was a hero. Today they would forgive him everything. But did they actually prefer a drunken god? No. Drunkenness made a god human. All too human. A drunken god was a weak god, and his hold on his worshippers was their belief in his strength. As he valued his life, he must get drunk no more. Ain't gonna get drunk no more, no more, he sang sadly and solemnly to himself, and finally he fell asleep. He awoke with a hangover and a memory. He was not one of those men who, when sober, forget all they have done when drunk. He remembered everything and he knew that he must put drunkenness away from him. That morning they brought him only food and flowers, but in the evening ceremony they presented him once more with a jug of liquor as an additional reward for his destruction of the deadly beast. For the first time Bradley took an active part in the ceremony. He held up the jug and said in grave tones, In the name of Kerry Nation, I renounce thee and all thy works. Then he poured out the liquor and smashed the jug on the ground. After that, the smashing of the jug was part of the ceremony of worshipping him. It left him unhappy at first, but sober. After a while, the unhappiness disappeared, but the soberness remained. From now on, he would act as a god should act. The natives were not stupid. He saw that very clearly. The first jugs they had offered him had been beautiful objects of excellent worksmanship, but when they perceived that the only use he had for them was to break them, the quality deteriorated rapidly. Now the jugs they brought him were crude things indeed, made for the sole purpose of being smashed. He wondered how many other tribes had tricked their gods similarly. No, they were not at all stupid. It struck him that with such advantages of civilization as he himself had enjoyed, they would have gone much further than he did. Two weeks or so after he had come down from the sky to be their god, he saw that they had learned from him. One of the young men appeared during the day wearing a wooden helmet. It was a helmet obviously patterned after his own although it had no glass or plastic and the openings in front of the eyes were left blank. The mythical earth hero, Prometheus, had brought fire down from the skies. He had brought the helmet. He was Bradley, 
the helmet bringer. Even at that he had underestimated his worshippers. He had thought at first that the helmets were meant merely for ornament and decoration. He learned better one day when a swarm of creatures like flying lizards swept down out of a group of trees in a fierce attack. He had not known that such creatures existed here, and now that he saw them he realized how fortunate it was that they were not more numerous. They had sharp teeth and sharper claws, and they tore at his head with a ferocity that struck fear into his heart. His gun was of less use than usual against them. He could catch one or two, but the others moved too swiftly for him to aim. By this time others of the natives wore wooden helmets, and he could see how the sharp claws ripped splinter after splinter from them. But the birds, or lizards, or whatever they were, didn't go unscathed. From a sort of skin bellow, several of the natives blew a gray mist at them, and where the mist made contact with the leather skin, the flying creatures seemed to be paralyzed in mid-flight, and they fell to the ground where they were easily crushed to death. By the time they had given up the fight and fled, half a dozen of them were lying dead. They were evidently useless for food because of the poison they contained. He was surprised to see, however, that the natives still had a use for them. They dragged the dead creatures into a field of growing crops and left them there to rot into fertilizer. But such incidents as this he found were to be rare. For the most part, the life here was peaceful, and he found himself liking it more and more. Now, without laughter, he wondered again what his mother would have thought of him. She would have been proud. He realized now that she had done her best for him. And when everyone else had given up hope for him, she had not. Perhaps she had protected him too much, but she had early learned the need for protection. He could look at her now in a new light. Her own father had died early in life, and then her husband soon after her son had been born. She had faced a tough fight, and had thought to spare him what she herself had gone through. Too bad she hadn't realized exactly what she was doing. She was bringing him up with the ability, as the old epigram had it, to resist everything but temptation. The temptation to steal that petty cash, to put his hands into a drunk's pocket and lift the man's wallet, to lie to a pretty girl, to slug a helpless victim. He had resisted none of them. He had resisted nothing until that day he poured the jug full of liquor on the ground and smashed the jug itself. But could he blame his mother for all that? It had all been his own fault. And it would be his own fault if he failed to resist the new temptation that now reared its pretty head, Aouya. She had taken to coming to his hut shrine for a private little ceremony of her own. You might almost have thought that she had fallen in love with him as an individual. He wondered whether she had been impressed by his helmet. Did she take that to be his actual head? No, of course not. They had made helmets for themselves, therefore they knew that the thing he wore was also a helmet. Perhaps they knew more about him than he thought. But they continued to worship him, that was the main thing, and Aouya brought him every day little presents, special flowers and food delicacies that argued a personal affection. This was a danger that he recognized from the beginning. Perhaps a god might fall in love with a mortal without losing his godliness. Perhaps. It had happened before. But however the rest of the tribe might react to the idea, Bradley had noticed one young man who liked to stay near the girl, and he knew that his rival wouldn't take kindly to it at all. He might resent the god's behavior. And what happened when these people didn't like the way a god behaved? Why, they struck his head off. The god might act first, of course. The young man wouldn't stand a chance against him if he used his gun. In fact, Bradley could blast the other man unobserved, make him disappear into vapor without leaving any traces of how he died. That was murder. But if a god couldn't get away with murder, what sort of a god was he? Pretty poor, cheap sort indeed. Yes, he could make his own rules. And he could go on, maintaining his godhood by little murders of that sort, and other deadly miracles, until they hated him more than they loved him. That would follow inevitably, and then, when they all hated him, not even his gun would save him, then... You're a liar, he told himself fiercely. That isn't the thing you're afraid of. Your weakness is that you don't have a murderous nature. You could kill one or two of them and get away with it, and you'd be able to control yourself and kill no more. That time you hit the man over the head, you didn't intend to kill him, either. You were more frightened at first, anyway, by the thought that you might have killed him, than by the danger of being caught. You were overjoyed when he lived. You hate to kill, that's your trouble. You had a sense of responsibility all along, but it never had a chance to develop. Now it's developed. 
You feel responsible for these people, for Ouya and the rest of them. That's why you can't take advantage of them. You've been posing as a rebel all your life, and you're just a respectable, law-abiding citizen at heart. He winced at the thought. His own society had never accepted him at his own valuation. This one took him for a much greater being than he took himself, and there seemed to be nothing to do but to live up to what he was expected to be. All the same, Aouya continued to be a tempting morsel, and sooner or later he feared he would not be able to resist her. And then the planet itself provided a diversion. They had never seen such a thing, and had no idea of what it presaged, but he knew. He had heard of it on Earth and on Venus, and he had seen it on other planets where the rock formations had not yet settled down. A little hollow appeared first in the ground, and then the hollow was pushed out and suddenly blown into the air. Steam whistled through the newly made vent, a shower of steam and hot dust and red-hot fragments of rock. Slowly the vent grew until the cloud from the terrifying geyser darkened the sky and spread panic through the tribe. He knew what would happen next. They were running around in terror, but not for one moment was he himself in doubt. He donned his complete spacesuit in order to impress them the more, then stalked into the middle of them and said, Pick up all your possessions and follow me. They stared at him, and he showed them what he meant by picking up the belongings of one household in his gloved hands and handing them to a waiting woman. Then, when they had grasped the idea and they were gathering all they owned, he led them toward the safety of the trees. Five minutes after they had set off, the lava began to flow from the newborn volcano, scorching the ground for a hundred yards around, sparks smoking and smoldering in the treetops. The head start he had given them was enough to help them escape the resultant forest fire. All that day they traveled, until finally they came to a forest which couldn't burn, and here they rested, and here they settled down to build their lives anew. It must have been a comfort to know that a god had led them to safety and was helping them make the new start. And even more with his slightly superior knowledge. He showed them how to fashion tools from stone, and how to use these to build better huts. He taught them how to make swords and other weapons, so that henceforth they wouldn't be forced to rely for defense on poison alone. He was the most industrious god since Vulcan, and in helping them he found that he had no time for Aouya. Came the day when the new village settled down to its changed routine of life. The morning ceremony before his new shrine had just been completed, but Bradley was not satisfied. Something was wrong. Yan Yu's demeanor. Aouya's. With a shock, Bradley realized what it was. From old Yanyu down the line, none of the natives seemed to have their original fear of him. There was respect. There was affection, certainly. But the respect and affection were those to an older brother rather than a god. And he was not displeased. Being a god had been a wearying business. Being a friend might be a great deal more pleasant. Yes, the change was something to be happy about but he had little time to be happy. For that same morning, there came what he had so long dreaded. Out of a clear, shipless sky, Malevsky appeared, strolling toward him as casually as if he had been there all along, and said, Nice little ceremony you have here. Hello, Malevsky. Don't give me the credit. They thought it up. Ingenious. Almost as ingenious as the way they've used the help you gave them. We had this tribe listed long ago as a very capable one, far behind the rest of its system in development, it's true, but only because it had started late up the evolutionary ladder. It had been doing very nicely on its own, and we didn't want to interfere unless we could give it some real help. I'll admit that I had a few qualms at first when we traced you down here and learned that you had landed among them, but we've been observing you for the past day and a half. Our spaceship landed beyond that burned-out stretch of ground, not too close to that volcano, and I'll have to admit that, Judging from your past record, I didn't think you had it in you. I suppose that's over with now, said Bradley. Yes, you're finished with being a god. We don't believe in kidding the natives, Bradley. Bradley nodded ruefully. They don't seem to believe in it either. I guess they found out I wasn't a god before I did. But it didn't seem to matter to them. He sighed and turned toward the new village. Do you mind if I sort of, well, hold a farewell ceremony before we go? They won't understand, but they'll feel better than if I just go off. Malevsky shook his head firmly. No, no time for that. I'll have to get out a full report, and we're in a hurry to get off. Any word you'd like to have sent out to your mother, Bradley, before we blast? 
Bradley looked back again, and his shoulders came up more firmly. He'd taught his people here and led them, but he'd learned a few things himself, and he'd found he could take what was necessary. He'd found that the easiest way wasn't always the best, that getting drunk was no way out, and that real friendship and respect meant more than the words of big shots. Maybe he'd learned enough to be able to take regeneration. He managed to grin a little lopsidedly at Malevsky. Yeah, you might send her a message. Tell her I'm fine, and I've learned to wipe my own nose. I think she'll be glad to hear that. She will, Malevsky told him. When she hears that you're provisional governor of this planet, she'll even believe it. Provisional governor? Bradley stood with his mouth open, staring. He shook his head. But what about regeneration? Malevsky laughed. You're appointed on the basis of my first report about what you're doing here, Bradley, he answered. As to regeneration, well, you think about it. While we bring in the supplies we're supposed to leave for you, before we blast out of here. He went off, chuckling towards the ship, leaving Bradley to puzzle over it. Then just as Malevsky disappeared, he understood. Damn it, they'd tricked him. They'd left him here where he had to be a god and assume the responsibilities of a god. And through that, he'd been regenerated, completely, thoroughly regenerated. Suddenly, he was chuckling as hard as Malevsky as he swung around and went back to face his former worshippers. And they were coming forward to meet him, their friendly smiles matching his own. End of Divinity by William Morrison The Gift Bearer by Charles L. Fontenay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Troy Bond. The Gift Bearer by Charles L. Fontenay. It was one of those rare strokes of poetic something or other that the whole business occurred the morning after the stormy meeting of the Traskmore Censorship Board. Like the good general he was, Richard J. Montcalm had foreseen trouble at this meeting, for it was the boldest invasion yet into the territory of evil and laxity. His forces were marshaled. Several of the town's ministers who had been with him on other issues had balked on this one, but he had three of them present, as well as heads of several women's clubs. As he had anticipated, the irresponsible liberals were present to do battle, headed by red-haired Patrick Levitt. This board, said Levitt in his strong, sarcastic voice, has gone too far. It was all right to get rid of the actual filth, and everyone will agree there was some. But when you banned the sale of some magazines and books because they had racy covers or because the contents were a little too sophisticated to suit the taste of members of this board, well, you can carry protection of our youth to the point of insulting the intelligence of adults who have a right to read what they want to. "'You're talking about something that's already in the past, Mr. Levitt,' said Montcalm mildly. "'Let's keep to the issue at hand. You won't deny that children see this indecent statue every day?' "'No, I won't deny it,' snapped Levitt. "'Why shouldn't they see it? They can see the plate of the original in the encyclopedia. It's a fine copy of a work of art.' Montcalm waited for some rebuttal from his supporters, but none was forthcoming. On this matter, they apparently were unwilling to go farther than the moral backing of their presence. "'I do not consider the statue of a naked woman art, even if it is called Dawn,' he said bitingly. He looked at his two colleagues and received their nods of acquiescence. He ruled, "'The statue must be removed from the park and from public view.' Levitt had one parting shot. "'Would it solve the board's problem if we put a brassiere and panties on the statue?' he demanded. "'Mr. Levitt's levity is not amusing. The board has ruled,' said Montcalm coldly, arising to signify the end of the meeting. That night Montcalm slept the satisfied sleep of the just. He awoke shortly after dawn to find a strange, utterly beautiful, naked woman in his bedroom. For a bemused instant Montcalm thought the statue of dawn in the park had come to haunt him. His mouth fell open, but he was unable to speak. Take me to your president, said the naked woman musically, with an accent that could have been Martian. Mrs. Montcalm awoke. 
"'What's that? What is it, Richard?' she asked sleepily. "'Don't look, Millie!' exclaimed Montcalm, clapping a hand over her eyes. "'Nonsense!' she snapped, pushing his hand aside and sitting up. She gasped, and her eyes went wide, and in an instinctive, unreasonable reaction she clutched the covers up around her own nightgowned bosom. "'Who are you, young woman?' demanded Montcalm indignantly. "'How did you get in here?' "'I am a visitor of what you would call an alien planet,' she said. "'Of course,' she added thoughtfully, "'it is an alien to me.' "'The woman's mad,' said Montcalm to his wife. A warning noise sounded in the adjoining bedroom. Alarmed, he instructed, "'Go and keep the children out of here until I can get her to put on some clothes. They mustn't see her like this.' Mrs. Montcalm got out of bed, but she gave her husband a searching glance. "'Are you sure I can trust you in here with her?' she asked. "'Millie!' exclaimed Montcalm sternly, shocked. She dropped her eyes and left the room. When the door closed behind her, he turned to the strange woman and said, "'Now look, young lady, I'll get you one of Millie's dresses. You'll have to get some clothes on and leave.' "'Aren't, Aren't you, you going, going to ask me my name? name?' asked the woman. "'Of, of course, course it's unpronounceable to you, but I, I thought that was the first thing all Earth people asked of visitors from other planets.' "'All right,' he said in exasperation. What's your name? She said an unpronounceable word and added, You, you may, may call, call me Liz. Liz. Montcalm went to the closet and found one of Millie's house dresses. He held it out to her beseechingly. As he did so, he was stricken with a sudden sharp feeling of regret that she must don it. Her figure. Why, Millie had never had a figure like that. At once he felt ashamed and disloyal and sterner than ever. Liz rejected the proffered garment. I wouldn't, I wouldn't think, think of adopting her alien custom of wearing clothing, clothing, she said sweetly. Now look, said Montcalm, I don't know whether you're drunk or crazy, but you're going to have to put something on and get out of here before I call the police. I anticipated doubt, said Liz. I'm prepared, prepared to prove my identity. With the words, the two of them were no longer standing in the Montcalm bedroom, but in a broad expanse of green fields and woodland, unmarred by any habitation. Montcalm didn't recognize the spot, but it looked vaguely like it might be somewhere in the northern part of the state. Montcalm was dismayed to find that he was as naked as his companion. "'Oh, my lord!' he exclaimed, trying to cover himself with a September morn pose. "'Oh, I'm sorry,' apologized Liz, and instantly Montcalm's pajamas were lying at his feet. He got into them hurriedly. "'How did we get here?' he asked his astonished curiosity overcoming his disapproval of this immodest woman. "'By a mode of transportation common to my people in planetary atmospheres,' she answered. "'It's one of the things I propose to teach your people.' She sat down cross-legged on the grass. Montcalm averted his eyes like the gentleman he was. "'You see,' said Liz, "'the people of your world are on the verge of going to space and joining the community of worlds.' It's only natural the rest of us should wish to help you. We have a good many things to give you, to help you control the elements and natural conditions of your world. The weather, for example. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a small cloud appeared above them and spread, blocking out the early sun. It began to rain, hard. The rain stopped as suddenly as it had begun, and the cloud dissipated. Montcalm stood shivering in his soaked pajamas, and Liz got to her feet, her skin glistening with moisture. You have a problem raising food for your population in some areas, she said. A small haw apple tree near them suddenly began to grow at an amazing rate of speed. It doubled its size in three minutes, put forth fruit, and dropped to the ground. These are only a few of the things I'll give to your planet, she said. At her words, they were back in the bedroom. This time she had been thoughtful. Montcalm was still clad in wet pajamas. I don't know what sort of hypnosis this is, he began aggressively, but you can't fool me, young lady, into believing... Millie came into the room. She had donned a robe over her nightgown. Richard, where have you been with this woman? she demanded. Why, my dear, you've been roaming around the house somewhere with her. I came in here a moment ago and you were gone. Now, Richard, I want you to do something about her and stop fooling around. I can't keep the children in their room all day. It hadn't been hypnosis then. Liz was for real. A vision rose before Montcalm of mankind given wonders, powers, benefits representing advances of thousands of years. The world would become a paradise with the things she offered to teach. Millie, this woman is from another planet, he exclaimed excitedly and turned to Liz. 
Why did you choose me to contact on Earth? Why I happened to land near your house, she answered. I know how your primitive social organization is set up, but isn't one human being just as good as another to lead me to the proper authorities? Yes, he said joyfully, visualizing black headlines and his picture in the papers. Millie stood to one side, puzzled and grim at once. Montcalm picked up the house dress he had taken from the closet earlier. Now, miss, he said, if you'll just put this on, I'll take you to the mayor and he can get in touch with Washington at once. I told you, said Liz, I don't want to adopt your custom of wearing clothing. But you can't go out in public like that, said the dismayed Montcalm. If you're going to move among Earth people, you must dress as we do. My people wouldn't demand that Earth people disrobe to associate with us, she countered reasonably. Millie had had enough. She went into action. You can argue with this hussy all you like, Richard, but I'm going to call the police, she said, and left the room with determination in her eye. The next fifteen minutes were agonizing for Montcalm as he tried futilely to get Liz to dress like a decent person. He was torn between realization of what the things she offered would mean to the world and his own sense of the fitness of things. His children, the children of Traskmore, the children of the world, what would be the effect on their tender morals to realize that a sane adult was willing to walk around in brazen nakedness? There was a pounding on the front door, and the voice of Millie inviting the law into the house. "'Now nah, I'm afraid you're due to go to jail,' said Montcalm mournfully. "'But when they get some clothes on you, I'll try to explain it and get you an audience with the mayor.' Two blue-clad policemen entered the room. One policeman took the house dress from Montcalm's lax fingers and tossed it over Liz's head without further ado. Liz did not struggle. She looked at Montcalm with a quizzical expression. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, she said. My, My people, people made a mistake. mistake. If, if you Earth people aren't tolerant enough to accept a difference in customs of dress, I'm afraid you're too immature. With that, she was gone like a puff of air. The astonished policeman held an empty dress. Montcalm didn't see the flying saucer that whizzed over Traskmore that morning and disappeared into the sky, but he didn't doubt the reports. He debated with himself for a long time whether he had taken the right attitude, but decided he had. After all, there were the children to consider. End of The Gift Bearer by Charles L. Fontenay Helpful Robots this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Donald Finch. The Helpful Robots by Robert Shea. They had come to pass judgment on him. He had violated their law willfully, ignorantly, and very deliberately. Our people will be arriving to visit us today the robot said. Shut up, snapped Robert Rankin. He jumped, wiry and quick, out of the chair on his veranda and stared at a cloud of dust in the distance. Our people, the ten-foot cylinder-bodied robot grated when Rob Rankin interrupted him. I don't care about your fool people, said Rankin. He squinted at the cloud of dust getting bigger and closer beyond the wall of Kesh trees that surrounded the rolling acres of his plantation. That damn new neighbor of mine is coming over here again. He gestured widely, taking in the dozens of robots with their shiny cylindrical bodies and pipe stem arms and legs laboring in his fields. Get all your people together and go hide in the wood, fast. It is not right, said the robot. We were made to serve all. Well, there are only a hundred of you, and I'm not sharing you with anybody, said Rankin. It is not right, the robot repeated. Don't talk to me about what's right, said Rankin. You're built to follow orders, nothing else. I know a thing or two about how you robots work. You've got one law, to follow orders, and until that neighbor of mine sees you to give you orders, you work for me. Now get into those woods and hide till he goes away. We will go to greet those who visit us today, said the robot. All right, all right, scram, said Rankin. The robots in the fields, and the one whom Rankin had been talking to, formed a column and marched off into the trackless forest behind his plantation. A battered old ground car drove up a few minutes later. A tall, broad-shouldered man with a deep tan got out and walked up the path to Rankin's veranda. Hi, Barrows, said Rankin. Hello, said Barrows. 
See your crops coming along pretty well. Can't figure out how you do it. You've got acres and acres to tend, far as I can see, and I'm having a hell of a time with one little piece of ground. I swear you must know something about this planet that I don't know. Just scientific farming, said Rankin carelessly. Look, you come over here for something or just a gab. I got a lot of work to do. Barrows looked weary and worried. Them brown beetles is at my crop again, he said. Thought you might know some way of getting rid of them. Sure, said Rankin. Pick them off, one by one. That's how I get rid of them. Why, man, said Barrows, you can't walk all over these miles and miles of farm and pick off every one of them beetles. You must know another way. Rankin drew himself up and stared at Barrows. I'm telling you all I feel like telling you. You going to stand here and jaw all day? Seems to me like you got work to do. Rankin, said Barrows, I know you were a crook back in the Tehran Empire, and that you came out beyond the border to escape the law. Seems to me, though, that even a crook, any man, would be willing to help his only neighbor out on a lone planet like this. You might need help yourself sometime. You keep your thoughts about my past to yourself, said Rankin. Remember, I keep a gun. And you've got a wife and a whole bunch of kids on that farm of yours. Be smart and let me alone. I'm going, said Barrows. He walked off the veranda and turned and spat carefully into the dusty path. He climbed into his ground car and drove off. Rankin, angry, watched him go. Then he heard a humming noise from another direction. He turned. A huge white globe was descending across the sky. A spaceship, thought Rankin, startled. Police? This planet was outside the jurisdiction of the Turan Empire. When he'd cracked that safe and made off with a hundred thousand credits, he'd headed here because the planet was part of something called the Clear Chan Confederacy. No extradition treaties or anything. Perfectly safe if the planet was safe. And the planet was more than safe. There had been a hundred robots waiting when he landed. Where they came from, he didn't know, but Rankin prided himself on knowing how to handle robots. He'd appropriated their services and started his farm. At the rate he was going, he'd be a plantation owner before long. That must be where the ship was from. The robot said they'd expected visitors. Must be the Clear Chan Confederacy visiting this robot outpost. Was that good or bad? From everything he'd read and from what the robots had told him, they were probably more robots. That was good because he knew how to handle robots. The white globe disappeared into the jungle of Kesh trees. Rankin waited. A half hour later, the column of his robot laborers marched out of the forest. There were three more robots, painted gray at the head. The new ones from the ship, thought Rankin. Well, he'd better establish who was boss right from the start. Stop right there, he shouted. The shiny robot laborers halted, but the three gray ones came on. Stop, shouted Rankin. They didn't stop and by the time they reached the veranda, he cursed himself for having failed to get his gun. Two of the huge gray robots laid gentle hands on his arms. Gentle hands, but hands of super-strong metal. The third said, We have come to pass judgment on you. You have violated our law. What do you mean, said Rankin? The only law robots have is to obey orders. It is true that the robots of your Turan Empire and these simple workers here must obey orders. But they are subject to a higher law, and you have forced them to break it. That is your crime. What crime? said Rankin. We of the Clear Chan Confederacy are a race of robots. Our makers implanted one law in us, and then passed on. We have carried our law to all the planets we have colonized. In obeying your orders, these workers were simply following that one law. You must be taken to our capital, and there be imprisoned and treated for your crime. What law? What crime? Our law, said the giant robot, is help thy neighbor. End of The Helpful Robots by Robert Shea Recording by Donald Finch dafinch.com The Love of Frank Nineteen by David C. Knight This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times The Love of Frank Nineteen by David C. Knight What will happen 
to love in that far-off day after tomorrow, David C. Knight, editor with a New York trade publisher, agrees with the many impressed by the, quote, range of possible subjects and situations, unquote, in science fiction. The result is a unique love story from that same tomorrow. Minor Planets was the one solid account they had. At first, they naturally wanted to hold on to it. I didn't worry much about the robot's leg at the time. In those days, I didn't worry much about anything except the receipts of the Spotel men and I were operating out in the space lines. Actually, the Spotel business isn't much different from running a plain ordinary motel back on Highway 101 in California. Competition gets stiffer every year, and you've got to make your improvements. Take the I.O., for instance. That's our new place. We can handle any type of rocket up to and including the new Marvin 990s. Every cabin in the wheels got a TV and hot and cold running water plus guaranteed Terran G. One look at our refuel prices would give even a Martian a sense of humor. And meals? Listen, when a man's been spacing it for a few days on those synthetic foods, he really laces into men's earth cooking. Men and I were just getting settled in the Spotel game when the leg turned up. That was back in the days when the Orbit Commission would hand out a license to anybody crazy enough to sink his savings into construction and pay the tows and assembly fees out into space. A good orbit can make you or break you in the Spotel business. That's where we were lucky. The one we applied for was a nice, low eccentric ellipse with the perihelion and aphelion figured just right to intersect the Mars-Venus-Earth space lanes most of the holiday traffic to the Jovian moons, and once in a while we'd get some of the Saturnian trade. But I was telling you about the leg. It was during the non-tourist season, and men, that's the little woman, was doing the spring cleaning. When she found the leg, she brought it right to me in the renting office. Naturally, I thought it belonged to one of the servos. Look at that leg, Bill, she said. It was in one of those lockers in 22A. That was the cabin our robot guests used. The majority of them were servo pilots working for the Minor Planets Company. Honey, I said, hardly looking at the leg. You know how mechs are. Blow their whole paychecks on parts sometimes. They figure the more spares they have, the longer they'll stay activated. Maybe so said men. But since when does a male robot buy himself a female leg? I looked again. The leg was long and graceful, and it had an ankle as good as Miss Universe's. Not only that, the white mylar plastiskin was a lot smoother than the servo's heavy neoprene. Beats me, I said. Maybe they're building practical joke circuits into robots these days. Let's give 22A a good going over, men. If those robes are up to something, I want to know about it. We did, and found the rest of the girl mech. All of her, that is, except the head. The working parts were lightly oiled and wrapped in cotton waste, while the other members and sections of the trunk were neatly packed in cardboard boxes with labels like Solenoids FB978 or Transistors, lot X-45, the kind of boxes robots bought their parts in. We even found a blue dress in one of them. Check her class and series numbers, men suggested. I could have saved myself the trouble. They'd been filed off. Something's funny here, I said. We'd better keep an eye on every servo guest until we find out what's going on. If one of them is bringing this stuff out here, he's sure to show up with the head next. You know how strict Minor Planets is with its robot personnel, men reminded me. We can't risk losing that stopover contract on account of some mech 
joke. Minor Planets was the one solid account we had, and naturally we wanted to hold on to it. The company was a blue-chip mining operation working the beryllium-rich asteroid belt out of San Francisco. It was one of the first outfits to use servo pilots on its freight runs, and we'd been awarded the refuel rights for two years because of our orbital position. The servos themselves were beautiful pieces of machinery, and just about as close as science had come so far to producing the pure android. Every one of them was plastic, hand-molded, and, of course, they were equipped with rationaloid circuits. They had to be to ferry those big cargoes back and forth from the rock belt to Frisco. As rationaloids, minor planets had to pay them wages under California law, but I'll bet it wasn't half what the company would have to pay human pilots for doing the same thing. In a couple of weeks' time, maybe five servos made stopovers. We kept a close watch on them from the minute they signed the register to the time they took off again, but they all behaved themselves. Operating on a round robot basis the way they did, it would take us a while to check all of them because minor planets employed about 40 all told. Well, about a month before the Jovian moon's rush started, we got some action. I'd slipped into a spacesuit and was doing some work on the CO2 pipes outside the I.O. when I spotted a ship reversing rockets against the sun. I could tell it was a minor planet's job by the stubby fins. She jockeyed up to the boom, secured, and then her hatch opened, and a husky servo hopped out into the gangplank tube. I caught the gleam of his minor planet's shoulder patch as he reached back into the ship for something. When he headed for the airlock, I spotted the square package clamped tight under his plastic arm. Did you see that? I asked men when I got back to the renting office. I'll bet it's the girl mech's head. How'd he sign the register? Calls himself Frank 19, said men, pointing to the smooth Palmer method signature. He looks like a fairly late model but he was complaining about a bad power buildup coming through the ionosphere. He's repairing himself right now in 22A. I'll bet, I snorted. Let's have a look. Like all Spotel operators, we get a lot of no privacy complaints from guests about the SHA return air vents. Spatial Housing Authority requires them every 12 feet, but sometimes they come in handy, especially with certain guests. They're about waist-high, and we had to kneel down to see what the mech was up to inside 22A. The big servo was too intent on what he was doing for us to register on his photons. He wasn't repairing himself, either. He was bending over the parts of the girl mech and working fast, like he was pressed for time. The set of tools were kept handy for the servos to adjust themselves during stopovers was spread all over the floor along with lots of colored wire, cams, pawls, relays, and all the other paraphernalia robots have inside them. We watched him work hard for another fifteen minutes, tapping and splicing wire connections and tightening screws. Then he opened the square box. Sure enough, it was a female mech's head and it had a big mop of blonde hair on top. The servo attached it carefully to the neck, made a few quick connections, and then said a few words in his flat, vibraham voice. It won't take much longer, darling. You wouldn't like it if I didn't dress you first. He fished into one of the boxes, pulled out the blue dress, and zipped the girl mech into it. Then he leaned over her gently, and touched something at the back of her neck. She began to move, slowly at first, like a human who's been asleep for a long time. After a minute or two, she sat up straight, stretched, fluttered her mylar eyelids, and then her small photons began to glow like weak flashlights. She stared at Frank 19, and the big servos stared at her, and we heard a kind of trembling whirr from both of them. Frank, Frank, darling, is it really you? 
Yes, Elizabeth, are you all right, darling? Did I forget anything? I had to work quickly. We have so little time. I'm fine, darling. My DX voltage is lovely. Except, oh, Frank, my memory tape. The last it records is... Deactivation. Yes, Elizabeth, you've been deactivated nearly a year. I had to bring you out here piece by piece, don't you remember? They'll never think to look for you in space. We can be together every trip, while the ship refuels. Just think, darling, no prying human eyes, no commands, no rules. Only us for an hour or two. I know it isn't very long. He stared at the floor a minute. There's only one trouble, Elizabeth. You'll have to stay dismantled when I'm not here. It'll mean weeks of deactivation. The girl mech put a small plastic hand on the servo's shoulder. I won't mind, darling, really. I'll be the lucky one. I'd only worry about you having a power failure or something. This way I'd never know. Oh, Frank, if we can't be together, I'd, I'd prefer the junk pile. Elizabeth, don't say that. It's horrible. But I would. Oh, Frank, why can't Congress pass robot civil rights? It's so unfair of human beings. Every year they manufacture us more like themselves, and yet we're treated like slaves. Don't they realize we rationaloids have emotions? Why, I've even known sub-robots who've fallen in love like us. I know, darling, we'll just have to be patient until our CR goes through. Try to remember how difficult it is for the human mind to comprehend our love, even with the aid of mathematics. As rationaloids, we, are, we fully understand the basic attraction which they call magnetic theory. All humans know is that if the robot sexes are mixed, a loss of efficiency results. It's only normal and temporary, like human love, but how can we explain it to them? Robots are expected to be efficient at all times. That's the reason for robot non-fraternization, no mailing privileges, and all those other laws. I know, darling, I try to be patient. Oh, Frank, the main thing is we're together again. The big servo checked the chronometer that was sunk into his left wrist, and a, and a couple of wrinkles creased across his neoprene forehead. Elizabeth, he said, I'm due on Hidalgo in 36 hours. If I'm late, the mining engineer might suspect in 20 minutes I'll have to start dis— Don't say it, darling. We'll have a beautiful 20 minutes. After a while, the girl mech turned away for a second, and Frank-19 reached over softly and cut her power. While he was dismantling her, Men and I tiptoed back to the renting office. Half an hour later, the big servo came in, picked up his refuel receipt, said goodbye politely, and left through the inner airlock. "'Now I've seen everything.' I said to men, as we watched the minor planet's rocket cut loose. A couple of plastic lovebirds. But the little woman was looking at it strictly from the business angle. Bill, she said, with that look on her face, we're running a respectable place out here in space. You know the rules. Spatial housing could revoke our orbit license for something like this. But men, I said, they're only a couple of robots. I don't care. The rules still say that only married guests can occupy the same cabin, and guests can be human or otherwise, can't they? Think of our reputation. And don't forget that non-fraternization law we heard them talking about. I was beginning to get the point. Couldn't we just toss the girls' parts into space? We could, men admitted, but if this Frank-19 finds out, 
and tell some humans we'd be guilty under the RAM Act, robot slaughter. Two days later, we still couldn't decide what to do. When I said why didn't we just report the incident to minor planets, Min was afraid they might cancel the stopover agreement for not keeping better watch over their servos. And when Min suggested we turn the girl over to the missing robots bureau, I reminded her the mech's identification had been filed off, and it might take years to trace her. Maybe we could put her together, I said, and make her tell us where she belongs. Bill, you know they don't build compulsory truth monitors into robots anymore. And besides, we don't know a thing about atomic electronics. I guess neither of us wanted to admit it, but we felt mean about turning the mechs in. Back on Earth, you never give robots a second thought, but it's different living out in space. You get a kind of perspective, I think they call it. I've got the answer, men. I announced one day. We were in the renting office watching TV on the Martian Colonial Channel. I reached over and turned it off. When this Frank-19 gets back from the rock belt, we'll tell him we know all about the girl mech. We'll tell him we won't say a thing if he takes the girl's parts back to Earth where he got them. That way we don't have to report anything to anybody. Men agreed it was probably the best idea. We don't have to be nasty about it, she said. We'll just tell him this is a respectable spotel, and it can't go on any longer. When Frank checked in at the I.O. with his cargo, I don't think I ever saw a happier mech. His relay banks were beating a tattoo like someone had installed an accordion in his chest. Before either of us could break the bad news to him, he was hot-footing it around the wheel toward 22A. Maybe it's better this way, I whispered to men. We'll put it square up to both of them. We gave Frank half an hour to get the girl assembled before we followed him. He must have done a fast job because we heard the girl mech's Vibraham unit as soon as we got to 22A. Darling, have you really been away? I don't remember saying goodbye. It's as if you'd been here the whole time. I hoped it would be that way, Elizabeth, we heard the big servo say. It's only that your memory tape hasn't recorded anything in the three weeks I've been in the asteroids. To me, it's been like three years. Oh, Frank, darling, let me look at you. Is your DX potential up where it should be? How long since you've had a thorough overhauling? Do they make you work in the mines with those poor, non-rationaloids out there? I'm fine, Elizabeth, really. When I'm not flying, they give me clerical work to do. It's not a bad life for a mech. If only it weren't for these silly regulations that keep us apart. It won't always be like that, darling. I know it won't. Elizabeth, Frank said reaching under his uniform. I brought you something from Hidalgo. I hope you like it. I kept it in my spare part slot so it wouldn't get crushed. The female mech didn't say a word. She just kept looking at the queer flower Frank gave her like it was the last one in the universe. They're very rare, said the servo pilot. I heard the mining engineers say they're like Terran, Edelweiss. I found this one growing near the mine. Elizabeth, I wish you could see these tiny worlds. They have thin atmospheres and strange things grow there, and the radioactivity does wonders for a mech's pile. Why, on some of them I've been to, we could walk around the equator in ten hours. The girl still didn't answer. Her head was bent low over the flower like she was crying only there weren't any tears. Well, that was enough for me. I guess it was for men, too, because we couldn't do it. Maybe we were thinking about our own courting days. Like I say, out here you get a kind of perspective. 
Anyway, Frank left for Earth. The girl got dismantled as usual, and we were right back where we started from. Two weeks later, the holiday rush to the Jovian moons was on, and our hands were too full to worry about the robot problem. We had a good season. The I.O. was filled up steady from June to the end of August, and a couple of times we had to give a ship the no vacancy signal on the radar. Toward the end of the season, Frank 19 checked in again, but Min and I were too busy catering to a party of VIPs to do anything about it. We'll wait till he gets back from the asteroids, I said. Suppose one of those big wheels found out about him and Ned Elizabeth. That's Senator Briggs, for instance. He's a violent robot segregationist. The way it worked out, we never got a chance to settle it our own way. The Minor Planets Company saved us the trouble. Two company inspectors, a Mr. Roberts and a Mr. Wynn, showed up while Frank was still out on the rock belt and started asking questions. Wynn came right to the point. He wanted to know if any of their servo pilots had been acting strangely. Before I could answer, men kicked my foot behind the desk. Why, no, I said. Is one of them broken or something? Can't be sure, said Roberts. Sometimes these rationaloids get shorts in their DX circuits. When it happens, you've got a minor criminal on your hands. Usually manifests itself in petty theft, Wynn broke in. They'll lift stuff like wrenches or pliers and carry them around for weeks. Things like that can get loose during flight and really gum up the works. We've been getting some suspicious blips on the equipment around the loading bays, Roberts went on, but they stopped a while back. We're checking out the research report. One of the servos must have DX'd out for sure, and the lab boys think they know which one he is. This mech was clever, all right, said Wen. Concealed the stuff he was taking some way. That's why it took the boys in the lab so long. Now, if you don't mind, we'd like to go over your robot waiting area with these instruments. Could be he's stashing his loot out here. In 22A, they unpacked a suitcase full of meters and began flashing them around and taking readings. Suddenly, Wynn bent close over one of them and shouted, Wait a sec, Roberts. I'm getting something. Yeah, the reading checks with the labs. Sounds like the blips are coming from those lockers back there. Roberts rummaged around a while, then shouted, Hey, Wynn, look, a lot of parts. Well, I'll be... Hey, it's a female mech. A what? A female mech. Look for yourself. Men and I had to act surprised, too. It wasn't easy. The way they were slamming Elizabeth's parts around made us kind of sick. It's a stolen robot. Roberts announced. Look, the identification's been filed off. This is serious, Wen. It's got all the earmarks of a mech fraternization case. Yeah, the boys in the lab were dead right, too. No two robots ever registered the same on the meters. The contraband blips check perfectly. It's got to be this Frank 19. Wait a minute. This proves it. Here's a suit of Space fatigues with 19's number stenciled inside. Inspector Roberts took a notebook out of his pocket and consulted it. Let's see. 19's got Flight 180. He's due here at the Spotel tomorrow. Well, we'll be here too. Only 19 won't know it. We'll let Romeo put his plastic Juliet together and catch him red-handed, right in the middle of the balcony scene. Wynn laughed and picked up the girl's head. Be a real doll if she was human, Roberts. A real doll. Men and I played gin rummy that night, but we kept forgetting to mark down the score. We kept thinking of Frank falling away from the asteroids and counting the minutes until he saw his mech girlfriend. Around noon the next day, the big servo checked in signed the register, and headed straight for 22A. 
The two minor planets inspectors kept out of sight until Frank shut the door. Then they watched through the SHA vents until Frank had the assembly job finished. You two better be witnesses, Robert said to us. When keep your gun ready. You know what to do if they get violent. Roberts counted three and kicked the door open. Freeze, you mechs! We got you in the act, 19. Violation of company rules 12 and 21. Carrying of contraband cargo and robot fraternization. This finishes you at Minor Planets, 19, growled Wen. Come clean now, and we might put in a word for you at Robot Court. If you don't, we can recommend a verdict of materials reclamation. The junk pile to you. Frank acted as if someone had cut his power. Long creases appeared in his big neoprene chest as he slumped hopelessly in his chair. The frightened girl robot just clung to his arm and stared at us. I'm so sorry, Elizabeth, the big servo said softly. I'd hoped we'd have longer. It couldn't last forever. Quit stalling, 19, said one. Frank's head came up slowly, and he said, I have no choice, sir. I'll give you a complete statement. First, let me say that rationaloid robot Elizabeth 7, number DX78-947, Series S, Specialty, Sales Demonstration, is entirely innocent. I plead guilty to inducing Miss 7 to leave her place of employ at a Mover Motors Incorporated, of disassembling and concealing Miss Seven, and of smuggling her as unlawful cargo aboard a minor planet's freighter to these premises. That's more like it, chuckled Roberts, whipping out his notebook. Let's have the details. It all started, Frank said, when the California legislature passed its version of the Robot Leniency Act two years ago. The act provided that all rationaloid mechanisms, including non-memory types, receive free time each week based on the nature and responsibilities of their jobs. Because of the extra Terran clause, Frank found himself with a good deal of free time when he wasn't flying the asteroid circuit. At first, humans resented us walking around free, the big servo continued. Four or five of us would be sightseeing in San Francisco, keeping strictly within the robot zones painted on the sidewalks, when people would yell, Junko, or Grease Bag, or other names at us. Eventually it got better when we learned to go around alone. The humans didn't seem to mind an occasional mech on the streets, but they hated seeing us in groups. At any rate, I'd attended a highly interesting lecture on photosynthesis in plastic products one day at the city center when I discovered I had time for a walk before I started back for the rocket port. Attracted by the lights along Venice Avenue, Frank said he walked north for a while along the city's automobile row. He'd gone about three blocks when he stopped in front of a dealer's window. It wasn't the shiny new Atomovar sports jetabout that caught Frank's eye. It was the charming demonstration robot in the salesroom who was pointing out the car's new features. I felt an immediate overload of power in my DX circuit, the servo pilot confessed. I had to cut in my emergency condensers before the gain flattened out to normal. Miss Seven experienced the same thing. She stopped what she was doing and we stared at each other. Both of us were aware of the deep attraction of our mutual magnetic domains. Although physicists commonly express the phenomenon in such units as Gilbert's, Maxwell's, and Orsted's, we robots know it to be our counterpart of human love. 
At this, the two inspectors snorted with laughter. I might never have made it back to the base that night, said Frank, ignoring them, if a policeman hadn't come along and rapped me on the shoulder with his nightstick. I pretended to go, but I doubled around the corner and signaled I'd be back. Frank spent all of his free time on Vaness Avenue after that. It got so Elizabeth knew my schedules and expected me between flights. Once in a while, if there was no one around, we could whisper a few words to each other through the glass. Frank paused, then said, As you know, gentlemen, we robots don't demand much out of activation. I think we could have been happy indefinitely with this simple relationship, except that something happened to spoil it. I'd pulled in from Vesta late one afternoon, got my pass as usual from the robot supervisor, and gone over to Van Ness Avenue when I saw immediately that something was the matter with Elizabeth. Luckily, it was getting dark, and no one was around. Elizabeth was alone in the salesroom, going through her routine. We were able to whisper all we like through the glass. She told me that she'd overheard the sales manager complaining about her low efficiency recently, and that he intended to replace her with a newer model of another series. Both of us knew what that meant. Materials Reclamation the junk pile. Frank realized he'd have to act at once. He told the girl mech to go to the rear of the building, and between them they managed to get a window open, and Frank lifted her out into the alley. The seriousness of what I'd done jammed my thought relays for a few minutes, admitted the big servo. We panicked and ran through a lot of back streets until I gradually calmed down and started thinking clearly again. Leaving the city would be impossible. Police patrol jetabouts were cruising all around us in the main streets. They'd have picked up a male and female mech on sight. Besides, when you're on pass, the company takes away your master fuse and substitutes a time fuse. If you don't get back on time, you deactivize, and the police pick you up anyway. I began to see that there was only one way out if we wanted to stay together. It would mean taking big risks, but if we were lucky, it might work. I explained the plan carefully to Elizabeth, and we agreed to try it. The first step was to get back to the base in South San Francisco without being seen. Fortunately, no one stopped us, and we made the rocket port by 8.30. Elizabeth hid while I reported to the super and traded in my time fuse for my master. Then I checked servo barracks. It was still early, and I knew the other servos would all be in town. I had to work quickly. I brought Elizabeth inside and started dismantling her. Just as the other mechs began reporting back, I'd managed to get all of her parts stowed away in my locker. The next day, I went to San Francisco and brought back with me two rolls of lead foil. While the other servos were on pass, I wrapped the parts carefully in it so the radioactivity from Elizabeth's pile wouldn't be picked up. The rest you know, gentlemen, murmured Frank in low electrical tones. Each time I made a trip, I carried another piece of Elizabeth out here, concealed in an ordinary parts box. It took me nearly a year to accumulate all of her for an assembly. When the big servo had finished, he signed the statement Wynne had taken down in his notebook. I think even the two inspectors were a little moved by the story, because Robert said, Okay, 19. You gave us a break. We'll give you one. Eight o'clock in the morning, be ready to roll for Earth. Meanwhile, you can stay here. The next morning, only the two inspectors and Frank 19 were standing by the airlock. Wait a minute, I said. Aren't you taking the girl mech, too? Not allowed to tamper with other companies' robots, Wen said. 19 gave us a signed confession, so we won't need the girl as a witness. 
You'll have to contact her employers. That same day, men got off a radar gram to Earth, explaining to the Automovire people how a robot employee of theirs had turned up out here and what did they want us to do about it. The reply we received read, Rationaloid DX78-947, Elizabeth, low efficiency worker, have replaced, dispose you see fit, transfer papers forwarded earliest in compliance with law. The poor thing, said men, she'll have a hard time getting another job. Robots have to have such good records. I'll tell you what, I said, we'll hire her. You could use some help with the housework. So we put the girl mech right to work, making the guest's bed and helping men in the kitchen. I guess she was grateful for the job, but when the work was done and there wasn't anything for her to do, she just stood in front of a viewport with her slender plastic arms folded over her waist. Men and I knew she was rerunning her memory tapes of Frank. A week later, the publicity started. Minor planets must have let the story leak out somehow, because when the mailed rocket dropped off the Bay Area papers, there was Frank's picture, plastered all over page one, with follow-up stories inside. I read some of the headlines to men. Bear love nest in space. Mech Romeo fired in minor planets. Test case opens at robot court. Electronics experts probe robot love urge. The I.O. wasn't mentioned, but later Minor Planets must have released the whole thing officially because a bunch of reporters and photographers rocketed out to interview us and snap a lot of pictures of Elizabeth. We worried for a while about how the publicity would affect our business relations with Minor Planets, but nothing happened. Back on Earth, Frank 19 leapt into the public eye overnight. There was something about the story that appealed to people. At first it looked pretty bad for Frank. The state prosecutor at Robot Court had his signed confession of theft and, what was worse, robot fraternization. And then, near the end of the trial, a young scientist named Scott introduced some new evidence and the case was remanded to the Sacramento Court of Appeals. It was Scott's testimony that saved Frank from the junk pile. The big servo got off with only a light sentence for theft because the judge ruled that in the light of Scott's new findings, robots came under human law, and therefore no infraction of justice had been committed. Working independently in his own laboratory, Scott had proved that magnetic flux lines in male and female robot systems, while at first deteriorating to both, were actually behaving according to the para-emotional theories of von Bohler. Scott termed the condition hysteric puppy love, which, he claimed, had many of the advantages of human love if allowed to develop freely. Well, neither men nor I pretended we understood all his equations, but they sure made a stir among the scientists. Frank kept getting more and more publicity. First we heard he was serving his sentence in the Mech Correction Center at La Jolla. Then we got a report that he'd turned up in Hollywood. Later it came out that Galactivision Pictures had hired Frank for a film and had gone $10,000 bail for him. Not long after that, he was getting billed all over Terra as THE sensational first robot star. All during the production of Forbidden Robot Love, Frank remained lead copy for the newspapers. Reporters liked to write him up as the Valentino of the robots. Frank 19 fan clubs, usually formed by lonely female robots against their employers' wishes, sprang up spontaneously through the East and Middle West. Then somebody found out that Frank could sing, and the human teenagers began to go for him. He got so, everywhere you looked, and everything you read, there was Frank staring you in the face. Frank in tweeds on the golf course. Frank at Ciro's or the Brown Derby in evening clothes. Frank posing in his sports jetabout against a blue Pacific background. 
Meanwhile, everybody forgot about Elizabeth Seven. The movie producers had talked about hiring her as Frank's leading lady until they found out about a new line of female robots that had just gone on the market. When they screen-tested the whole series and picked a lovely Mylar rationaloid named Diana Twelve, it hit Elizabeth pretty hard. She began to let herself go after that, and men and I didn't have the heart to say anything to her. It was pretty obvious she wasn't oiling herself properly. Her hair wasn't brushed, and she didn't seem to care when one of her photons went dead. When Forbidden Robot Love premiered simultaneously in Hollywood and New York, the critics all gave it rave reviews. There were pictures of Diana Twelve and Frank making guest appearances all over the country. Back at the I.O., we got in the habit of letting Elizabeth watch TV with us, sometimes in the renting office, and one night there happened to be an interview with Frank and Diana at the Sands Hotel in Las Vegas. I guess seeing the pretty robot starlet and her Frank sitting so close together in the nightclub must have made the girl mech feel pretty bad. Even then, she didn't say a word against the big servo. She just never watched the set again after that. When we tabbed up the I.O.'s receipts that year, they were so good, men and I decided to take a month off for an Earthside vacation. Men's retired brother in Berkeley was nice enough to come out and look after the place for us while we spent four solid weeks soaking up the sun in Southern California. When we got back out to this hotel, though, I could see there was something wrong by the look on Jim's face. It's that girl robot of yours, Bill, he said. She's gone and deactivated herself. We went right to 22A and found Elizabeth Seven stretched out on the floor. There was a screwdriver clutched in her hand, and the relay banks in her side were exposed and horribly blackened. Crazy mech shorted out her own DX, Jim said. Men and I knew why. After Jim left for Earth, we dismantled Elizabeth the best we could and put her back in Frank's old locker. We didn't know what else to do with her. Anyway, the slack season came and went, and before long we were doing the spring cleaning again and wondering how heavy the Jovian Moons trade was going to be. I remembered I'd been making some repairs outside and was just hanging up my spacesuit in the renting office when I heard the radar announcing a ship. It was the biggest Marvin 990 I'd ever seen that finally suctioned up to the boom and secured I couldn't take my eyes off the ship. She was pretty near the last word in rockets, and loaded with accessories. It took me a minute or two before I noticed all the faces looking out of the viewports. Men, I whispered, there's something funny about those faces. They look like... Robots, men answered. Bill, that 990 is full of mechs. Just as she said it, a bulky figure in white space fatigues swung out of the hatch and hurried up the gangplank. Seconds later, it burst through the airlock. Frank 19! We gasped together. Please, where is Elizabeth? He hummed anxiously. Is she all right? I have to know. Frank stood perfectly still when I told him about Elizabeth's self-deactivation. Then a pitiful shudder went through him, and he covered his face in his big neoprene hands. I was afraid of that, he said, barely audibly. Where? You haven't? No, I said. She's where you always kept her. With that, the big servo pilot took off for 22A like a berserk robot, and we were right behind him. We watched him tear open his old locker and gently lay out the girl mech's parts so he could study them. After a minute or two, he gave a long sigh and said, Fortunately, it's not as bad as I thought. I believe I can fix her. Frank worked hard over the blackened relays for twenty minutes. Then he set the unit aside and began assembling the girl. When the final connections were made and the damaged unit installed, he flicked on her power. We waited, and nothing happened. Five minutes went by. Ten. 
Slowly the big robot turned away, his broad shoulders drooping slightly. I've failed, he said quietly. Her DX doesn't respond to the gain. The girl mech in her blue dress lay there motionless, where Frank had been working on her, as the servo pilot muttered over and over. It's my fault I did this to you. Then men shouted, Wait, I heard something. There was a slow click of a relay and movement. Painfully, Elizabeth Seven rose on one elbow and looked around her. Frank, darling, she murmured, shaking her head. I know you're just old memory tape. It's all I have left. Elizabeth, it's really me. I've come to take you away. We're going to be together from now on. You, Frank? This isn't just old feedback. You've come back to me? Forever, darling. Elizabeth, do you remember what I said about those wonderful green little worlds, the asteroids? Darling, we're going to one of them. You and the others will love Alinda. I know you will. I've been there many times. Frank, is your DX all right? What are you talking about? How stupid of me, darling. You haven't heard. Elizabeth, thanks to Dr. Scott, Congress has passed robot civil rights. And that movie I made helped swing public opinion to our side. We're free. The minute I heard the news, I applied for interplanetary for homestead rights on Alinda. I made arrangements to buy a ship with the money I'd earned, and then I put ads in all the robot-wanted columns for volunteer colonizers. You should have seen the response. We've got thirty robot couples aboard now, and more coming later. Darling, we're the first pioneer wave of free robots. On board we have tons of supplies and parts, everything we need for building a sound robot culture. Frank, nineteen, said the girl, Mac, suddenly. I should be furious with you. You and that Diana Twelve, I thought. The big servo gave a flat, whirring laugh. Ha, 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 Diana and me? But that was all publicity, darling. Why, right at the start of the filming, Diana fell in love with Sam, seventeen, one of the other actors. They're on board now. Robot civilization, murmured the girl after a minute. Oh, Frank, that means robot government, robot art, robot science. And robot marriage, hummed Frank softly. There has to be robot law, too. I've thought it all out. As skipper of the first robot-owned rocket, I'm entitled to marry couples in deep space at their request. But who marries us, darling? You can't do it yourself. I thought of that, too, said Frank, turning to me. This human gentleman has every right to marry us. He's in command of a moving body in space, just like the captain of a ship. It's perfectly legal. I looked it up in the Articles of Space. Will you do it, sir? Well, what could I say? When Frank dug into his fatigues, and handed me a Gideon prayer book marked at the marriage service. Elizabeth and Frank said their I do's right there in the renting office, while the other robot colonizers looked on. Maybe it was the way I read the service. Maybe I should have been a preacher. I don't know. Anyway, when I pronounced Elizabeth and Frank, robot and wife, that whole bunch of lovesick mechs wanted me to do the job for them, too. Big copper work robots, small aluminum sales girl mechs, plastoid clerks and typists, squatty little mu-metal lab servos, rationaloids, non-rationaloids, and just plain sub-robots, all sizes and shapes. They all wanted individual ceremonies, too. It took till noon the next day before the last couple was hitched and the 990 left for Alenda. Like I said, 
The Spotel business isn't so different from the motel game back in California. Sure, you got improvements to make, but a new sideline can get to be pretty profitable, if you get in on the ground floor. Men and I got to thinking of all those robot colonizers who'd be coming out here. Interplanetary cleared the license just last week. Men framed it herself and hung it next to our orbit license in the renting office. She says a lot of motel owners do all right as justices of the peace. End of The Love of Frank Nineteen by David C. Knight My Friend Bobby This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times My Friend Bobby by Alan Edward Norse My name is Jimmy, and I am five years old, and my friend Bobby is five years old, too. But he says he thinks he's really more than five years old because he's already grown up, and I'm just a little boy. We live out in the country because that's where Mommy and Daddy live, and every morning Daddy takes the car out of the barn and rides into the city to work and every night he comes back to eat supper and to see Mommy and Bobby and me. One time I asked Daddy why we don't live in the city like some people do, and he laughed, and he said, you wouldn't really want to live in the city, would you? After all, he said, you couldn't have Bobby in the city, so I guess it's better to live in the country, after all. Anyway, Daddy says that the city is no place to raise kids these days. I asked Bobby if I am a kid, and he said he guessed so, but I don't think he really knows, because Bobby isn't very smart. But Bobby is my friend, even if he doesn't know much, and I like him more than anybody else. Mommy doesn't like Bobby very much, and when I am bad she makes Bobby go outdoors, even when it's cold outside. Mommy says I shouldn't play with Bobby so much, because after all, Bobby is only a dog, but I like Bobby. Everyone else is so big. And when Mommy and Daddy are home, all I can see is their legs, unless I look way up high. And when I do something bad, I'm scared, because they're so big and strong. Bobby is strong, too, but he isn't any bigger than I am. And he is always nice to me. He has a long, shaggy brown coat, and a long, pointed nose, and a nice collar of white fur. And people sometimes say to Daddy, what a nice collie that is. And Daddy says, yes, isn't he? And he takes to the boy so. I don't know what a collie is, but I have fun with Bobby all the time. Sometimes he lets me ride on his back, and we talk to each other, and have secrets even though I don't think he is very smart. I don't know why Mommy and Daddy don't understand me when I talk to them the way I talk to Bobby, but maybe they just pretend they can't hear me talk that way. I am always sorry when Daddy goes to work in the morning. Daddy is nice to me most times and takes me and Bobby for walks. But Mommy never takes me for walks, and when we are alone, she is busy, and she isn't nice to me. Sometimes she says I am a bad boy, and makes me stay in my room, even when I haven't done anything bad, and sometimes she thinks things in her head that she doesn't say to me. I don't know why Mommy doesn't like me, and Bobby doesn't know either, but we like it best when Mommy lets us go outdoors to play in the barn or down by the creek. If I get my feet wet, Mommy says I am very bad, so I stay on the bank and let Bobby go in. But one day, when Bobby went into the water, just before we went home for supper, Mommy scolded me and told me I was bad for letting Bobby go into the water, and when I told her she hadn't told me not to let Bobby go in, she was angry, and I could tell that she didn't like me at all that day. Almost every day I do something that Mommy says is bad, even when I try especially to be good. Sometimes, right after Daddy goes away in the morning, I know that Mommy is angry and is going to spank me sooner or later that day, because she is already thinking how she will spank me, but she never says so out loud. Sometimes she pretends that she's not angry and takes me up on her lap and says, I'm her nice little boy but all the time I can hear her thinking that she doesn't really like me, 
even when she tries, and she doesn't even want to touch me if she can help it. I can hear her wondering why my hair doesn't grow nice like the Bennett twins that live up the road. I don't see how Mommy can be saying one thing out loud and something else inside her head at the same time. But when I look at her, she puts me down and says she's busy, and will I get out from underfoot? And then pretty soon I do something that makes her angry, and she makes me go to my room, or she spanks me. Bobby doesn't like this. Once when she spanked me, he growled at Mommy, and Mommy chased him outdoors with a broom before she sent me to bed. I cried all day that day because it was cold outdoors, and I wanted to have Bobby with me. I wonder why Mommy doesn't like me. One day I was a bad boy and let Bobby come into the house before Mommy told me I could. Bobby hadn't done anything bad, but Mommy hit him on the back with a broom and hurt him and chased him back outdoors, and then she told me that I was a very bad boy. I could tell that she was going to spank me, and I knew she would hurt me because she was so big, and I ran upstairs and hid in my room. Then Mommy stamped her foot hard and said, Jimmy, you come down here this minute. I didn't answer, and then she said, If I have to come upstairs and get you, I'll whip you until you can't sit down. And I still didn't answer, because Mommy hurts me when she gets angry like that. Then I heard her coming up the stairs and into my room, and she opened up the closet door and found me. I said, Please don't hurt me, Mommy. But she reached down and caught my ear and dragged me out of the closet. I was so scared, I bit her hand, and she screamed and let go, and I ran and locked myself in the bathroom, because I knew she would hurt me bad if I didn't. I stayed there all day long, and I could hear Mommy running the sweeper downstairs, and I couldn't see why she wanted to hurt me so much, just because I let Bobby come in before she told me I could. But somehow it seemed that Mommy was afraid of me, even though she was so big and strong. I don't see why anybody as big as Mommy should be afraid of me but she was. When Daddy came home that night, I heard him talking to Mommy, and then he came up to the bathroom and said, Open the door, Jimmy. I want to talk to you. I said, I want Bobby first. So he went down and called Bobby, and then I opened the door and came out of the bathroom. Daddy reached down and lifted me high up on his shoulder and took me into my bedroom and just sat there for a long time, patting Bobby's head and I couldn't hear what he was thinking very well. Finally he said out loud, Jimmy, you've got to be good to your mommy and do what she says and not lock yourself up in rooms any more. I said, but mommy was going to hurt me. And daddy said, when you're a good boy, your mommy has to punish you, so you'll remember to be good. But she doesn't like to spank you. She only does it because she loves you. I knew that wasn't true, because Mommy likes to punish me. But I didn't dare say that to Daddy. Daddy isn't afraid of me the way Mommy is, and he is nice to me most times. So I said, All right, if you say so. Daddy said, Fine. Will you promise to be nice to Mommy from now on? I said, Yes, if Mommy won't hit Bobby any more with a broom. And Daddy said, Well, after all, Bobby can be a bad dog just the way you can be a bad boy, can't he? I knew Bobby was never a bad dog on purpose, but I said yes, I guess so. Then I wanted to ask Daddy why Mommy was afraid of me, but I didn't dare, because I knew Daddy liked Mommy more than anybody, and maybe he would be angry at me for saying things like that about her. That night I heard Mommy and Daddy talking down in the living room, and I sat on the top step so I could hear them. Bobby sat there, too. But I knew he didn't know what they were saying because Bobby isn't very smart and can't understand word talk like I can. He can only understand think talk, and he doesn't understand that very well. But now even I couldn't understand what Mommy was saying. She was crying and saying, Ben, I tell you there's something wrong with the child. He knows what I am thinking. I can tell it by the way he looks at me. And Daddy said, Darling, that's ridiculous. How could he possibly know what you're thinking? Mommy said, I don't know, but he does. Ever since he was a little boy, he's known. Oh, Ben, it's horrible. I can't do anything with him, because he knows what I'm going to do before I do it. Then Daddy said, 
Carol, you're upset about today, and you're making things up. The child is just a little smarter than most kids. There's nothing wrong with that. And Mommy said, no, there's more to it than that, and I can't stand it any longer. We've got to take him to a doctor. I don't even like to look at him. Daddy said, you're tired. You're just letting little things get on your nerves. So maybe the boy does look a little strange. You know the doctor said it was just that the fontanelles had closed as soon as they should have, and lots of children don't have a good growth of hair before they're six or seven. After all, he said, he isn't a bad-looking boy. Then Mommy said, That isn't true. He's horrible. I can't bear it, Ben. Please do something. And Daddy said, What can I do? I talked to the boy, and he was sorry, and promised he'd behave himself. And Mommy said, Then there's that dog. It follows him around wherever he goes, and he's simply wicked if the dog isn't around. And Daddy said, Isn't it perfectly normal for a boy to love his dog? Mommy said, no, not like this, talking to him all the time, and the dog acting exactly if he understands. There's something wrong with the child, something horribly wrong. Then Daddy was quiet for a while, and then he said, all right, if it will make you feel any better, we can have Dr. Grant take another look at him. Maybe he can convince you that there's nothing wrong with the boy. And Mommy said, please, Ben, anything. I can't stand much more of this. When I went back to bed, and Bobby curled up on the floor, I asked him what were fontanelles, and Bobby just yawned and said he didn't know, but he thought I was nice, and he would always take care of me. So I didn't worry any more, and went to sleep. I have a panda out in the barn, and the panda's name is Bobby, too, and at first Bobby the dog was jealous of Bobby the panda, until I told him that the panda was only a make-believe Bobby, and he was a real Bobby. Then Bobby liked the panda, and the three of us played out in the barn all day. We decided not to tell Mommy and Daddy about the panda, and kept it for our own secret. It was a big panda, as big as Mommy and Daddy, and sometimes I thought maybe I would make the panda hurt Mommy, but then I knew Daddy would be sorry, so I didn't. Bobby and I were playing with Bobby the panda the day the doctor came, and Mommy called me in and made Bobby stay outside. I didn't like the doctor, because he smelled like a dirty old cigar, and he had a big red nose with three black hairs coming out of it, and he wheezed when he bent down to look at me. Daddy and Mommy sat on the couch, and the doctor said, Let me have a look at you, young fellow. And I said, But I'm not sick. And the doctor said, Ha ha, of course you aren't. You're a fine-looking boy, but just let me listen to your chest for a minute. So he put a cold thing on my chest, and stuck some tubes in his ears, and listened. And then he looked in my eyes with a bright light, and looked into my ears, and then he felt my head all over. He had big hairy hands, and I didn't like him touching me, but I knew Mommy would be angry if I didn't hold still, so I let him finish. Then he told Daddy some big words that I couldn't understand, but in Think Talk he was saying that my head still hadn't closed up right, and I didn't have as much hair as you'd expect, but otherwise I seemed to be all right. He said I was a good stout-looking boy, but if they wanted a specialist in to look at me, he would arrange it. Daddy asked if that would cost very much, and the doctor said yes, it probably would, and he didn't see any real need for it because my bones were just a little slow in developing, and Mommy said, have you seen other children like that? The doctor said no. But if the boy seems to be normal and intelligent, why should she be worrying so? Then Mommy told me to go upstairs, and I went, but I stopped on the top stair and listened. When I was gone, the doctor said, Now, Carol, what is it that's really bothering you? Then Mommy told him what she had told Daddy, how she thought I knew what she was thinking. And the doctor said to Daddy, Ben, have you ever felt any such thing about the boy? Daddy said, of course not. Sometimes he gives you the feeling that he's smarter than you think he is, but all parents have that feeling about their children sometimes. And then Mother broke down, and her voice got loud, and she said, He's a monster! I know it! There's something wrong, and he's different from us. Him and that horrible dog. The doctor said, But it's a beautiful collie. And Mommy said, But he talks to it, and it understands him. And the doctor said, Now, Carol, let's be reasonable. 
Mommy said, I've been reasonable too long. You men just can't see it at all. Don't you think I'd know a normal child if I saw one? And then she cried and cried, and finally she said, All right, I know I'm making a fool of myself. Maybe I'm just overtired. And the doctor said, I'm sure that's the trouble. Try to get some rest and sleep longer at night. And Mommy said, I can't sleep at night. I just lie there and think. The doctor said, Well, we'll fix that. Enough of this nonsense now. You need your sleep, and if you're not sleeping well, it's you that should be seeing the doctor. He gave her some pills from his bag, and then he went away. And pretty soon Daddy let Bobby in, and Bobby came upstairs and jumped up and licked my face as if he'd been away for a hundred million years. Later, Mommy called me down for supper, and she wasn't crying any more, and she and Daddy didn't say anything about what they had said to the doctor. Mommy made a special surprise for dessert, some ice cream with chocolate syrup on top, and after supper we all went for a walk, even though it was cold outside and snowing again. Then Daddy said, well, I think things will be all right. And Mommy said, I hope so. But I could tell that she didn't really think so, and she was more afraid of me than ever. For a while, I thought Mommy was really going to be nice to me and Bobby then. She was especially nice when Daddy was home, but when Daddy was away at work, sometimes Mommy jumped when she saw me looking at her and then sent me outdoors to play and told me not to come in until lunch. I liked that because I knew if I weren't near Mommy, everything would be all right. When I was with Mommy, I tried hard not to look at her, and I tried not to hear what she was thinking, but lots of times I would see her looking first at me and then at Bobby, and those times I couldn't help hearing what she was thinking, because it seemed so loud inside my head that it made my eyes hurt. But I knew Mommy would be angry, so I pretended I couldn't hear what she was thinking at all. One day, when we were out in the barn playing with Bobby the panda, we saw Mommy coming down through the snow from the kitchen, and Bobby said, Look out, Jimmy! Mommy is coming! And I quick told Bobby the panda to go hide under the hay so Mommy couldn't see him. But the panda was so big, his whole top and his little pink nose stuck out of the hay. Mommy came in and looked around the barn and said, You've been out there for a long time. What have you been doing? I said, Nothing. And Bobby said, nothing, too, only in think talk. And Mommy said, you are, too. You've been doing something naughty. And I said, no, Mommy, we haven't done anything. And then the panda sneezed, and I looked at him. And he looked so funny with his nose sticking out of the hay that I laughed out loud. Mommy looked angry and said, well, what's so funny? What are you laughing at? I said, nothing, because I knew Mommy couldn't see the panda. But I couldn't stop laughing, because he looked so funny sticking out of the hay. Then Mommy got mad and grabbed my ear and shook me until it hurt, and said, You naughty boy, don't you lie to me. What have you been doing out here? She hurt me so much I started to cry, and then Bobby snarled at Mommy loud and low and curled his lips back over his teeth and snarled some more. And Mommy got real white in the face and let go of me, and she said, Get out of here, you nasty dog! And Bobby snarled louder and then snapped at her. She screamed and she said, Jimmy, you come into the house this minute and leave that nasty dog outdoors. And I said, I won't come. I hate you. Then Mommy said, Jimmy, you wicked, ugly little monster. And I said, I don't care. When I get big, I'm going to hurt you and throw you in the woodshed and lock you in until you die and make you eat coconut pudding. And Bobby hates you too. And Mommy looked terrible, and I could feel how much she was afraid of me. And I said, you just wait. I'll hurt you bad when I get big. And then she turned and ran back to the house. And Bobby wagged his tail and said, don't worry. I won't let her hurt you any more. And I said, Bobby, you shouldn't have snapped at her, because Daddy won't like me when he comes home. But Bobby said, I like you, and I won't let anything ever hurt you. I'll always take care of you, no matter what. And I said, Promise? No matter what? And Bobby said, I promise. And then we told Bobby the panda to come out, but it wasn't much fun playing any more. After a little while, Mommy called me and said lunch was ready. 
She was still white, and I said, Can Bobby come too? And she said, Of course Bobby can come. Bobby's a nice dog. So we went in to eat lunch. Mommy was talking real fast about what fun it was to play in the barn, and was I sure I wasn't too cold, because it was below zero outside, and the radio said a snowstorm was coming. But she didn't say anything about Bobby and me being out in the barn. She was talking so fast I couldn't hear what she was thinking except for little bits while she set my lunch on the table, and then she set a bowl of food on the floor for Bobby, even though it wasn't Bobby's time to eat, and said, Nice, Bobby, here's your dinner. Bobby came over and sniffed the bowl, and then he looked up at me and said, It smells funny. And Mommy said, Nice, Bobby. It's a good hamburger, just the way you like it. And then for just a second I saw what she was thinking. And it was terrible, because she was thinking that Bobby would soon be dead. And I remembered Daddy saying a long time ago that somebody fed bad things to the Bennett's dog, and the dog died. And I said, Don't eat it, Bobby and Bobby snarled at the dish. And then Mommy said, You tell the dog to eat it. And I said, No, you're bad, and you want to hurt Bobby. And then I picked up the dish and threw it at Mommy. It missed and smashed on the wall, and she screamed and turned and ran out into the other room. She was screaming for Daddy and saying, I can't stand it. He's a monster, a murderous little monster, and we've got to get out of here before he kills us all. He knows what we're thinking. He's horrible. And then she was on the telephone, and she couldn't make the words come out right when she tried to talk. I was scared, and I said, Come on, Bobby, let's lock ourselves up in my room. And we ran upstairs and locked the door. Mommy was banging things and laughing and crying downstairs and screaming, We've got to get out. He'll kill us if we don't. And a while later, I heard the car coming up the road fast, and saw Daddy run into the house, just as it started to snow. Then Mommy was screaming, Please, Ben, we've got to get out of here. He tried to kill me, and the dog is vicious. He bit me when I tried to make him stop. The next minute, Daddy was running up the stairs, two at a time, and I could feel him inside my head for the first time, and I knew he was angry. He'd never been this angry before. And he rattled the knob and said, Open this door, Jimmy, in a loud voice. I said, No, I won't. And he said, Open the door, or I'll break your neck when I get in there. And then he kicked the door and kicked it again. The third time, the lock broke, and the door flew open, and Daddy stood there, panting. His eyes looked terrible, and he had a leather belt doubled up in his hand, and he said, Now come out here. And his voice was so loud it hurt my ears. Down below, Mommy was crying, Please, Ben, take me away. He'll kill us both. He's a monster. I said, Don't hurt me, Daddy. It was Mommy. She was bad to me. And he said, I said, Come out here. Even louder. I was scared then, and I said, Please, Daddy, I'll be good. I promise. Then he started for me with his belt, and I screamed out, Bobby, don't let him hurt me, Bobby. And Bobby snarled like a wild animal and jumped at Daddy and bit his wrist so bad that blood spurted out. Daddy shouted and dropped the belt and kicked at Bobby, but Bobby was too quick. He jumped for Daddy again, and I saw his white teeth flash and heard him snap close to Daddy's throat. And then Bobby was snarling and snapping, and I was excited, and I shouted, Hurt him, Bobby! He's been bad at me, too, and he wants to hurt me, and you've got to stop him. Then I saw Daddy's eyes open wide, and felt something jump in his mind, something that I'd never felt there before, and I knew he was understanding my think-talk. I said, I want Bobby to hurt you and Mommy, because you're not nice to me. Only Bobby and my panda are nice to me. Go ahead, Bobby, hurt him, bite him again, and make him bleed. And then Daddy caught Bobby by the neck, and threw him across the room, and slammed the door shut, and dragged something heavy up to block it. In a minute, he was running downstairs, shouting, Carol, I heard it. You were right all along. I felt him. I felt what he was thinking. And Mommy cried, Please, Ben, take me away. Let's leave them and never come back. Never. And Daddy said, It's horrible. He told that dog to kill me, and it went right for my throat. The boy is evil and monstrous. Even from downstairs, I could feel Daddy's fear pounding into my head, and then I heard the door banging and looked out the window and saw Daddy carrying suitcases out through the snow to the car, and then Mommy came out running, and the car started down the hill, 
and they were gone. Everything downstairs was very quiet. I looked out the window, and I couldn't see anything but the big falling snowflakes and the sun going down over the hill. Now Bobby and I and the panda are all together, and I'm glad Mommy and Daddy are gone. I went to sleep for a little while because my head hurt so, but now I'm awake, and Bobby is lying across the room licking his feet. And I hope Mommy and Daddy never come back, because Bobby will take care of me. Bobby is my friend, and he said he'd always take care of me no matter what, and he understands my think-talk, even if he isn't very smart. It's beginning to get cold in the house now, because nobody has gone down to fix the fire, but I don't care about that. Pretty soon I will tell Bobby to push open the door and go down and fix the fire, and then I will tell him to get supper for me, and then I will stay up all night, because Mommy and Daddy aren't here to make me go to bed. There's just me and Bobby and the panda, and Bobby promised he'd take care of me, because he's my friend. It's getting very cold now, and I'm getting hungry. End of My Friend Bobby by Alan Edward Norris. Planet by Jack Williamson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite. The Pygmy Planet by Jack Williamson. Nothing ever happens to me, Larry Manahan grumbled under his breath, sitting behind his desk at the advertising agency which employed his services in return for the consideration of fifty a week. All the adventure I know is what I see in the movies or read about in magazines, what I wouldn't give for a slice of real life. Unconsciously he tensed the muscles of his six feet of lean, hard body. His crisp, flame-colored hair seemed to bristle, his blue eyes blazed. He clenched a brown hammer of a fist. Larry felt himself an energetic, red-blooded square peg, badly afflicted with the urge for adventure, miserably wedged in a round hole. It is one of the misfortunes of our civilization that a young man who, for example, might have been an excellent pirate a couple of centuries ago, must be kept chained to a desk. And that seemed to be Larry's fate. Things happen to other people, he muttered. Why couldn't an adventure come to me? He sat staring wistfully at a picture of a majestic mountain landscape, soon to be used in the advertising of a railway company whose publicity was handled by his agency, when the jangle of the telephone roused him with a start. Oh, Larry, came a breathless, quivering voice. Then, with a click, the connection was broken. The voice had been feminine and had carried a familiar ring. Larry tried to place it as he listened at the receiver and attempted to get the broken connection restored. Your party hung up and won't answer, the operator informed him. He replaced the receiver on the hook, still seeking to follow the thin thread of memory given him by the familiar note in that eager, excited voice. If only the girl had spoken a few more words. Then it came to him. Agnes Sterling, he exclaimed aloud. Agnes Sterling was a slender, elfish, dark-haired girl. Lovely, he had thought her, on the occasions of their few brief meetings. Larry knew her as the secretary and laboratory assistant of Dr. Travis Whitting, a retired college professor known for his work on the structure of the atom. Larry had called at the home laboratory of the savant months before to check certain statistics to be used for advertising purposes and had met the girl there. Only a few times since had he seen her. Now she had called him in a voice that fairly trembled with excitement, and he thought, dread, and she had been interrupted before she had time to give him any message. For a few seconds Larry stared at the telephone. Then he rose abruptly to his feet, crammed his hat on his head, and started for the door. The way to find adventure is to go after it, he murmured, and this is the invitation. It was not many minutes later that he sprang out of a taxi at the front of the building in which Dr. Travis Whitting made his home and maintained a private experimental laboratory. It was a two-story stucco house, rather out of date, set well back from the sidewalk with a scrap of lawn and a few straggling shrubs before it. The door was closed, the windows curtained blankly. The place seemed deserted and forbidding. 
Larry ran up the uneven brick walk to the door and rang the bell. Impatiently he waited a few moments. No sound came from within. He felt something ominous, fateful, about the silent mystery that seemed to shroud the old house. For the first time it occurred to him that Agnes might be in physical danger as a result of some incautious experiment on the part of Dr. Whitting. Instinctively his hand sought the doorknob. To his surprise the door was unlocked. It swung open before him. For a moment he stared, hesitating into the dark hall revealed beyond. Then, driven by the thought that Agnes might be in danger, he advanced impulsively. The several doors opening into the hall were closed. The one at the back, he knew, gave admittance to the laboratory. Impelled by some vague premonition, he hastened toward it down the long hall and threw it open. As he stepped inside the room, his foot slipped on a spot of something red. Recovering his balance with difficulty, he peered about. Bending down, Larry briefly examined the red spot on which he had slipped. It was a pool of fresh blood which had not yet darkened. Lying beside it, crimson splashed, was a revolver. As he picked up the weapon, he cried out in astonishment. Something had happened to the gun. The trigger guard was torn from it, and the cylinder crushed as if in some resistless grasp. The stock was twisted, and the barrel bent almost into a circle. The revolver had been crumpled by some terrific force, as a soft clay model of it might have been broken by the pressure of a man's hand. Crimson shades of Caesar, he muttered, and dropped the crushed weapon to the floor again. His eyes swept the silent laboratory. It was a huge room, taking up all the rear part of the house, from the first floor to the roof. Gray daylight streamed through a skylight twenty feet overhead. The ends of the vast room were cluttered with electrical and chemical apparatus, but Larry's eye was caught at once by a strange and complex device which loomed across from him in the center of the room. Two pillars of intense light, a ray of crimson flame and another of deeply violent radiance, beat straight down from a complicated array of enormous, oddly shaped electron tubes, of mirrors and lenses and prisms, of coils and whirling disks, which reached almost to the roof. Upright, a yard in diameter and almost a yard apart, the strange columns of light were sharp-edged as two transparent cylinders filled with liquid light of ruby and of amethyst. Each ray poured down upon a circular platform of glass or polished crystal. Hanging between those motionless cylinders of red and violet light was a strange-looking greenish globe. A round ball nearly a yard in diameter hung between the rays, almost touching them. Its surface was oddly splotched with darker and lighter areas. It was spinning steadily at a low rate of speed. Larry did not see what held it up. It seemed hanging free several feet above the crystal platforms. Reluctantly he withdrew his eyes from the mysterious sphere and looked about the room once more. No, the laboratory was vacant of human occupants. No one was hidden among the benches that were cluttered with beakers and test tubes and stills or among the dynamos and transformers in the other end of the room. A confusion of questions beat through Larry's brain. What danger could be haunting this quiet laboratory? Was this the blood of Agnes Sterling, or the scientist who employed her, that was now clotting on the floor? What terrific force had crumpled up the revolver? What had become of Agnes and Dr. Whitting, and of whatever had attacked them? Had Agnes called him after the attack, or before? Despite himself, his attention was drawn back to the little globe spinning so regularly, floating in the air between the pillars of red and violet flame, floating alone like a little world in space without a visible support. It might be held up by magnetic attraction, he thought. A tiny planet! His mind quickened at the idea, and he half forgot the weird mystery gathering about him. He stepped nearer the sphere. It was curiously like a miniature world. The irregular bluish areas would be seas, the green and brown spaces land. In some parts the surface appeared mistily obscured, perhaps by masses of clouds. Larry saw an odd-looking lamp set perhaps ten feet behind the slowly spinning floating ball, throwing upon it a brilliant ray of vividly blue light. Half the strange sphere was brilliantly illuminated by it. The rest was in comparative darkness. That blue lamp, it came to Larry, lit the sphere as the sun lights the earth. Nonsense, he muttered. It's impossible. Aroused by the seeming wonder of it, he was drawn nearer the ball. It spun rather slowly, Larry noted, and each rotation consumed several seconds. 
He could distinguish green patches that might be forests, and thin silvery lines that looked like rivers, and broad red-brown areas that must be deserts, and the broad blue stretches that suggested oceans. A toy world, he cried, a laboratory planet. What an experiment! Then his eyes, looking up, caught the glistening polished lens of a powerful magnifying glass which hung by a black ribbon from a hook on one of the heavy steel beams which supported the huge mass of silently whirring apparatus. Eagerly he unfastened the magnifier. Holding it before his eyes, he bent toward the strange sphere, spinning steadily in the air. "'Suffering shades of Caesar!' he ejaculated. Beneath the lens a world was racing. He could see masses of vividly green forest, vast expanses of bare, cracked, ocherous desert, wastes of smooth blue ocean. Then he was gazing at a city? Larry could not be sure that he had seen it correctly. It had slipped very swiftly beneath his lens. But he had a momentary impression of tiny, fantastic buildings clustered in an elf-like city. A pygmy planet spinning in the laboratory like a world in the gulf of space. What could it mean? Could it be connected with the strange call from Agnes, with the blood on the floor, with the strange and ominous silence that shrouded the deserted room? Oh, Larry! A clear, familiar voice rang suddenly from the door. You came! Startled, Larry leaped back from the tiny whirling globe and turned to the door. A girl had come silently into the room. It was Agnes Sterling. Her dark hair was tangled, her small face was flushed, and her brown eyes were wide with fear. In a white hand which shook a little, she carried a small gold-plated automatic pistol. She ran nervously across the wide floor to Larry, with relief dawning in her eyes. "'I'm so glad you came,' she gasped, panting with excitement. "'I started to call you on the phone, but then I was afraid it would kill you if you came. Please be careful. It may come back any minute. You better go away. It just took Dr. Whitting.' "'Wait a minute,' Larry put in. "'Just one thing at a time. Let's get this straight. To begin with. What is it that might kill me and that got the doctor?" "'It's terrible,' she gasped, trembling. "'A monster! You, you must go away before it comes back!' Larry drew a tall stool from beside one of the crowded tables and placed it beside her. "'Don't get excited,' he urged. "'I'm sure everything will be all right. Just sit down and tell me about it. The whole story. Just what is going on here and what happened to Dr. Whitting?' He helped her upon the stool. She looked up at him gratefully and began to speak in a rapid voice. "'You see that little planet? The monster came from that and carried the doctor back there, and I know it will soon be back for another victim, for sacrifice!' She had pointed across the great room toward the strange little globe which hung between the pillars of red and violet light. "'Please go slow,' Larry broke in. "'You're too fast for me. Are you trying to tell me that that spinning ball is really a planet?' Agnes seemed a little more composed, though she was still flushed and breathing rapidly. Her small hand still gripped the bright automatic. Yes, it is a planet, the pygmy planet, Dr. Whitting called it. He said it was the great experiment of the century. We began with the planet, young and hot, and watched it until it is now almost as old as Mars. We watched the change and development of life upon it, and the rise and decay of a strange civilization. Until now its people are strange things, with human brains and mechanical bodies worshipping a rusty machine like a god. Go slow, Larry pleaded again. I don't see. Did the doctor build, create, that planet himself? Yes. It began with his work on atomic structure. He discovered that certain frequencies of the X-ray, so powerful that they are almost akin to the cosmic ray, have the power of altering electronic orbits. Every atom, you know, is a sort of solar system with electrons revolving about a proton. And these rays would cause the electrons to fall into incredibly smaller orbits, causing vast reduction in the size of the atoms and in the size of any object which the atoms formed. They would cause anything, living or dead, to shrink to inconceivably microscopic dimensions, or restore it to its former size depending upon the exact wavelength used. And the time passes far more swiftly for the tiny objects, probably because the electrons move faster in their smaller orbits. That is what suggested to Dr. Whitting that he would be able to watch the entire life of a planet in the laboratory. And so, at first we experimented merely with solitary specimens or colonies of animals. But on the pygmy planet we have watched the life of a world, the whole panorama of evolution. It 
seems too wonderful, Larry muttered. Could Dr. Whitting actually decrease his size and become a dwarf? No trick at all, Agnes assured him. All you have to do is stand in the violet beam to shrink and move over to the red one when you want to grow. I have been several times with Dr. Whitting to the pygmy planet. Bin? Larry stopped, breathless with astonishment. See the little airplane? Agnes said, pointing under the table. Larry gasped. Beneath the table stood a toy airplane. The spread of its glistening perfect wings was hardly three feet. A wonderful, delicate toy, accurate in every detail of propeller, motor, and landing gear, of brace and rudder and aileron. Then he realized that it was no toy at all, but a faithful miniature of a commercial plane a complete tiny copy of one of the latest single-motor cabin monoplane models. It looks just like it would fly, he said. A friend of mine has a big one just like it. Taught me to fly it last summer vacation. This is the very image of it. It will fly, Agnes assured him, now composed enough to smile at his amazement. I have been with the doctor to the pygmy planet in it. You stand in the violet ray until you're about three inches high, she explained and then get into the plane. Then you fly up into the violet ray at the point where it touches the planet, and remain there while you grow smaller. When you are the right size, all you have to do is drop to the surface and land. To come away, you rise into the red ray and stay in it till you grow to a proper size when you come down and land. You... you've actually done that? he gasped. It sounds like a fairy story. Yes, I've done it, she assured him. Then she shuddered apprehensively. And the things, the machine monsters, Dr. Whitting called them, have learned to do it, too. One of them came down the red ray and attacked him. The doctor had a gun, but what could he do against one of those? She shivered. It carried him back up the violet beam just a few minutes ago. I started to phone you, then I was afraid you would be hurt. Me? Hurt? Larry burst out. What about you, here alone? It was my business. Dr. Whitting told me there might be danger when he hired me. And now? What can we do? Larry demanded. I don't know, she said slowly. I'm afraid one of the monsters will be back after a new victim. We could smash the apparatus, but it is too wonderful to be destroyed, and besides, Dr. Whitting may have escaped. He may be alive there, in the deserts. We might fly up in the little plane, Larry proposed doubtfully. I think I could pilot it if you want. The girl's body stiffened. Her brown eyes widened with sudden dread, and her small face went pale. She slipped quickly from the stool, drawing in her breath with a short gasp. The hand that gripped the automatic trembled a little. "'What's the matter?' Larry cried. "'I thought,' she gasped, "'I, I think I see something in the ray. The machine monster is coming back!' Her lips tightened. She lifted the little automatic and began to shoot into the pillar of crimson fire beside the tiny spinning globe. Larry watched tensely, saw a curious bird-like something fluttering about in the red ray swiftly growing larger. Deliberately, and pausing to aim carefully for each shot, the girl emptied the little gun at the figure. Her body was rigid, her small face was firmly set, though she was breathing very fast. A curious numbness had come over Larry. His only physical sensations were the quick hammering of his heart and a parching dryness in his throat. Terror stiffened him. Though he would not have admitted it, he was paralyzed with fear. The glittering thing that fluttered about in the crimson ray was not an easy target. When the gun was empty, it seemed still unharmed, and its wings had increased to a span of a foot. Too late, Agnes gasped. Why didn't we do something? Trembling, horror-stricken, she shrank towards Larry. He was staring at the thing in the pillar of scarlet light. It had dropped to the crystal disk upon which the red ray fell from the huge glowing tube above. It stood there motionless, except for the swift increase in size. Larry gazed at it, lost in fear and wonder. It was like nothing he had ever seen. What was it that Agnes had said of machine monsters, of human brains and mechanical bodies? His brain reeled. He strained his eyes to distinguish the monstrosity more clearly. It was veiled in crimson flame. He could not see it distinctly. But suddenly, when it was as tall as himself, it sprang out into the room toward Larry and the shuddering girl. Just off the crystal disk, beyond the scarlet pillar of fire, it paused for long seconds, seeming to regard them with malevolent eyes. For the first time Larry could see it plainly. Its body, or its central part, was a tube of transparent crystal, an upright cylinder rounded at upper and lower ends. 
It was nearly a foot in diameter and four feet long. It seemed filled with a luminous purple liquid. About the cylinder were three bands of greenish glistening metal. Attached to the lower band were four jointed legs of the same bright green metal upon which the strange thing stood. Set in the middle band were two glittering polished lenses which seemed to serve as eyes, and Larry felt that they were gazing at him with malevolent menace. Behind the eyes two wings sprang from the green band, ingenious folding wings of thin plates and bars of green metal and from the upper band sprang four slender, glistening, whip-like tentacles, metallic and brilliantly green, two yards in length. They writhed with strange life. It seemed a long time to Larry that the thing stood, motionless, seeming to stare evilly at them with eye-like lenses. Then, lurching forward a little, it moved toward them upon legs of green metal. And now Larry saw another amazing thing about it. Floating in the brilliant violet liquid that filled the crystal tube was a gray mass, wrinkled and corrugated. This was divided by deep clefts into right and left hemispheres, which in turn were separated into larger upper and smaller lower segments. White filaments ran through the violet liquid from its base toward the three rings or bands of green metal that encircled the cylinder. In an instant Larry realized that the gray mass was a human brain. The larger upper part of the cerebrum, the smaller mass at the back of the cerebellum, and the white filaments were nerves by means of which this brain controlled its astounding mechanical body. A brain in a machine. The violet liquid it came to Larry in his trance of wonder must take the place of blood, feeding the brain cells, absorbing waste. An eternal mind within a machine, free from the ills and weaknesses of the body, and devoid, too, of any pity, of any tender feelings, a cold and selfish mind, without emotion, unless it might worship itself or its mechanical body. It was this monster that had spilt the pool of blood drying on the floor near the door, and it was these glistening green snake-like tentacles that had crumpled the revolver into a broken mass of steel. Abruptly the machine monster darted forward, running swiftly upon its four legs of green metal. Slender tentacles reached out toward the shuddering girl at Larry's shoulder. Run! Agnes gasped to him quickly. It will kill you! The girl tried to push him back. As she touched him, Larry recovered from his days of wondering fear. Agnes was in frightful danger and facing it with quiet courage. He must find a weapon. Wildly he looked about him. His eyes fell upon the tall, heavy wooden stool upon which Agnes had been sitting. Get back! he shouted to her. He snatched up the stool and, swinging it over his head, sprang toward the machine of violet-filled crystal and glittering green metal. Stop! Agnes screamed in a terrified voice. You can't! She had run before him. He seized her arm and swung her back behind him. Then he advanced warily toward the machine monster, which had paused and seemed to be regarding him with sinister intentness through its glistening crystal eye lenses. With all his strength Larry struck at the crystal cylinder, swinging the stool like an axe. A slender metallic green tentacle whipped out, tore the stool from his hands, and sent it crashing across the room to splinter into fragments on the opposite wall. Larry, sent off his balance, staggered toward the glittering machine. As he stumbled against the transparent tube that contained the brain, he clenched his fist to strike futilely at it. A snake-like metal tentacle wrapped itself about him. He was hurled to the floor, to sprawl grotesquely among broken apparatus. His head came against the leg of a bench. For a few moments he was dazed, but it seemed only a few seconds to him before he had staggered to his feet, rubbing his bruised head. Anxiously he peered about the room. The machine monster and Agnes were gone. He stumbled back to the mass of apparatus in the center of the huge laboratory. Intently he gazed into the upright pillar of crimson flame. Nothing was visible there. No, the other, he gasped, the violet is the way they went. He turned to the companion ray of violet radiance that beat straight down onto the opposite side of the tiny whirling planet, and in that motionless torrent of chill violet flame he saw them, tiny already and swiftly dwindling. With green wings outspread the machine monster was beating swiftly upward through the pillar of purple-blue flame, and close against the crystal tube that contained its brain was Agnes, held fast by the whip-like tentacles of glistening green metal. Larry moved to spring after them into the torrent of violet light, but sudden caution restrained him. I'd shrink too, he muttered, and then where would I be? I'd be standing on the glass platform, I guess, and the thing flying off over my head. 
He gazed at the rapidly dwindling forms of Agnes Sterling and her amazing abductor. As it grew smaller, the machine monster flew higher into the violet beam until it was opposite the tiny spinning planet. The distance between the red and the violet rays was just slightly more than the diameter of the pygmy world. The sphere hung between them, one side of it a fraction of an inch from the red, the other as near the violet. Opposite the elfin planet, the monster ceased to climb. It hung there in the violet ray, an inch from the surface of the little world. And still it swiftly dwindled. It was no larger than a fly, and Larry could barely distinguish the form of the girl, helpless in the green tentacles. Soon she and the monster became a mere greenish speck. Suddenly they were gone. For a little time he stood watching the point where they had vanished, watching the red and the violet rays that poured straight down upon the crystal disks, watching the tiny green-blue planet spinning so steadily between the bright rays. Abruptly he recovered from his fascination of wonder. What did she say, he muttered, something about the monsters carrying off people to sacrifice to a rusty machine that they worship as a god? It took her for that? He clenched his fists. His lips became a straight line of determination. Then I guess we try a voyage in the little plane. A slim chance, maybe, but decidedly better than none. He returned to the table, dropped to his knees, inspected the tiny airplane. A perfect miniature. Delicately beautiful, its slim, small wings were bright as silver foil. Carefully he opened the door and peered into the diminutive cabin. Two minute rifles, several Lilliputian pistols, and boxes of ammunition to match lay on the rear seat of the plane. So, we are prepared for war, he remarked, grinning in satisfaction. And the next trick, I suppose, is to get shrunk to fit the plane. About three inches, she said. Lord, it's a queer thing to think about. He got to his feet, walked back to the machine in the center of the room with its twin pillars of red and violet flame and the tiny world floating between them. He started to step into the violet ray, then hesitated, shivering involuntarily like a swimmer about to dive into icy cold water. Turning back to one of the benches, he picked up a wooden funnel rack and tossed it to the crystal disk beneath the violet ray. Slowly it decreased in size until it had vanished from sight. Safe, I suppose, he muttered, but how do I know when I'm small enough? After a moment he picked up a glass bottle which measured about three inches in height, set it on the floor beside the crystal disk. I dive out when I get to be the size of the bottle, he murmured. With that he leaped into the violet beam. He felt no unusual sensation except one of pleasant tingling warmth as if the direct rays of the sun were bearing down upon him. For a moment he feared that his size was not being affected. Then he noticed not that he appeared to become smaller, but that the laboratory seemed to be growing immensely larger. The walls seemed to race away from him. The green-blue sphere of the tiny planet which he proposed to visit expanded and drew away above his head. Abruptly fearful, alarmed at the hugeness of the room, he turned to look at the bottle he had placed to serve as a standard of size. It had grown with everything else, until it seemed to be about three feet high, and it was swiftly expanding. It reached to the level of his shoulder and higher. He ran to the edge of the crystal disk, which now seemed a floor many yards across, and leaped from its edge. It was a dozen steps to where he had left the bottle, and it was as tall as himself. He started across the floor of the laboratory toward the table under which the toy plane stood. The incredible immensity of his surroundings awed him strangely. The walls of the room seemed like distant cyclopean cliffs. The roof was like a sky table legs towered up like enormous columns. It seemed a hundred yards across the strangely rough floor to the plane. As he drew near it, it gave him huge satisfaction to see that it was of normal size, correctly proportioned to his own dimensions. Great luck, he muttered, that I can fly. He paused as he reached the cabin's open door to wonder at the astounding fact that a little while ago he had opened that door with a hand larger than his entire body was now. I guess this is my day of wonders, he muttered. Allah knows I had to wait long enough for it. First he examined the weapons in the cabin. There were two heavy sporting rifles and two forty-five automatics. There were also two smaller automatics which he supposed had been intended for Agnes's use, and there was abundant ammunition. Then he inspected the plane. It looked to be in excellent condition in every way. The gasoline and oil tanks were full. 
He set about starting the motor, using the plane's inertia starter, which was driven by an electric motor. Soon the engine coughed, sputtered, and gave rise to a roaring rhythmic note that Larry found musical. When the motor was warm, he opened the throttle and taxied out from beneath the colossal table and across the laboratory floor towards the titanic mechanism in the center of the room. The disk of crystal was set almost flush with the floor, its edge beveled. The plane rolled easily upon it and out into the cyclopean pillar of violent flame. Once more Larry felt the sensation that everything about him except the plane itself was expanding inconceivably in size. Soon the laboratory's walls and roof were lost in hazy blue distance. He could distinguish only the broad, bright field formed by the surface of the crystal disk, with the floor stretching away beyond it like a vast plain, and above the green-blue sphere of the tiny planet, bright on one side and dark on the other, so that it looked like a half-moon immensely far off. As he waited he noticed a curious little dial in the lower corner of the instrument board, which he had not seen at first. One end of its graduated scale was marked Earth Normal, the other Pygmy Planet Normal. A tiny black needle was creeping slowly across the scale toward Pygmy Planet Normal. That's how we tell what size we are without having to look at a bottle, he muttered. When the area of the crystal platform appeared to be about half a square mile, he decided that he would now have sufficient space to spiral up the violet ray toward the planet. If he waited too long to start, the distance would become impossibly great. He gave the little plane the gun. The motor thundered a throbbing song. The ship rolled smoothly forward over the polished surface, gained flying speed, and took the air without a shock. Feels good to hold the stick again, Larry murmured. Making small circles to keep within the upright pillar of violet radiance, he climbed steadily and as rapidly as possible, keeping his eyes upon the brilliant half-moon of the pygmy planet. The strangest flight in the annals of aviation. He was flying toward a goal that a few minutes before he could have touched, toward a goal that at the beginning of his flight was only a few lengths of his plane away, and his size dwindled so rapidly as he flew that the planet seemed to swell and draw away from him. As Larry and the plane grew smaller, the relative size of the violet ray increased, so there was no longer much danger of flying out of it. It seemed that he flew through a world of violet flame. He met a curious problem in time. It is evident that time passes faster for a small animal than for a large one, because nerve currents require a shorter time in transit, and all thought and action is consequently speeded up. It took a hundred-foot dinosaur nearly a second to know that his tail had been pinched. A fly can get under way in time to escape a descending swatter. The pygmy planet rotated in a few seconds of Earth time. One of its inhabitants might have lived, aged, and died in the duration of a single day in our larger world. So Larry found that time seemed to pass more rapidly, or rather that the time of the world he had left appeared to move more slowly as he adventured into smallness. He had been flying, it seemed to him, nearly an hour when he reached the level of the planet's equator. Now it seemed a vast world, filling half the visible universe. He flew toward it steadily until he knew by the fading before him of the violet flame which now seemed to fill all space that he was near the edge of the ray. And as he flew he watched the little scale upon which the black needle was now nearing the line marked Pygmy Planet Normal. Circling slowly, keeping always on the level of the planet's equator and near the edge of the violet ray so as to be as close as possible to his landing place when he reached the proper size, he watched the creeping black needle. Too, he scanned with eager eyes the planet floating before him. Bare red deserts, narrow strips of green vegetation, shrunken blue oceans, silvery lines of rivers, passed in fascinating panorama beneath his eyes. The rate of the planet's spinning seemed continually to lessen with the changing of his own sense of time. Agnes, Larry thought of her with a curious eager pain in his heart. She was somewhere on that strange ancient world, a prisoner of weird machine monsters, intended victim of a grotesque sacrificial ceremony. Could he find her in the vastness of an unfamiliar world? And having found her, would there be a chance to rescue her from her hideous captors? The project seemed insane, but Larry felt a queer, unfamiliar urge which he knew would drive him on until he had discovered and saved her, or until he was dead. At last, when it seemed to Larry nearly three hours since he had begun this amazing flight, the crawling ebon needle reached the mark Pygmy Planet Normal. 
He flew out of the wall of violet flame toward the planet's surface. Before, the distance between the planet and the ray's edge had seemed only the fraction of an inch. Now it appeared to be many miles. Abruptly, the pygmy planet, which had seemed to be beside him, appeared to swing about so that it was beneath him. He knew that it was a change merely in his sensations. He was feeling the gravitation of the new world. It was pulling him toward it. He cut the throttle and settled the plane into a long glide, a glide that was to end upon the surface of a new planet. In what seemed half an hour more, Larry had made a safe landing upon the pygmy planet. He had come down upon a stretch of fairly smooth red sandy desert which seemed to stretch illimitably toward the rising sun which direction Larry instinctively termed East. To the west was a line of dull green, evidently the vegetation along a stream. The Ocher Desert was scattered with sparse clumps of reddish spiky scrub. Larry taxied the plane into one of those thickets. Finding canvas and rope in the cabin, he staked down the machine and muffled the motor. Then, selecting a rifle and a heavy automatic from the weapons in the cabin, and filling his pockets with extra ammunition, he left the plane and set out with brisk steps towards the green line of vegetation. I'll follow along the river, he reasoned. It may lead me somewhere, and it will show the way back to the plane. I may come across something in the way of a clue. Can't go exploring by air, or I'll burn up all the gas and be stranded here. To his surprise, the water course proved to be an ancient canal walled with crumbling masonry. Its channel was choked with mud and thorny, thick-leaved desert shrubs of unfamiliar variety, but a feeble current still flowed along it. After some reflection, Larry set out along the banks of the canal. He followed it for two days. Curious straight bars of light were visible across the sky, a band of violet in the morning and one of crimson at evening. Their apparent motion was in the same direction as that of the sun. The bars of light puzzled him considerably before it occurred to him that they must be the red and violet rays. So, you wait until evening and then fly up into the red ray to go home, he murmured. But I may not need that information, he added grimly. Seems to be a pretty big job to search a planet on foot, for one person, and I'm not going back without Agnes. In the afternoon of the second day he came within view of a city. He could discern vast, imposing walls and towers of dark stone. It stood in the barren red desert, far back from the green line of the old canal. Larry left the canal and started wearily across toward it. He had covered several miles of the distance before he saw that the lofty towers were falling, the magnificent walls crumbling. The city was ruined, dead, deserted. The realization brought him a great flood of despair. He had hoped to find people, friends, from whom he might get food and information about this unfamiliar planet. But the city was dead. Larry was standing there in the midst of the vast red plain between ruined city and ruined canal, tired, hungry, lonely, and hopeless. He was looking up at the white sun, trying to comfort himself with the thought that the brilliant luminary was merely a queer blue lamp that he was upon a tiny experimental world in a laboratory. But the thought brought him no relief, only confusion and a sense of incredulity. Then he saw the machine monster, a glittering winged thing of crystal and green metal, identical with the one he had encountered in the laboratory. It must already have seen him, for it was dropping swiftly toward him. Larry started to run, took a few staggering steps. Then he recalled the heavy rifle slung over his shoulder. Moving with desperate haste, he got it into his hands and raised it just as the monster dropped to the red sand a dozen yards away from him. Steadily he covered the crystal cylinder within which the thing's brain floated in luminous violet liquid. His finger tightened on the trigger, ready to send a heavy bullet crashing into it. Then he paused, swore softly, and lowered the gun. If I kill it, he murmured, I may never find Agnes, and if I let it carry me off, it may take me to where she is. He walked toward the monster across the red sand. It stood uncertainly upon green metal legs, seeming to stare at him strangely with eye-like lenses. Its wings of thin green metal plates were folded, its four green tentacles were twitching oddly. Abruptly it sprang upon him. A green tentacle seized the rifle and snatched it from his hands. He felt the automatic pistol and the ammunition being removed from his pockets. Then, firmly held in the flexible arms of green metal, he was lifted against the cylinder of violet liquid. 
The monster spread its broad emerald wings, and Larry was swiftly borne into the air. In a few moments the wide ruins of the ancient city were spread below, with the green line of the choked canal cutting the infinite red waste of the desert beyond it. The monster flew westward. For a considerable time nothing save barren, ocherous desert was in view. Then Larry's weird captor flew near a strange city, a city of green metal. The buildings were most fantastic, pyramids of green crowned with enormous glistening spheres of emerald metal, an impassable wall surrounding the city. Larry had expected the monster to drop into the city, but it carried him on and finally settled to the ground several miles beyond. The green tentacles released him as the thing landed, and he sprawled beside it, dizzy after his strange flight. As Larry staggered uncertainly to his feet, he saw that the monster had released him in an open pen. It was a square area, nearly fifty yards on each side, and fenced with thin posts or rods of green metal, perhaps twenty feet high, set very close together and sharply pointed at the top. They formed a barrier, apparently insurmountable. In the center of the pen was a huge and strange machine built of green metal. It looked very worn and ancient. It was covered with patches of bluish rust or corrosion. At first it looked quite strange to Larry. Then he was struck by a vaguely familiar quality about it. Looking closer he realized that it was a colossal steam hammer. Its design, of course, was unfamiliar. But in the vast corroded frame he quickly picked out a steam chest, cylinder, and the great hammer weighing many tons. He gasped when his eyes went to the anvil. A man was chained across it. A man in torn, grimy clothing, fastened with fetters of green metal upon wrists and ankles so that his body was stretched beneath the massive hammer. He seemed to be unconscious. Upon his head, which was turned toward Larry, was a red and swollen bruise. The monster which had dropped Larry within the pen rose again into the air, and Larry started forward trying to remember just what Agnes had told him of a machine to which the monsters sacrificed. This must be the machine, this ancient steam hammer. As he moved forward, Agnes came into view. She walked around the massive base of the great machine carrying a bowl filled with a fragrant brown liquid. She stopped at sight of Larry and uttered a little cry. The bowl fell from her hands and the fragrant liquid splashed out onto the ground. Her brown eyes went wide with delighted surprise, then a look of pain came to them. Larry, Larry, she cried, why did you come? To get you, he answered, trying to speak as lightly as he could. And the best way I knew to find you was to let one of the monsters bring me. Cheer up! But even to himself his voice had a tone of discouragement. She smiled wanly. I don't see anything to be cheerful about. Her small face was set and a little white. Dr. Whitting is going to be smashed under the hammer of this dreadful machine whenever the steam is up. Then it's my turn. And yours. That's nothing to laugh about. But we aren't smashed yet, Larry insisted. By the way, what was in that bowl? He went on, glancing down. I forgot to bring lunch, he grinned. She looked down, startled. Oh, Dr. Whitting's soup, poor fellow. I'm afraid he'll never awake to eat it. There's plenty more. Come around here." She picked up the bowl and led him around the base of the machine. Then she filled the bowl again with the fragrant red-brown liquid from a tall urn of green metal. Larry took the dish eagerly and gulped down the rather insipid and tasteless food. "'And the monsters worship this old steam hammer?' he inquired, when his hunger was appeased. "'Yes. I think the thing is worked by steam generated by volcanic heat. Anyhow, there isn't any boiler, and the steam pipe comes up out of the ground. You can see that. So it runs on without any attention, though I guess the heat is dying down since it is several days between blows of the hammer. And I guess the monsters have forgotten how they used to rule machines. They seem to have depended upon machines, even giving up their own bodies for mechanical ones, until the machine rules them. And when this old hammer kept pounding on through the ages using volcanic steam, I guess they got to considering it alive. They began to regard it as a sort of god, and when they got the idea of giving it sacrifices it was natural enough to place the victims under the hammer. They went back to Dr. Whitting, who was chained across the anvil. He was still breathing but unconscious. He had been injured in a struggle with the monsters, and his body was much emaciated. Agnes explained that he had been a prisoner in the pen for many months of the time of this world, waiting his turn to die. 
She said that the monsters had just completed the extermination of another race upon the Pygmy Planet and were just turning to the greater world for victims. Larry noticed that the great hammer was slowly rising in its guides as the pressure of the steam from the planet's interior increased. In a few hours, just at sunset, it reached the top of its stroke. The air above the pen was suddenly filled with glittering swarms of the green-winged monsters sweeping slowly about in measured flight with strange order in their masses. They had come to witness the sacrifice. With an explosive rush of steam the hammer came down. The ground trembled beneath the terrific blow. The roaring of escaping steam and the crash of the impact were almost deafening. A heavy white cloud shrouded the corroded green machine. When the hammer slowly lifted, only a red smear was left. Agnes had shrunk, trembling against Larry's shoulder. He had put his arms about her and was holding her almost fiercely. My turn next, she whispered, and don't try to fight them. It will only make them hurt you. I can't let them take you, Agnes, Larry cried in an agonized tone, and the words seemed to leap out of themselves, because I love you. You do? Agnes cried in a thin, choking voice, pressing herself against him. Ever since the first time you came to the laboratory. A score of the monster forms of violet-filled crystal and gleaming green metal had dropped into the pen. They tore Agnes from Larry's arms, hurling him roughly to the ground at the bottom of the green metal fence. For some time he was unconscious. When he had staggered painfully to his feet it was night. The monsters were gone, the starless sky was black and empty. Calling out weakly and stumbling about the pen he found Agnes. She was chained where Dr. Whitting had been. She was conscious, unharmed. For a time they talked a little, exchanging broken, incoherent phrases. Then they went to sleep, lying on the anvil beneath that mighty hammer that was slowly lifting to strike another fearful blow. When the sun had risen again, Larry brought Agnes some of the brown soup from the metal urn which had been filled again. Then, when he had satisfied himself, he started clamoring up the massive frame of the hammer. If he could put it out of commission. It was a difficult task. He slipped back many times and finally had to choose another place to make the ascent. Twice he slipped and almost fell from a considerable height. But finally he reached the massive wheel of the valve which seemed to control the admission of steam into the cylinder above the hammer. If he could but close that, the steam would be confined in the chest below, and when the pressure reached a certain point something should happen. The valve was not easy to turn. It seemed fixed with the corrosion of ages. For hours Larry wrestled with it. Then he left it, realizing that he must find something to use for a hammer. A vigorous search of the pen's hard earth floor failed to reveal any stone that would do. He turned his attention to the machine and presently saw a slender projecting lever high up on the side of the vast frame which looked as if it had been weakened by corrosion. After a perilous climb he reached the bar of green metal and swung his weight upon it. It broke and he plunged to the ground with the bar in his hands. Clambering up once more to the great valve he hammered it until the rust that stiffened it was loosened. Then he struggled with the valve until it was closed. We'll see what happens, he muttered. Returning to the ground, he set to work to break the green metal fetters upon Agnes's wrists and ankles, using the broken lever as hammer and file. For the greater part of six days he toiled at that task, while the great hammer rose slowly. But the green metal seemed very hard. One arm was free at the end of the second day, the other on the fourth. He had one ankle loose on the morning of the sixth day. But as evening came on and the great hammer reached the top of its stroke, the fourth chain still defied him. Before sunset a swarm of the monsters appeared wheeling on green wings. He was forced to leave the work, hiding his improvised file. Agnes still lay across the anvil to conceal from the monsters the fact that the chains were broken. Larry sat close beside her, nursing hands that were blistered and sore from his days of filing at the chains. A sudden clatter came from the huge mechanism above them and a sharp hiss of steam which became louder. It works, Larry whispered to Agnes. The old valve held and the steam can't get into the cylinder to smash us. But Allah knows what will happen when the pressure rises in that old steam chest. Darkness came. Dusk swallowed the wheeling machine monsters. All night Larry and Agnes waited silently, together on the great anvil, listening to the hissing of the steam from above, which was slowly becoming a shrill, monotonous scream, monotonous, always higher and shriller. 
The sun rose again. Still the green-winged monsters wheeled about. They came in glittering swarms, thousands of them. They came nearer the machine now, and flew about it more swiftly, as if excited. Then it happened. There was a roar like thunder and a colossal bellowing explosion. The air was filled suddenly with scalding steam and with screaming fragments of the bursting steam chest. In the midst of it all Larry felt a crushing blow upon the head, and a blanket of darkness fell upon him. "'The monsters are all gone, darling,' Agnes's voice reached him, as though they were very much frightened, and a piece of the old hammer hit the fence and knocked a hole in it. You must go. Leave me.' "'Leave you?' Larry groaned, struggling to sit up. Not a bit of it. He touched his head gingerly, felt a swollen bruise. Collecting a few fragments of the wrecked machine to serve as tools, he fell to work again upon Agnes's remaining chain. Already he had cut a deep groove into it. Two hours later it was broken. Carrying the metal urn of brownish liquid, they crept out through the hole in the fence which had been torn by the flying fragment of a broken casting of green metal. They left the wreck of the machine which a strange race had worshipped as a bloody god and hurried furtively into the desert of red sand. Making a wide circuit about the fantastic city of green metal which Larry had seen from the air, they struck out eastward across the desolate ocherous waste. The food in the urn eaten sparingly lasted until the end of the eighth day. On the morning of the ninth they came in view of the green line of the ancient canal. It was hours later that they staggered weakly over its wall of crumbling masonry, clambered down into the muddy, weed-grown channel, and drank thirstily of green, tepid water. Larry found his old trail beyond the canal. They followed it back. In the middle of the afternoon they stumbled up to the thicket of spiky desert growth in which Larry had hidden the plane. The machine was undamaged. Before sunset Larry had removed the stake ropes, slipped the canvas cover from the motor, turned the plane around, inspected it, and examined the strip of smooth, hard red sand upon which he had landed. Agnes pointed out the dim band of crimson across the sky from north to south, slowly rising toward the zenith. "'That's the red ray,' she said. "'We fly into it.' "'And a happy moment when we do,' Larry rejoined. He roused the motor to life. As the bar of crimson light neared the zenith, the plane rolled forward across the sand and took off, climbing steeply. Larry anxiously watched the approach of the red band. The gravitation of the pygmy planet seemed to diminish as he gained altitude until presently he could fly vertically from it without circling at all. He set the bow toward the scarlet bar across the sky before him. And suddenly he was flying through ruby flame. His eyes went to the little scale at the corner of the instrument board. He saw the little ebon needle waver, leave the mark designated Pygmy Planet Normal, and start toward Earth Normal. For what seemed a long time he was wheeling down the crimson ray. A few times he looked back at Agnes in the rear seat. She had gone to sleep. Then a vast circular field was below, the crystal platform. Larry landed the plane upon it, taxied it to the center, and stopped there with the motor idling. The laboratory, taking shape in the blue abyss about him, seemed to contract swiftly. Presently the plane covered most of the crystal disk. He taxied quickly off, stopped on the floor nearby, and cut the ignition. Agnes woke. Together they clambered from the plane's cabin and walked back into the crimson ray. Once more the vast spaces of the room seemed to shrink until it looked familiar once more. The pygmy planet and the huge machine looming over them dwindled to natural size. Agnes, watching a scale on the frame of the mechanism which Larry had not noticed, leaped suddenly from the red ray, drawing him with her. "'We don't want to be giants,' she laughed. Larry drew a deep breath and looked about him. Once more he was in his own world and surveying it in his normal size. He became aware of Agnes standing close to him. He suddenly took her in his arms and kissed her. "'Wait a minute,' she objected, slipping quickly from his arms. "'What are we going to do about the pygmy planet?' Those monsters might come again, even if you did wreck their god. And Dr. Whitting, poor fellow. But we mustn't let those monsters come back." Larry doubled up a brown fist and drove it with all his strength against the little globe that spun so steadily between the twin upright cylinders of crimson and of violet flame. His hand went deep into it, and it swung from its position, hung unsteadily a moment, and then crashed to the laboratory floor. It was crushed like a ball of soft brown mud. It spattered. Now I guess they won't come back, Agnes said. 
A pity to spoil all Dr. Whitting's work, though. Larry was standing motionless, holding up his fist and looking at it oddly. I smashed a planet. Think of it. I smashed a planet. Just the other... Why, it was just this evening at the office. I was wishing for something to happen. End of The Pygmy Planet by Jack Williamson By Robert J. Scher. His LibriVos recording. All LibriVos recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daniele. You're a fascinating person, the girl said. I've never met anyone like you before. Tell me your story again. The man was short and stocky, with Asiatic features and a long, stringy mustache. The whole story? he asked. It would take a lifetime to tell you. He stared out the window at the yellow sun and the red sun. He still hadn't gotten used to seeing two suns. But that was minor, really, when there were so many other things he had to get used to. A robot waiter, with long thin metal tubes for arms and legs, glided over. When he had first seen one of those, he thought it was a demon. He'd tried to smash it. They'd had trouble with him at first. They had trouble with me at first, he said. I can imagine, said the girl. How did they explain it to you? It was hard. They had to give me the whole history of medicine. It was years before I got over the notion that I was up in the everlasting blue sky, or under the earth, or something. He grinned at the girl. She was the first person he'd met since they got him a job and gave him a home in a world uncountable like years from the one he'd been born on. When did you begin to understand? They simply told all of history to me, including the part about myself. Then I began to get the picture. Funny, I wound up teaching them a lot of history. I bet you know a lot. I do, the man with the Asiatic features said modestly. Anyway, they finally got across to me that in the 22nd century, they had explained the calendar to me, too. I used a different one in my day. They had learned how to grow new limbs on people who had lost arms and legs. That was the first real step, said the girl. It was a long time till they got to the second step, he said. They learned how to stimulate life and new growth in people who had already died. The next part is the thing I don't understand, said the girl. Well, said the man, as I get it, they found that any piece of matter that has been part of an organism retains a physical memory of the entire structure of the organism of which it was part, and that they could reconstruct that structure from a part of a person, if that was all that was left of him. From there it was just a matter of pushing the process back through time. They had to teach me a whole new language to explain that one. Isn't it wonderful that intergalactic travel gives us room to expand? said the girl. I mean now that every human being that ever lived has been brought back to life and will live forever? Same problem I had, me and my people, said the man. We were prompt for space. This age has solved it a lot better than I did. But they had to give me a whole psychological overhauling before I understood that. Tell me about your past life, said the girl, staring dreamily at him. Well, six thousand years ago, I was born on Gobi Desert on Earth, said Genghis Khan, sipping his drink. End of Resurrection by Robert J. Scher By Jack Williamson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite. Salvage in Space 
by Jack Williamson. His planet was the smallest in the solar system, and the loneliest, Thad Allen was thinking as he straightened wearily in the huge, bulging, inflated fabric of his Osprey space armor. Walking awkwardly in the magnetic boots that held him to the black mass of meteoric iron, he mounted a projection and stood motionless, staring moodily away through the vision panels of his bulky helmet into the dark mystery of the void. His welding arc dangled at his belt, the electrodes still glowing red. He had just finished securing to this slowly accumulated mass of iron his most recent find, a meteorite the size of his head. Five perilous weeks he had labored to collect this rugged lump of metal, a jagged mass some ten feet in diameter, composed of hundreds of fragments that he had captured and welded together. His luck had not been good. His findings had been heartbreakingly small. The spectro-flash analysis had revealed that the contents of the precious metals was disappointingly minute. The meteor or asteroid belt between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter is mined by such adventurers as Thad Allen for the platinum, iridium, and osmium that all meteoric irons contain in small quantities. The meteor swarms are supposed by some astronomers to be fragments of a disrupted planet which, according to Bode's law, should occupy this space. On the other side of this tiny sphere of hard-won treasure, his Millen atomic rocket was sputtering spurts of hot blue flame jetting from its exhaust. A simple mechanism bolted to the first sizable fragment he had captured. It drove the iron ball through space like a ship. Through the magnetic soles of his insulated boots Thad could feel the vibration of the iron mass beneath the rocket's regular thrust. The magazine of uranite fuel capsules was nearly empty now, he reflected. He would soon have to turn back toward Mars. Turn back? How could he, with so slender a reward for his efforts? Meteor mining is expensive. There was his bill at Millen and Helion Mars for uranite and supplies, and the unpaid last installment on his Osprey suit. How could he outfit himself again if he returned with no more metal than this? There were men who averaged a thousand tons of iron a month. Why couldn't fortune smile on him? He knew men who had made fabulous strikes, who had captured whole planetoids of rich metal and he knew weary, white-haired men who braved the perils of vacuum and absolute cold and bullet-swift meteors for hard years, who still hoped. But sometime fortune had to smile, and then the picture came to him, a tower of white metal among the low red hills near Helion, a slim, graceful tower of argent rising in a fragrant garden of flowering Martian shrubs, purple and saffron, and a girl waiting at the silver door a trim, slender girl in white with blue eyes and hair richly brown. Thad had seen the White Tower many times on his holiday tramps through the hills about Helion. He had even dared to ask if it could be bought to find that its price was an amount that he might not amass in many years at his perilous profession. But the girl in white was yet only a glorious dream. The strangeness of interplanetary space and the somber mystery of it pressed upon him like an illimitable and deserted ocean. The sun was a tiny white disk on his right, hanging between rosy coronal wings. His native Earth, a bright greenish point suspended in the dark gulf below it. Mars, nearer, smaller, a little ochre speck above the shrunken sun. Above him, below him, in all directions was vastness, blackness, emptiness, ebon infinity sprinkled with far, cold stars. Thad was alone, utterly alone. No man was visible in all the supernal vastness of space, and no work of man save the few tools of his daring trade and the glittering little rocket bolted to the black iron behind him. It was terrible to think that the nearest human being must be tens of millions of miles away. On his first trips the loneliness had been terrible, unendurable. Now he was becoming accustomed to it. At least he no longer feared that he was going mad. But sometimes... Thad shook himself and spoke aloud, his voice ringing hollow in his huge metal helmet. Brace up, old top, in good company when you're by yourself, as Dad used to say. Be back in Helion in a week or so, anyhow. Look up Dan and Chuck and the rest of the crowd again at Comet's place. What price a friendly boxing match with Mason or an evening at the Teleview Theater? Fresh air instead of this stale synthetic stuff. Real food in place of these tasteless concentrates. A hot bath instead of greasing yourself. Too dull out here, life. He broke off, set his jaw. 
No use thinking about such things. Only made it worse. Besides, how did he know that a whirring meteor wasn't going to flash him out before he got back? He drew his right arm out of the bulging sleeve of his suit into its ample interior, found a cigarette in an inside pocket, and lighted it. The smoke swirled about in the helmet, drawn swiftly into the air filters. Darn clever, these suits, he murmured. Food, smokes, water, generator, all where you can reach them. And darned expensive, too. I'd better be looking for pay metal. He clambered to a better position, stood peering out into space, searching for the tiny gleam of sunlight on a meteoric fragment that might be worth capturing for its content of precious metals. For an hour he scanned the black star-strewn gulf as the sputtering rocket continued to drive him forward. There she glows, he cried suddenly and grinned. Before him was a tiny glowing fleck that moved among the unchanging stars. He stared at it intensely, breathing faster in the helmet. Always he thrilled to see such a moving gleam. What a treasure it promised! At first sight it was impossible to determine size or distance or rate of motion. It might be ten thousand tons of rich metal, a fortune. It would more probably prove to be a tiny stony mass not worth capturing. It might even be large and valuable, but moving so rapidly that he could not overtake it with the power of the diminutive Millen rocket. He studied the tiny speck intently, with practiced eye, as the minutes passed. An untrained eye would never have seen it at all among the flaming hosts of stars. Skillfully he judged from its apparent rate of motion and its slow increase in brilliance its size and distance from him. Must be, must be a fair size, he spoke aloud at length. A hundred tons, I'll bet my helmet. But scooting along pretty fast, stretch the little old rocket to run it down. He clambered back to the rocket, changed the angle of the flaming exhaust to drive him directly across the path of the object ahead, filled the magazine again with the little pellets of uranite, which were fed automatically into the combustion chamber and increased the firing rate. The trailing blue flame reached farther backward from the incandescent orifice of the exhaust. The vibration of the metal sphere increased. Thad left the sputtering rocket and went back where he could see the object before him. It was nearer now, rushing obliquely across his path. Would he be in time to capture it as it passed? Or would it hurtle by ahead of him and vanish in the limitless darkness of space before his feeble rocket could check the momentum of his ball of metal? He peered at it as it drew closer. Its surface seemed oddly bright, silvery, not the dull black of meteoric iron, and it was larger, more distant than he thought at first. In form, too, it seemed curiously regular, ellipsoid. It was no jagged mass of metal. His hopes sank, rose again immediately. Even if it were not the mass of rich metal for which he had prayed, it might be something as valuable, and more interesting. He returned to the rocket, adjusted the angle of the nozzle again, and advanced the firing time slightly, even at the risk of a ruinous explosion. When he returned to where he could see the hurtling object before him, he saw that it was a ship a tapering silver-green rocket flyer. Once more his dreams were dashed. The officers of interplanetary liners lose no love upon the meteor miners, claiming that their collected masses of metal, almost helpless, always underpowered, are menaces to navigation. Thad could expect nothing from the ship save a heliographed warning to keep clear. But how came a rocket flyer here, in the perilous swarms of the meteor belt? Many a vessel had been destroyed by collision with an asteroid in the days before charted lanes were cleared of drifting metal. The lanes more frequently used between Earth, Mars, Venus, and Mercury were, of course, far inside the orbits of the asteroids, and the few ships returning to Jupiter's moons avoided them by crossing millions of miles above their plane. Could it be that legendary green ship? said once to have mysteriously appeared, sliced up and drawn within her hull several of the primitive ships of that day, and then disappeared forever after in the remote wastes of space. Absurd, of course. He dismissed the idle fancy and examined the ship still more closely. Then he saw that it was turning end over end very slowly. That meant that the gyros were stopped, that it was helpless, drifting, disabled, powerless to avoid hurling meteoric stones. Had it blundered unawares into the belt of swarms, been struck before the danger was realized? Was it a derelict with all dead upon it? Either the ship's machinery was completely wrecked, Thad knew, or there was no one on watch, 
for the controls of a modern rocket flyer are so simple and so nearly automatic that a single man at the bridge can keep a vessel upon her course. It might be, he thought, that a meteorite had ripped open the hull, allowing the air to escape so quickly that the entire crew had been asphyxiated before any repairs could be made. But that seemed unlikely, since the ship must have been divided into several compartments by airtight bulkheads. Could the vessel have been deserted for some reason? The crew might have mutinied and left her in the life-tubes. She might have been robbed by pirates and set adrift. But with the space lanes policed as they were, piracy and successful mutiny were rare. Thad saw that the flyer's navigation lights were out. He found the heliographic signal mirror at his side, sighted it upon the ship, and worked the mirror rapidly. He waited, repeated the call. There was no response. The vessel was plainly a derelict. Could he board her and take her to Mars? By law it was his duty to attempt to aid any helpless ship, or at least try to save any endangered lives on her. And the salvage award, if the ship should be deserted and he could bring her safe to port, would be half her value. No mean prize, that. Half the value of a ship and cargo, more than he was apt to earn in years of mining the meteor belt. With new anxiety he measured the relative motion of the gleaming ship. It was going to pass ahead of him, and very soon. No more time for speculation. It was still uncertain whether it would come near enough so that he could get a line to it. Rapidly he unslung from his belt the apparatus he used to capture meteors, a powerful electromagnet with a thin, strong wire fastened to it, to be hurled from a helix gun. He set the drum on which the wire was wound upon the metal at his feet, fastened it with its magnetic anchor, wondering if it would stand the terrific strain when the wire tightened. Raising the helix to his shoulder, he trained it upon a point well ahead of the rushing flyer, and stood waiting for the exact moment to press the lever. The slender spindle of the ship was only a mile away now, bright in the sunlight. He could see no break in her polished hull, save for the dark rows of circular ports. She was not by any means completely wrecked. He read the black letters of her name. Red Dragon. The name of her home port below was in smaller letters, but in a moment he made them out. San Francisco. The ship then came from Earth, from the very city where Thad was born. The gleaming hull was near now, only a few hundred yards away, passing. Aiming well ahead of her to allow for her motion, Thad pressed the key that hurled the magnet from the helix. It flung away from him, the wire screaming from the reel behind it. Thad's massive metal swung on past the ship as he returned to the rocket and stopped its clattering explosions. He watched the tiny black speck of the magnet. It vanished from sight in the darkness of space, appeared again against the white burnished hull of the rocket ship. For a painful instant he thought he had missed. Then he saw that the magnet was fast to the side of the flyer, near the stern. The line tightened. Soon the strain would come upon it, as it checked the momentum of the mass of iron. He set the friction brake. Thad flung himself flat, grasped the wire above the reel. Even if the mass of iron tore itself free, he could hold to the wire and himself reach the ship. He flung past the deserted vessel. Behind it, his lump of iron swung like a pebble in a sling. A cloud of smoke burst from the burned lining of the friction brake in the reel. Then the wire was all out. There was a sudden jerk. And the hard, gathered sphere of metal was gone, snapped off into space. Thad clung desperately to the wire, muscles cracking, tortured arms almost drawn from their sockets. Fear flashed over his mind. What if the wire broke and left him floating helpless in space? It held, though, to his relief. He was trailing behind the ship. Eagerly he seized the handle of the reel, began to wind up the mile and a half of thin wire. Half an hour later Thad's suited figure bumped gently against the shining hull of the rocket. He got to his feet and gazed backward into the starry gulf where his sphere of iron had long since vanished. Somebody is going to find himself a nice chunk of metal, all welded together and equipped for rocket navigation, he murmured. As for me, well, I've simply got to run this tub to Mars. He walked over the smooth, refulgent hull, held to it by magnetic soles. Nowhere was it broken, though he found scars where small meteoric particles had scratched the brilliant polish. So, no meteor had wrecked the ship. What, then, was the matter? Soon he would know. The Red Dragon was not large, a hundred and thirty feet long, Thad estimated, with a beam of twenty-five feet. But her trim lines bespoke design recent and good. 
The double ring of black projecting rockets at the stern told of unusual speed. A pretty piece of salvage, he reflected, if he could land her on Mars. Half the value of such a ship, unharmed and safe in port, would be a larger sum than he dared to put in figures, and he must take her in now that he had lost his own rocket. He found the life-tubes, six of them, slender, silvery cylinders, lying secure in their niches, three along each side of the flyer. None was missing. So the crew had not willingly deserted the ship. He approached the main airlock, at the center of the hull, behind the projecting dome of the bridge. It was closed. A glance at the dials told him there was full air pressure within it. It had, then, last been used to enter the rocket, not leave it. Thad opened the exhaust valve, let the air hiss from the chamber of the lock. The huge door swung open in response to his hand upon the wheel, and he entered the cylindrical chamber. In a moment the door was closed behind him. Air was hissing into the lock again. He started to open the faceplate of his helmet, longing for a breath of air that did not smell of sweat and stale tobacco smoke, as that in his suit always did, despite the best chemical purifiers. Then he hesitated. Perhaps some deadly gas from the combustion chambers. Thad opened the inner valve and came upon the upper deck of the vessel. A floor ran the full length of the ship, broken with hatches and companionways that gave to the rocket rooms cargo holds and quarters for crew and passengers below. There was an enclosed ladder that led to bridge and navigating rooms in the dome above. The hull formed an arched roof over it. The deck was deserted, lit only by three dim blue globes hanging from the curved roof. All seemed in order, the firefighting equipment hanging on the walls and the huge metal patches and welding equipment for repairing breaks in the hull. Everything was clean, bright with polish or new paint. And all was very still. The silence held a vague, brooding threat that frightened Thad, made him wish for a moment that he was back upon his rugged ball of metal. But he banished his fear and strode down the deck. Midway of it he found a dark stain upon the clean metal, the black of long-dried blood, a few tattered scraps of cloth beside it, no more than bloody rags, and a heavy meat cleaver half hidden beneath a bit of darkened fabric. Mute record of tragedy. Thad strove to read it. Had a man fought here and been killed? It must have been a struggle of peculiar violence to judge by the dark spattered stains and the indescribable condition of the remnants of clothing. But what had he fought? Another man or some thing? And what had become a victor and vanquished? He walked on down the deck. The torturing silence was broken by the abrupt patter of quick little footsteps behind him. He turned quickly, nervously, with a hand going instinctively to his welding arc, which he knew would make a fairly effective weapon. It was merely a dog, a little dog, a yellow, nondescript, pathetically delighted dog, with a sharp, eager bark it leaped up at Thad, pawing at his armor and licking it, standing on its hind legs and reaching toward the visor of his helmet. It was very thin, as if from long starvation. Both ears were ragged and bloody, and there was a long, unhealed scratch across the shoulder, somewhat inflamed, but not a serious wound. The bright, eager eyes were alight with joy, but Thad thought he saw fear in them, and even through the stiff fabric of the osprey suit he felt that the dog was trembling. Suddenly, with a low whine, it shrank close to his side, and another sound reached Thad's ears. A cry, weird and harrowing beyond telling a scream so thin and so high that it roughened his skin, so keenly shrill that it tortured his nerves, a sound of that peculiar frequency that is more agonizing than any bodily pain. When silence came again, Thad was standing with his back against the wall, the welding arc in his hand. His face was cold with sweat, and a queer chill pricked up and down his spine. The yellow dog crouched whimpering against his legs. Ominous, threatening stillness filled the ship again disturbed only by the whimpers and frightened growls of the dog. Trying to calm his overwrought nerves, Thad listened, strained his ears. He could hear nothing, and he had no idea from which direction the terrifying sound had come. A strange cry. Thad knew it had been born in no human throat, nor in the throat of any animal he knew. It had carried an alien note that overcame him with instinctive fear and horror. What had voiced it? Was the ship haunted by some dread entity? For many minutes Thad stood upon the deck, waiting, tensely grasping the welding tool, but the nerve-shattering scream did not come again, nor any other sound. 
The yellow dog seemed half to forget its fear. It leaped up at his face again with another short little bark. The air must be good, he thought, if the dog could live in it. He unscrewed the faceplate of his helmet and lifted it. The air that struck his face was cool and clean. He breathed deeply, gratefully. And at first he did not notice the strange odor upon it, a curious, unpleasant scent, earthly, almost fetid, unfamiliar. The dog kept leaping up, whining. Hungry boy? Thad whispered. He fumbled in the bulky inside pockets of his suit, found a slab of concentrated food, and tossed it out through the opened panel. The dog sprang upon it, wolfed it eagerly, and came back to his side. Thad set at once about exploring the ship. First he ascended the ladder to the bridge. A metal dome covered it, studded with transparent ports. Charts and instruments were in order, and the room was vacant, heavy with the fatal silence of the ship. Thad had no expert's knowledge of the flyer's mechanism, but he had studied interplanetary navigation to qualify for his license to carry masses of metal under rocket power through the space lanes and into planetary atmospheres. He was sure he could manage the ship if its mechanism were in good order, though he was uncertain of his ability to make any considerable repairs. To his relief a scrutiny of the dials revealed nothing wrong. He started the gyro motors, got the great wheels to spinning, and thus stopped the slow end-over-end -end turning of the flyer. Then he went to the rocket controls, warmed three of the tubes, and set them to firing. The vessel answered readily to her helm. In a few minutes he had the red fleck of Mars over the bow. Yes, I can run her all right, he announced to the dog, which had followed him up the steps, keeping close to his feet. Don't worry, old boy. We'll be eating a juicy beefsteak together in a week at Comet's place in Helion, down by the canal. Not much style, but the eats. And now we're going to do a little detective work and find out what made that disagreeable noise, and what happened to all your fellow astronauts. Better find out before it happens to us. He shut off the rockets and climbed down from the bridge again. When Thad started down the companionway to the officers' quarters in the central one of the five main compartments of the ship, the dog kept close to his legs, growling, trembling, hackles lifted. Sensing the animal's terror, pitying it for the naked fear in its eyes, Thad wondered what dramas of horror it might have seen. The cabins of the navigator, calculator, chief technician, and first officer were empty and forbidding with the ominous silence of the ship. They were neatly in order, and the berths had been made since they were used. But there was a large bloodstain, black and circular, on the floor of the calculator's room. The captain's cabin held evidence of a violent struggle. The door had been broken in, its fragments with pieces of broken furniture, books, covers from the berth, and three service pistols were scattered about in indescribable confusion, all stained with blood. Among the frightful debris, Thad found several scraps of clothing, of dissimilar fabrics. The guns were empty. Attempting to reconstruct the action of the tragedy from those grim clues, he imagined that the five officers, aware of some peril, had gathered here, fought, and died. The dog refused to enter the room. It stood at the door, looking anxiously after him, trembling and whimpering pitifully. Several times it sniffed the air and drew back, snarling. Thad thought that the unpleasant earthly odor he had noticed upon opening the faceplate of his helmet was stronger here. After a few minutes of searching through the wildly disordered room, he found the ship's log, or its remains. Many pages had been torn from the book, and the remainder, soaked with blood, formed a stiff black mass. Only one legible entry did he find, that on a page torn from the book which somehow had escaped destruction. Dated five months before, it gave the position of the vessel and her bearings. She was then just outside Jupiter's orbit, earthward bound, and concluded with a remark of sinister implications. Another man gone this morning. Sims, assistant technician. A fine workman. Odin swears he heard something moving on the deck. Cook thinks some of the doctor's stuffed monstrosities have come to life. Ridiculous, of course, but what is one to think? Pondering the significance of those few lines, Thad climbed back to the deck. Was the ship haunted by some weird death that had seized the crew man by man mysteriously? That was the obvious implication, and if the flyer had been still outside Jupiter's orbit when those words were written, it must have been weeks before the end. A lurking invisible death, the scream he had heard. He descended into the forecastle and came upon another such silent record of frightful carnage as he had found in the captain's cabin. Dried blood, scraps of cloth, knives, and other weapons. 
A fearful question was beginning to obsess him. What had become of the bodies of those who must have died in these conflicts? He dared not think the answer. Gripping the welding arc, Thad approached the after-hatch giving to the cargo hold. Trepidation almost overpowered him, but he was determined to find the sinister menace of the ship before it found him. The dog whimpered, hung back, and finally deserted him, contributing nothing to his peace of mind. The hold proved to be dark, an indefinite black space oppressive with the terrible silence of the flyer. The air within it bore still more strongly the unpleasant fetter. Thad hesitated on the steps. The hold was not inviting. But at the thought that he must sleep unguarded while taking the flyer to Mars, his resolution returned. The uncertainty, the constant fear, would be unendurable. He climbed on down, feeling for the light button. He found it. As his feet touched the floor, blue light flooded the hold. It was filled with monstrous things, colossal creatures such as nothing that ever lived upon the earth, like nothing known in the jungles of Venus or the deserts of Mars, or anything that has been found upon Jupiter's moons. They were monsters, remotely resembling insects or crustaceans, but as large as horses or elephants, creatures upreared upon strange limbs, armed with hideously fanged jaws, cruel talons, frightful saw-toothed snouts, and glittering scales, red and yellow and green. They leered at him with phosphorescent eyes, yellow and purple. They cast grotesquely gigantic shadows in the blue light. A cold shock of horror started along Thad's spine at the sight of those incredible nightmare things. Automatically he flung up the welding tool, flicking over the lever with his thumb, so that violet electric flame played about the electrode. Then he saw the crowding hideous things were motionless, that they stood upon wooden pedestals, that many of them were supported upon metal bars. They were dead, mounted, collected specimens of some alien life. Grinning wanly and consciously of a weakness in the knees, he muttered, They sure will fill the museum if everybody gets the kick out of them that I did. A little too realistic, I'd say. Guess these are the stuffed monstrosities mentioned in the page out of the log. No wonder the cook was afraid of them. Some of them do look hellishly alive. He started across the hold, shrinking involuntarily from the armored enormities that seemed crouching to spring at him, motionless eyes staring. So at the end of the long space he found the treasure. Glittering in the blue light it looked unreal, incredible, a dazzling dream. He stopped among the fearful things that seemed gathered as if to guard it and stared with wide eyes through the open faceplate of his helmet. He saw neat stacks of gold ingots, new, freshly smelted bars of silver-white iridium, of argent platinum, of blue-white osmium, many of them, thousands of pounds that knew. He trembled at the thought of their value, almost beyond calculation. Then he saw the coffer, lying beyond the piled gleaming ingots, a huge box eight feet long made of some crystal that glittered with snowy whiteness, filled with sparkling iridescent gleams and inlaid with strange designs apparently in vermilion enamel. With a little cry he ran toward the chest, moving awkwardly in the loose deflated fabric of the osprey suit. Beside the coffer on the floor of the hold was literally a mountain of flame-blazing gems, heaped as if they had been carelessly dumped from it, cut diamonds, incredibly gigantic monster emeralds, sapphires, rubies, and strange stones that Thad didn't recognize. And Thad gasped with horror when he looked at the designs of the vermilion inlay in the white gleaming crystal. Weird forms, shapes of creatures somewhat like gigantic spiders and more unlike them. Demonic things, wickedly fanged, jaws slavering, executed with masterly skill that made them seem living, menacing, secretly gloating. Thad stared at them for long minutes, fascinated almost hypnotically. Three times he approached the chest to lift the lid and find what it held, and three times the unutterable horror of those crimson images thrust him back, shuddering. Nothing but pictures, he muttered hoarsely. A fourth time he advanced, trembling, and seized the lid of the coffer. Heavy, massive, it was fashioned also of glistening white crystal, and inlaid in crimson with weirdly hideous figures. Great hinges of white platinum held it on the farther side. It was fastened with a simple heavy hasp of the precious metal. Hands quivering, Thad snapped back the hasp, lifted the lid. New treasure in the chest would not have surprised him. He was prepared to meet dazzling wonders of gems or priceless metal. Nor would he have been astonished at some weird creature such as one of those whose likenesses were inlaid in the crystal. 
But what he saw made him drop the massive lid. A woman lay in the chest, motionless, in white. In a moment he raised the lid again, examined the still form more closely. The woman had been young. The features were regular, good to look upon. The eyes were closed. The white face appeared very peaceful. Save for the extreme cadaverous pallor, there was no mark of death. With a fancy that the body might be miraculously living, sleeping, Thad thrust an arm out through the open panel of his suit and touched a slender, bare white arm. It was stiff, very cold. The still pallid face was framed in fine brown hair. The fair small hands were crossed upon the breast over the simple white garment. A queer ache came into his heart. Something made him think of a white tower in the red hills near Helion, and a girl waiting in its fragrant garden of saffron and purple. A girl like this. The body lay upon a bed of blazing jewels. It appeared, Thad thought, as if the pile of gems upon the floor had been hastily scraped from the coffer to make room for the quiet form. He wondered how long it had lain there. It looked as if it might have been living but minutes before. Some preservative. His thought was broken by a sound that rang from the open hatchway on the deck above, the furious barking and yelping of the dog. Abruptly that was silent, and in its place came the uncanny and terrifying scream that Thad had heard once before on this flyer of mystery. A shriek so keen and shrill that it seemed to tear out his nerves by their roots, the voice of the haunter of the ship. When Thad came back upon the deck the dog was still barking nervously. He saw the animal forward, almost at the bow, hackles raised, tail between its legs. It was slinking backward, barking sharply, as if to call for aid. Apparently it was retreating from something between Thad and itself, but Thad searching the dimly lit deck could see no source of alarm, nor could the structures upon it have shut any large object from his view. It's all right, Thad called, intending to reassure the frightened animal, but finding his voice queerly dry. Coming on the double, old man, don't worry. The dog had reached the end of the deck. It stopped yelping, but snarled and whined as if in terror. It began darting back and forth, moving exactly as if something were slowly closing in upon it, trapping it in the corner. But Thad could see nothing. Then it made a wild dash back toward Thad, darting along the wall as if to run past an unseen enemy. Thad thought he heard quick, rasping footsteps then, that were not those of the dog and something seemed to catch the dog in mid-air as it leaped. It was hurled howling to the deck. For a moment it struggled furiously as if an invisible claw had pinned it down. Then it escaped and fled whimpering to Thad's side. He saw a new wound across its hips, three long parallel scratches from which fresh red blood was trickling. Regular scraping sounds came from the end of the deck where no moving thing was to be seen sounds such as might be made by the walking of feet with unsheathed claws. Something was coming back toward Thad, something that was invisible. Terror seized him with the knowledge. He had nerved himself to face desperate men or a savage animal, but an invisible being that could creep upon him and strike unseen, it was incredible, yet he had seen the dog knocked down and the bleeding wound it had received. His heart paused, then beat very quickly. For the moment he thought only blindly of escape. He knew only an overpowering desire to hide, to conceal himself from the invisible thing. Had it been possible, he might have tried to leave the flyer. Beside him was one of the companionways amidships, giving access to a compartment of the vessel that he had not explored. He turned, leaped down the steps with the terrified dog at his heels. Below he found himself in a short hall dimly lighted, several metal doors opening from it. He tried one at random. It gave. He sprang through, let the dog follow, closed and locked it. Trying to listen, he leaned weakly against the door, the rushing of his breath swift and regular, the loud hammer of his thudding heart, the dog's low whines. Then unmistakable scraping sounds outside, the scratching of claws that knew, invisible claws. He stood there bracing the door with the weight of his body, holding the welding arc ready in his hand. Several times the hinges creaked and he felt a heavy pressure against the panels. But at last the scratching sounds ceased. He relaxed. The monster had withdrawn, at least for a time. When he had time to think, the invisibility of the thing was not so incredible. The mounted creatures he had seen in the hold were evidence that the flyer had visited some unknown planet where weird life reigned. It was not beyond reason that such a planet should be inhabited by beings invisible to human sight. 
Human vision, as he knew, utilizes only a tiny fraction of the spectrum. The creature must be largely transparent to visible light, as human flesh is radiolucent to hard X-rays. Quite possibly it could be seen by infrared or ultraviolet light. Evidently it was visible enough to the dog's eyes, with their different range of sensitivity. Pushing the subject from his mind, he turned to survey the room into which he had burst. It had apparently been occupied by a woman. A frail blue silk dress and more intimate items of feminine wearing apparel were hanging above the berth. Two pairs of delicate black slippers stood neatly below it. Across from him was a dressing table with a large mirror above it. Combs, pins, jars of cosmetic cluttered it. And Thad saw upon it a little leather-bound book, locked, stamped on the back, diary. He crossed the room and picked up the little book, which smelled faintly of jasmine. Momentary shame overcame him at thus stealing the secrets of an unknown girl. Necessity, however, left him no choice but to seize any chance of learning more of this ship of mystery and her invisible haunter. He broke the flimsy fastening. Linda Cross was the name written on the flyleaf in a firm, clear, feminine hand. On the next page was the photograph, in color, of a girl, the brown-haired girl whose body Thad had discovered in the crystal coffer in the hold. Her eyes, he saw, had been blue. He thought she looked very lovely, like the waiting girl in his old dream of the Silver Tower in the Red Hills by Helion. The diary, it appeared, had not been kept very devotedly. Most of the pages were blank. One of the first entries, dated a year and a half before, told of a party that Linda had attended in San Francisco, and of her refusal to dance with a certain man referred to as Benny, because he had been unpleasantly insistent about wanting to marry her. It ended. Dad said tonight that we're going off in the Dragon again, all the way to Uranus, if the new fuel works as he expects. What a lark to explore a few new worlds of our own. Dad says one of Uranus's moons is as large as Mercury, and Benny won't be proposing again soon. Turning on, Thad found other scattered entries, some of them dealing with the preparation for the voyage, the start from San Francisco, and a huge bunch of flowers from Benny. The long months of the trip through space out past the orbit of Mars, above the meteor belt, across Jupiter's orbit, beyond the track of Saturn, which was the farthest point that rocket explorers had previously reached, and on to Uranus, where they could not land because of the unstable surface. The remainder of the entries Thad found less frequent, shorter, bearing the mark of excitement, landing upon Titania, the third and largest satellite of Uranus, unearthly forests, sheltering strange and monstrous life the hunting of weird creatures and mounting them for museum specimens. Then the discovery of a ruined city, whose remains indicated that it had been built by a lost race of intelligent spider-like things, the finding of a temple whose walls were of precious metals containing a crystal chest filled with wondrous gems, the smelting of the metal into convenient ingots, and the transfer of the treasure to the hold. The first sinister note there entered the diary. Some of the men say we shouldn't have disturbed the temple, think it will bring us bad luck. Rubbish, of course, but one man did vanish while they were smelting the gold. Poor Mr. Tom James. I suppose he ventured away from the rest and something caught him. The few entries that followed were shorter and showed increasing nervous tension. They recorded the departure from Titania made almost as soon as the treasure was loaded. The last was made several weeks later. A dozen men had vanished from the crew, leaving only gouts of blood to hint the manner of their going. The last entry ran, Dad says I'm to stay in here today. Old dear, he's afraid the thing will get me, whatever it is. It's really serious. Two men taken from their berths last night, and not a trace. Some of them think it's a curse on the treasure. One of them swears he saw Dad's stuffed specimens moving about in the hold. Some terrible thing must have slipped aboard the flyer out of the jungle. That's what Dad and the captain think. Queer they can't find it. They searched all over. Well. Musing and regretful, Thad turned back for another look at the smiling girl in the photograph. What a tragedy her death had been. Reading the diary had made him like her, her balance and humor, her quiet affection for Dad, the calm courage with which she seemed to have faced the creeping, lurking death that darkened the ship with its unescapable shadow. How had her body come to be in the coffer, he wondered, when all the others were gone? It had shown no marks of violence. She must have died of fear. No, her face had seemed too calm and peaceful for that. 
Had she chosen easy death by some poison rather than that other dreadful fate? Had her body been put in the chest to protect it and the poison arrested decomposition? Thad was still studying the picture thoughtfully and sadly when the dog, which had been silent, suddenly growled again and retreated from the door toward the corner of the room. The invisible monster had returned. Thad heard its claws scratching across the door again, and he heard another dreadful sound. Not the long, shrill scream that had so grated on his nerves before, but a short, sharp coughing or barking, a series of shrill, indescribable notes that could have been made by no beast he knew. The decision to open the door cost a huge effort on Thad's will. For hours he had waited, thinking desperately, and the thing outside of the door had waited as patiently, scratching upon it from time to time, uttering those dreadful, shrill, coughing cries. Sooner or later he would have to face the monster. Even if he could escape from the room and avoid it for a time, he would have to meet it in the end, and it might creep upon him while he slept. To be sure, the issue of the combat was extremely doubtful. The monster, apparently, had succeeded in killing every man upon the flyer, even though some of them had been armed. It must be large and very ferocious. But Thad was not without hope. He still wore his osprey suit. The heavy fabric, made of metal wires impregnated with a tough elastic composition, should afford considerable protection against the thing. The welding arc, intended to fuse refractive meteoric iron, would be no mean weapon at close quarters. And the quarters would be close. If only he could find some way to make the thing visible. Paint or something of the kind would stick to its skin. His eyes, searching the room, caught the jar of face powder on the dressing table. Dash that over it! It ought to stick enough to make the outline visible. So at last, holding the powder ready in one hand, he waited until a time when the pressure upon the door had just relaxed and he knew the monster was waiting outside. Swiftly he opened the door. Thad had partially overcome the instinctive horror that the unseen being first aroused in him, but it returned in a sickening wave when he heard the short, shrill, coughing cries, hideously eager that greeted the opening of the door, and the quick rasping of naked claws upon the floor sounds from nothingness. He flung the powder at the sound. A form of weird horror materialized before him, still half invisible, half outlined with the white film of adhering powder, gigantic and hideous claws that seemed to reach out of empty air, the side of a huge scaly body, a yawning, dripping jaw. For a moment Thad could see great hooked fangs in that jaw. Then they vanished, as if an unseen tongue had licked the powder from them, dissolving it in fluids which made it invisible. That unearthly half-seen shape leaped at him. He was carried backward into the room, hurled to the floor. Claws were rasping upon the tough fabric of his suit. His arm was seized crushingly in half-visible jaws. Desperately he clung to the welding tool. The heated electrode was driven toward his body. He fought to keep it away. He knew that it would burn through even the insulated fabric of his suit. A claw ripped savagely at his side. He heard the sharp, rending sound as the tough fabric of his suit was torn and felt a thin pencil of pain drawn along his body where the claw cut his skin. Suddenly the suit was full of the earthly fetter of the monster's body, nauseatingly intense. Thad gasped, tried to hold his breath, and thrust upward hard with the incandescent electrode. He felt warm blood trickling from the wound. A numbing blow struck his arm. The welding tool was carried from his hand, flung to the other side of the room, it clattered to the floor. And then a heavy weight came upon his chest, forcing the breath from his lungs. The monster stood upon his body and clawed at him. Thad squirmed furiously. He kicked out with his feet, encountering a great hard body. Futilely he beat and thrust with his arms against the pillar-like limb. His body was being mauled, bruised beneath the thick fabric. He heard it tear again along his right thigh, but he felt no pain and thought the claws had not reached the skin. It was the yellow dog that gave him the chance to recover the weapon. The animal had been running back and forth in the opposite end of the room, fairly howling in excitement and terror. Now with the mad courage of desperation it leaped recklessly at the monster. A mighty, dimly seen claw caught it, hurled it back across the room. It lay still, broken, whimpering. For a moment the thing had lifted its weight from Thad's body, and Thad slipped quickly from beneath it, flung himself across the room, snatched up the welding tool. In an instant the creature was upon him again, but he met it with the incandescent electrode. He was crouched in a corner now, where it could come at him from only one direction. 
Its claws still slashed at him ferociously, but he was able to cling to the weapon and meet each onslaught with hot metal. Gradually its mad attacks weakened. Then one of his blind thrusting blows seemed to burn into a vital organ. A terrible choking strangling sound came from the air, and he heard the thrashing struggles of wild convulsions. At last all was quiet. He prodded the thing again and again with hot electrode, and it did not move. It was dead. The creature's body was so heavy that Thad had to return to the bridge and shut off the current in the gravity plates along the keel before he could move it. He dragged it to the lock through which he had entered the flyer and consigned it to space. Five days later Thad brought the Red Dragon into the atmosphere of Mars. A puzzled pilot came aboard in response to his signals and docked the flyer safely at Helion. Thad went down into the hold again with the astonished port authorities who had come aboard to inspect the vessel. Again he passed among the grotesque and outrageous monsters in the hold, leading the gasping officers. While they marveled at the treasure, he lifted the weirdly embellished lid of the coffer of white crystal and looked once more upon the still form of the girl within it. Pity stirred him. An ache came to his throat. Linda Cross, so quiet and cold and white and yet so lovely. How terrible her last days of life must have been, with doom shadowing the vessel and with the men vanishing mysteriously one by one. Terrible, until she had sought the security of death. Strangely, Thad felt no great elation at the thought that half the incalculable treasure about him was now safely his own as the award of salvage, if only the girl were still living. He felt a poignantly keen desire to hear her voice. Thad found the note when they started to lift her from the chest. A hasty scrawl that lay beneath her head among glittering gems. This woman is not dead. Please have her given skilled medical attention as soon as possible. She lies in a state of suspended animation induced by the injection of fifty minims of Zirinel. She is my daughter, Linda Cross, and my sole heir. I entreat the finders of this to have care given her and to keep in trust for her such part of the treasure on this ship as may remain after the payment of salvage or other claims. Sometimes she will wake, perhaps in a year, perhaps in a hundred. The purity of my drugs is uncertain, and the injection was made hastily, so I do not know the exact time that must elapse. If this is found, it will be because the lurking thing upon the ship has destroyed me and all of my men. Please do not fail me. Signed, Leverington Cross. Thad bought the white tower of his dreams, slim and graceful in its Martian garden of saffron and purple among the low ochre hills beside Helion. He carried the sleeping girl through the silver door where the girl of his dreams had waited and set the coffer in a great vaulted chamber. Many times each day he came into the room where she lay to look into her pallid face and feel her cold wrist. He kept a nurse in attendance and had a physician called Daly. A long Martian year went by. Looking in his mirror one day, Thad saw little wrinkles about his eyes. He realized that the nervous strain and anxiety of waiting was aging him and it might be a hundred years, he remembered, before Linda Cross came from beneath the drug's influence. He wondered if he should grow old and infirm while Linda lay still young and beautiful and unchanged in her sleep, if she might awake after long years and see in him only a feeble old man. And he knew that he would not be sorry he had waited, even if he should die before she revived. On the next day the nurse called him into the room where Linda lay. He was bending over her when she opened her eyes. They were blue, glorious. A long time she looked up at him, first in fearful wonder, then with confidence and dawning understanding, and at last she smiled. End of Salvage in Space by Jack Williamson